Test.
Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody to the audit uh, to the budget committee meeting uh, for December 13th. This will be our final budget committee meeting of the of the year. It is 9:34 in the morning. Uh, my name is Paul Russell, and I represent Lower Sackville. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and unceded lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of November 22nd and November 25th, 2022. Can, uh, so moved by uh, Councillor Stoddard, uh, seconder, uh, Councillor Blackburn. Are there any errors or omissions? Not seeing any, all in favor of the minutes, please signify by saying aye. Aye, all opposed say nay. Great, thank you very much. Uh, the approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions over to the clerk. Do we have any changes today? There are no changes to the meeting from the clerk's office today. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Daigle-Gammon, are you moving the order of business as presented? Great, thank you very much. Do we have a seconder for that? Thank you, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Are there any changes from the committee? Not seeing any, all in favor of the order of business as presented, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Great, we have an order of business. Uh, call for declaration of conflicts of interest. And I don't see any, that's great. The next item on the agenda is public participation. Um, so people uh, are allowed to present to the budget committee for up to five minutes. Uh, we have had a speakers list outside and you were also able to sign up online. One person signed up in advance of the meeting. After that person speaks, I will uh, reach out to the gallery and see if anybody else would like to, uh, to present to the budget committee. So Martin Williams, are you with us this morning? Feel free to come forward and, uh, and present to the budget committee. The presentation slides were circulated to all members of council. Great, thank you very much. Um, Martin, go ahead, uh, the floor is yours. You have five minutes. As, as discussed, they will not be presented on the screen. They have been circulated to all members of council. Oh, I see, okay. Martin, um, can you press the button on, on the... This one? Go. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, I was uh, hoping the presentation slides would be here as a prompt, but thank you very much for having me. Um, so uh, uh, my proposal, um, again, it's really hard without the slides to make a convincing case for this, but um, my proposal is that I understand that you have before you today um, uh, consideration for some advanced tenders, one which involves a considerable amounts of money for um, uh, uh, recapitalizing roads, and um, I understand a, 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 a large proportion of that will be towards um, roads resurfacing. Sorry, excuse me. Um, uh, so my proposal is that I understand that that will be likely moved to be accepted today. Um, and I request that um, in addition to that, um, you move that um, a proposal is considered by the Transportation Standing Committee to review um, how that resurfacing can best be used for the public benefit by forwarding in particular the aims set out in the Road Safety Framework 2018 to reduce injury and fatal incidents by 20% for every five year period. Um, so um, I understand that 2021 looked promising, however, a review of 2022 data looks less promising, particularly from the perspective of vulnerable road users where we're actually seeing some increases in incidents um, and therefore um, this is why I'm requesting this uh, proposal. Um, so briefly, uh, the slides include some photographs where um, some wider roads, which is often where uh, 
a greater amount of incidents are concentrated, are reduced um, to something which is, uh, slows traffic speeds and allows people to cross the road more easily, allows uh, cyclists to use the roads more easily, uh, without a redesign process, so it would be incorporated within the resurfacing work. So, for example, uh, reducing four roads, arterial routes, um, effectively, these are used like highways here, um, to a three-lane route, or perhaps including two bus lanes where there's already an understanding that may happen in future, like, for example, on Lacewood Drive. Um, so uh, what I'm asking for is I understand this already happens, we've seen changes, um, we've seen bus lanes, um, but I'm asking that that be considered as a formal uh, uh, policy and a process where you have a procedure, the involvement of road safety stakeholder uh, is also um, looking at how um, resurfacing work, which is particularly, I understand, focused on arterial and major collectors, which are um, disproportionately in poorer condition versus local roads and minor collectors, um, how they can be made safer during the course of resurfacing works through um, not necessarily a fixed um, change, but um, looking at a, a variety of options, uh, perhaps even for smaller roads, just making sure that um, uh, the traffic lanes are uh, less wide than they are now. Um, so um, that is um, my proposal. I've kind of rambled a little bit because I was hoping to um, get some help from the slides. But um, uh, to um, if if that could be formally proposed as an agenda item on the Transportation Standing Committee agenda to look at this proposal to involve the road safety stakeholders, including the non-government ones, to invite them to the meeting as well, and for this to be properly reviewed in more than five minutes of time, so that you can be sure that you are getting maximum value for money and forwarding your injury and fatal reduction uh, targets um, uh, uh, alongside this sizable investment that, that you're making with the increased funding for um, roads resurfacing, which I understand is flagged from your uh, January, um, uh, January reports on, on the condition of the roads here. Thank you, Martin. Um, we uh, I certainly have been, uh, uh, I've certainly been uh, making notes about uh, your request and what you, what you have been looking for. Um, that would be something that the Transportation Standing Committee uh, would be able to address in, in their discussions and deliberations. Um, uh, I don't see any questions of clarification uh, from anybody on Council. Um, so again, thank you. We will review uh, what you have brought forward to us today and uh, the, uh, the submission that you have had. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming forward. Are there any other speakers in the gallery? Is there anybody else who would like to address the Budget Committee? Third and final time, is there anybody who would less like to address the Budget Committee this morning? Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Let's move ahead with the agenda. The next item is the Capital Update and Advance Tenders. Carolyn, would you like to lead it off? or? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry Blackwood, CFO, who's going to run us through a very brief presentation, um, more about process and next steps that, than content, and then we're very happy to answer any questions you might have. Jerry? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, Jerry Blackwood, CFO. So we have a short presentation here here this morning, uh, just an update on capital and advanced tenders. So I'm just gonna turn it over to Crystal. Um, today, um, what we're asking council for a decision on is to approve uh, advanced tenders. Just wanna be clear, this isn't about a spend, this is about an administrative approval for us to go forward and start getting uh, our tenders ready for this year's construction season and some of the uh, procurements like uh, buses and uh, fire apparatus that take a, a little bit longer than the, than the normal uh, procurement time. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Crystal Nowlin, Director of Asset Management, thank you.
Good morning. Um, as Jerry said, uh, Crystal Nellen, Director of Asset Management. I'm pleased to be here this morning to, to kick off the capital budget cycle of the this season. Um, based on what uh, we've heard from council, particularly last year, was that before you received the full detailed uh, project um, book with, with all the 200 and some projects that, uh, to go through it and debate for approval of the budget, that it would be helpful for you to have a bit of an overview as a basis before looking at the details. So that's what this report uh, in particular it has been uh, put together for you and as well as the advanced tenders. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the what we did put in for that this overview is um, we've put together for this year um, where we haven't in, in some recent years and a high level overview of the condition of our existing infrastructure. Um, in attachment two, you will find the detail. It is only of our major uh, infrastructure groups at this time. Certainly you've seen uh, the roads in more detail this past January when that report for levels of service came forward, but there's some high level on other asset groups. In general, um, overall, there about 55% of our major infrastructure groups are rated as good to very good in condition. 25% are poor to very poor. There's always a range and there's never, uh, as far as fiscal responsibility, you never want to have your infrastructure at you know, 100% excellent condition. You, you would need to have it at, at a balance and to meet uh, sustainable and reliable service delivery. You will see on the transit fleet that some of those condition ratings are at a lower level of, of rating. The reason for that, as everyone knows, is we are in that transitional period where we are uh, looking to transition our fleet from diesel over to electric. So there's, there's a bit of a timing dynamic there. Uh, we've shown and included in the report uh, a high level table on what the budgets have been and total expenditures in the past five years. Uh, you'll see we've had quite a bit of growth in our infrastructure to support the growth in our services and, and uh, our expanding population in the municipality. We've included also as of quarter two where our current uh, work plan is at uh, for so existing projects that are in flight how those are, are moving forward Typically what you will see in our uh, Projects is generally on average other than specific uh, Projects say like Cogswell you'll see more or less uh, on average like a two-year uh, workflow through design and construction. So there is always some budget that does, uh, for lack of a better term, carry forward from one year to the next. Doesn't necessarily mean that we're, we're behind in our scheduling. It's just the natural flow uh, of the timing and the schedule of the work. Uh, certainly, you'll probably see uh, this year that there is an extension or um, an increase in what that number is. Certainly part of it is in 22-23. It was the first time we've uh, doubled our capital budget volume in our, in our program, as well as um, what we're currently experiencing in, uh, in the economy with uh, supply chain issues, labor shortages, what have you. Great uh, lead in to the, the next bullet there of what we've included. Uh, you will see in the report we have not included what uh, the 23-24 capital plan that you will be receiving, what numbers we're, we're at now. We are funded within the envelope that we set out last year. However, what we did include was showing you where we started off this fall as far as our initial update from the 22-23 plan to really emphasize, you know, what is the challenges or what are the challenges that staff have been uh, working with 
what reprioritization, that level of work that they've had in front of them uh, to do the best balance of what can we continue to deliver but at a fiscally responsible and sustainable pace. And then, um, as Jerry mentioned, we're here also asking you today for approval of the advanced tender requests. So the next slide that, that I'm going to uh, share with you, which is also the, includes the list in attachment one, are the list of projects um, that we're asking for approval today for advanced tendering. So typically what that means is uh, we will be back January 18th to discuss the full capital budget, the, cap the four year capital plan, and the projects for approval at that time. Why we ask for advanced tendering at this time of year is for the upfront uh, administrative work that takes us into uh, being able to award the tenders uh, and, and make those, um, those procurement requests out to, to vendors. There's a, there's a lead time up front, and when we ask for this earlier on, staff can move forward with that administration side so that we can maximize both the, the season uh, for construction whenever the, the frost comes out of the ground as such, and uh, because of the, the current supply chain issues, a number of lead times have um, quadrupled or, or become a bit of tenfold of what they, they have been in the past. So staff are trying to think forward to when they need supplies and materials and work backwards on uh, you know, when is most responsible to, to try to move some of these orders ahead. The, the table in front of you now is a little different from the, the, the straightforward chart that's in attachment one. What I, I included here was uh, an example of what projects that we are asking for today that have also been asked for in the previous five years. And really this is to, to represent that this is not out of the ordinary of what we are asking for. It's pretty static and stable um, for the majority of our projects. Number of them are, are um, annual ongoing projects that the work is continuous between design and, and delivery. Uh, street recapitalization is always the, the easiest one to, to highlight for its you know, large dollar value. You'll see there on the list that uh, really 21 out of 27 projects, I believe, are ongoing projects uh, or programs. Um, so as staff is looking at these, we really don't feel like there, there's a risk in starting this administration work ahead of the budget being approved in January. And again, to emphasize, because staff is starting to initiate the work around the tenders, they still won't be able to award or, or procure until you have your, your debate to approve the budget on January 18th. So next steps leading us to that January 18th. We are currently having the detailed project book being printed today. You, it will be distributed to you on Thursday of this week. Um, we will be back. That will give you roughly a month to review the contents uh, of the budget book, connect with staff with, with, for questions and such, and then we will be back here on, on the 18th to, to debate at that time. And with that, it's, uh, the recommendation is before you for the Budget Committee to um, recommend to Council to approve the advanced tender list. I uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Crystal. Um, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Chair. Shall I put the motion on the floor uh, at this point? Uh, please do. Yeah, the um, budget uh, committee recommends the Halifax Regional Council approve the schedule of 23-24 advanced tender requests as per attachment one of the staff report dated December the 6th, 2022. 
Uh, thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Just very quickly, uh, Crystal and Jerry, on, on the list, there's, there's a large chunk of this is for um, our transit um, uh, update, electrification project, right? 20 million for Burnside and 28 for Ragged Lake, correct? <clears throat> so these are costs shared with the, with the federal and provincial governments. What is, our, what is our risk in terms of those two large projects going dramatically over budget? Um, through, through the chair to the, the mayor. Um, certainly with the contribution agreements that we uh, have signed and, and are uh, engaged with, we have a finite deadline date to, to complete these projects and we have our portions um, based on the agreement the portion from the, the federal government and the provincial government is fixed, and so cost overruns and what have you are being managed and mitigated by our end to, to minimize any, any overages to absorb. So it's significant. <laughs> I'm just thinking we have a lot of projects right now that were funded with the province and the feds. They're coming in over budget, and it's falling on us to pick up. It's not like it used to be, like it would be, you know, 2% overrun. Now we're looking at doubling in some cases uh, the cost of these uh, projects. Uh, Mr. Rigi, welcome. Uh, good morning, uh, Dave Rigi, Executive Director, Halifax Transit. Um, through the chair to committee, just, just to add, um, you know, we, the benefit we've had with these projects is that we've been doing the budgeting for them. Uh, you know, once as a municipality, we've been into this period of inflation. So what that's allowed us to do is uh, put some pretty healthy uh, s some pretty healthy buffers on the project budget. So, um, you know, we, ha we have the benefit of hindsight, I guess, in terms of when we were creating these budgets. And specifically on the e-bus one, what I would say is that uh, the biggest expense in that one has actually already been awarded. That was the buses themselves. And that actually came in uh, under budget. The tender came in under budget. So we're in a good place there. And so the, the supplier can't come back and say due to supply chain or something, because I've heard of that happening as well, uh, that there's been extraordinary circumstances forcing prices to go up. I'm not saying we shouldn't do this. I'm fully in support of this. This is part of our commitment uh, on uh, environment. It's just when I see lar any large project now, it makes, my, uh, makes me nervous. Um, for obvious reasons, right? Particularly so that we're not, we're no longer responsible for 20, 30, or 40 percent of the cost. We're responsible for 100 percent of the cost over and above uh, the arrangement. That may be something that we need to take up at other tables, but thank you for the, uh, thank you for that. Go ahead, Mr. Blackwood. Thank you, thank you, Mayor, and I, I certainly uh, share those sentiments on those those large projects as well. And uh, just to point out too, when and um, that was in the procurement policy that Council just approved, the next phase of the cost share for that uh, still has to come forward. So that has to come for uh, forward to Council for approval as well. Just wanted to note that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Hensby. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, going through the table and stuff, I was trying to decipher in regards to how many of these tenders or advanced capital projects are still work that has not been completed from last year or the previous year. Um, I'm going through the report here and saying work in progress, 25%, 50%, or 75%. Uh, some is completed, some are you know uh, on hold and stuff. I'm just trying to get a clarification of how much of this is work that's not been completed from previous budgets and how much is, 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 is actually new projects. And, and something that kind of sticks out, one particular one I saw was the Halifax Regional Police Digital Communications Intercept System. Had a budget allocation of $459,000 and it says it's work complete and it's still pro projected spending $457,000. I said, if it's completed, why is it projected spending until March 31st? I'm just trying to clarify if it's completed, you think it would be already been expensed by now instead of having it carry over to the end of the fiscal year. So just trying to get some clarification of, of the, the state of where we at with previous approved capital projects <laughs> that were never completed or deferred or delayed to, to, to new projects today. Uh, thank you for the question through the chair to the committee. Um, so that with some of the projects that, that are showing work complete but still have dollars uh, projected, 
That could include work that's been done year to date. It includes the, the entire year. So the 400 could in, in, include uh, work that's actually been done, dollars spent up to September. Um, and, and because it's on the list, we carry it till the end of this budget season to continue to, to report on it. For projects that are showing held or deferred or what have you, this has been part of the, the process that staff go through when they're preparing the updated capital plan is to look at the, the projects that are currently in flight, what's their status, how do we uh, carry them forward into the, the next fiscal year, or do we close them out and uh, return the funds to be reallocated. On that point, I want to keep raising the point about the Ross Road realignment. It's been an, uh, before this council, it started in 1998 with the Main Street study. And then when we came to this council in 2003 for the first initial pro, uh, request for acquisition, then it's been on subsequent budgets for 2016 and forward of money allocated for the acquisition of land and design, and it's still not done. And you know, it's been deferred and, and, and delayed, and money that used to be dedicated, $1.3 million, I believe at one time, was or $1.2 million has been allocated the budget for it. $600,000 was set aside in budget the previous year, but never got completed, got rolled over to reserves, and I'm still waiting for that project to be finalized. You know, we're waiting for the acquisition of the corridor. We've gone through four different owners the last five years. We now have a current owner who wants to do this. I need to stress, the Ross Road realignment cannot be deferred and delayed any further. It needs to be uh, initiated, it needs to be acquired, it needs to be designed, it needs to be constructed. And I know it's not gonna be done in one year, but at least the acquisition design needs the people on the Eastern Shore, this is the major gateway to the Eastern Shore, to and from Metro, it needs to be done. And I just can't wait any longer. The residents have been waiting patiently. There's been accident after accident after accident at this particular intersection. And it just seems that uh, someone has to get killed before we act, and I'm getting tired of waiting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hensby. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jerry, Crystal, good morning. Uh, uh, Crystal, uh, I just want to be clear what the ask is here today for this advanced tender. You have identified uh, in attachment one what you're looking for. So you're asking so you can go to tender, I understand, so it's earlier, but we're not uh, approving the tender until the budget is completed, which is really April, right? Is that correct? Or is it sooner that when it, this, this piece? Uh, thank you for the, the question of clarification. Um, the, the, when the capital budget comes back in January, January 18th, right. the, the projects are approved in that session. Oh, okay. So staff can move forward and, and award or procure at that time. So there's no problem, uh, there's no financial risk of asking for a tender and not following through. We can decide to add or delete. So you're just, you're just asking for the advancement here today. Correct, okay. correct. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. So just a quick question of clarification. Uh, on the budget sheet here, um, when you get down to, uh, let me just find the page. When you get down to page two of the actual um, line by line items. Uh, I'm looking at, in particular, two uh, Halifax form in Halifax North Public Library. One's deferred and one's on hold. Can you just help me in? in, in we'll probably talk a little bit more just in, in during the capital process, but just um, the deferred and on hold. Um, what does that mean for today's process? Uh, through the chair to to the committee. Um, thank you for the question on, on, on the clarification. So deferred and hold um, generally um, means there, well, it could be a, a number of various reasons. It could be um, a pause to uh, redirect, wait for a specific um, change in, in direction, um, a number of items that, that way. There's something that, that's caused staff to, to take a pause. As it really relates to today's session, it, it's just information sharing. Right. 
All right. So, so as we go through the process on particular projects, if we have concerns about certain ones, we can talk about it during the, the capital project. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then the the last question I have is, um, and this is kind of uh, around the the same. Now that I have better clarification of of the deferred not hold, just in terms of. Um, uh, attachment four, where the risk is evaluated on, on specific projects, and I have one in particular, but I'll wait until we get to the um, capital discussion. What, what are we using to determine the risk uh, factors when, when we look at these specific items? Up through the, the chair to the, the councillor. So we, this is part, the, the items that you see rated to the, the right of that schedule are based on our council prioritization framework that we've been using on the capital budget since 2019. Each of the elements, strategic alignment, uh, impact, service, risk, they're all, they all have a decision matrix on various items that we, uh, or staff, the project managers, and um, we, we have a capital working group as a peer review. Folks go, go through um, the various elements to assess what is the impact of that project and the work uh, deliverable that's to be done. And then we look at a capacity to deliver, which is really a readiness uh, dynamic. And that's really because we always have more requests for good projects with lots of merit with not as much funding to, to do them all. And we, we like to try to line them up with when it is it possible to, to deliver them so that we're not holding up funds. Um, right. It, timing doesn't always equate to priority, but the risk, I, I can provide that if it's uh, desired. There's a number of elements. There, there's health and safety, mm -hmm. environmental, um, um, yeah, and a number of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so I guess for me, for preparation, maybe, because uh, I, I it's probably easier if I reach out to, to you offline, just wondering how the risk correlates to um, whether or not that will get put in what year budget. So if it's uh, very risky, um, does that mean it should be put closer in the 23-24? But if it's also very risky, but it's pushed into the 26-27, just trying to understand how the matrix relates to how it gets put in the capital budget. So that's probably a longer discussion that might be better offline. So I just wanted to really get an understanding of how the risk relates to um, the where it gets put in the capital budget. But I, I think that's a longer chat. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Go ahead, Councillor Othet. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the presentation. I have no uh, problem moving forward. I like doing the advance tendering for all the, uh, and we didn't always used to do that. There was a time when I was here, the, still here, that we didn't do that, and we uh, got ourselves into trouble, particularly when it came to paving and things like that, trying to do things uh, later and all at once and later in the season, so this is good. Um, I think what I want to do is it's, it's sort of maybe continuing on where Councillor Smith was. I, I'm looking a little bit more, and, and Jerry, I think you're the best one to answer this, would be um, January the 15th, we have a capital budget coming forward for debate and approval, obviously. Is that going to be a little different this year because we, we have a bit of a challenge this year where staff came forward recommending a higher increase than, than uh, council has sent back that they're willing to agree to. So, and obviously that's a combination of, of operation and, and capital. So when we have this, this budget book come forward um, later this week for us to look at, we're gonna see by department sort of what the risks are. When you come to present on the 15th, are we going to have sort of a, an above and below, a recommended and not recommended, a here's the benefit if we wait a year or two, so maybe there isn't a chip shortage and vehicles aren't so expensive, versus the risk of things will come crashing down and falling apart if we don't replace them. Um, are we going to have that sort of approach this year or I think we should have that sort of approach this year where we can really have a hard look on, on what can be delayed, what can't be delayed, the risks of being delayed, this sort of thing. Is it gonna be a little different this year? 
Thank you, uh, Councillor Outhit. Um, you're going to see the, the the capital budget is is you know it's going to certainly be the same flavor as as past years, right? In terms of the projects, obviously, uh, you know, as we've already communicated, it this has been a very challenging year. Yeah. Uh, Crystal has mentioned um, that uh, the capital budget is going to come back within the, the budget envelope that council approved in, in principle last year, right? So, you know, uh, based on inflation there, we have had to move some projects around, some things had to, to stay within that cost, yeah. that cost envelope. So you're gonna, you know, we'll be highlighting, um, you know, some of those changes as well. The other piece that you know <clears throat> uh, we'll be bringing forward as well is is you know the direction that council has gave around budget to uh, to uh, reduce to a, a four percent increase. Um, staff have been working very hard on that, sure. and there are some um, some projects with respect that are capital from operating fund yes. funded that'll be coming forward. They are kind of like a one-time sort of savings in terms of they may not be shovel ready, they need to be uh, pushed out a little bit or yeah. something like that. So you're gonna see okay. a little bit of, a, of, uh, of, of some options in, in that regard, but it's, uh, it's gonna be uh, about you know, things that may have been in, in uh, you know, schedule for 2023, 20, 24 last year that just doesn't fit yeah. within, within that, that yeah. budget uh, envelope, yeah. right? Uh, Crystal, is there anything you want to add to that? No. no, no, that's good. That's what I was expecting, and I'm—I uh, won't say I'm pleased to hear it, but we need to hear it. So, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Othit. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, and thank you, Jerry. Um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about Dutch Village Road. Um, I understood that Dutch Village Road was going to be on the advanced tender list last year and it's been bumped again this year. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit about that decision um, because uh, it, it's categorized as a health and safety project. Um, I think that in the, in the list I saw it was given that was one of the reasons for prioritizing it. I think it has something to do with the 16,000 vehicles a day, the uh, lack of a sidewalk on one side, the nose in parking, which is illegal, and other things that are irregular about that street. Um, and it's also going to be a separated bike lane. It'll be a key corridor for getting people, uh, getting cyclists on the peninsula. Um, and uh, I just, I, I'm wondering why it's been deferred when it's 90% designed and the staff has put a lot into this project across many teams to get it ready. So if you could just maybe explain a little bit about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Kelly Denty, Executive Director of Planning and Development. Uh, relative to Dutch Village Road, it was moved to the uh, to the right due to some land acquisition needs. So we were trying to meet our envelopes and, uh, and obviously meet our targets. So because the project uh, still can't advance due to some land acquisition, it was moved a bit to the right. So it's really nothing more than that. We would like to have pushed it, uh, but it's in terms of readiness, that's where the cut was made. If I could follow up, Mr. Chair, um, these there there are four pieces of land. Three of them uh, require construction easements, which are fairly straightforward, and there's just one small parcel um, that requires an acquisition, which is almost there. And my understanding is it it could be done relatively quickly. So I, I I'm not sure that that that's really the reason. Is it is it a budget reason or is it? I, I don't think that that small piece of land is holding up this entire project. It was decided that due to resourcing uh, reasons relative to acquisition of those lands in order to do the full project, it wasn't, it wasn't advanced enough in order to be able to commit to construction next year, right, relative to all the various acquisition projects that are in play for, for these corridors. Is there anything that could, um, could make a difference in getting it onto the list? We could take it under advisement, circle back with staff and determine what could be done to advance it. But in terms of where we were at that point in, in making the list, it was it was decided that that was a reason to, to push it to the right. Okay. okay. Uh, do I need a motion to do that then? or We can circle back administratively, I think. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, uh, Councillor Morse. I don't see any, any further speakers on the list. Are we ready for the question? Thank you. And we're voting electronically on this one. And that motion passes. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, the next item on the agenda is adjournment. Can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Oh, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Councillor Hensby. I didn't say uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we adjourn, I wasn't sure if there's been any discussion this morning about the, the agenda for the upcoming council meeting. I would like to suggest we do the in-camera immediately now after this budget meeting before we get into a heritage hearing or a public hearing tonight. We should get our in-camera business done first. Th thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hensby. Um, that is a different meeting. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. <clears throat> Are we adjourned from finance, budget? Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Mason. We stand adjourned. Okay. So just in terms of the next meeting, uh, Agenda Review has been looking at the, we, we want to get the in-camera done uh, early on. We could have either done it this morning or we could have done it right after Heritage, but um, I think probably we'll uh, go, maybe the best way to do it would be to, when we come back at 10 in five minutes. Ian, is that okay? Five minutes. We will, uh, we will come back in public, but we will go immediately in camera after we do uh, uh, the perfunctory openings. If possible, could we do the consent agenda and then move to in Correct. camera? Correct. Yeah. So we'll do it after we do consent agenda. Uh, that's our plan at this point in time. Well, obviously, we can have discussion about that um, when we uh, meet in five minutes. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll
All right, folks, we'll take our seats. Thank you. Now we'll, we'll stand and then we'll take our seats. Um, thank you very much, Boyd. Folks, we'll just take a, uh, a moment of silent reflection before our meeting and uh, while we celebrate the joys of the upcoming season, uh, which many of us celebrate, there's also people who are homeless, uh, people who haven't got much, people who are experiencing loss, and we'll just think about them. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, it's December the oh, 13th today. It's council day. I've got a, it's a three binder council day for me. I'm going to put one aside for now. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that we're in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. The um, peace and friendship treaties which have been signed did not include the surrender of land. Um, and as we as a city move forward in our path of reconciliation, uh, we do honor the peace and friendship treaties. All right, meeting is called to order. Uh, announcements and acknowledgements, and I need to sign in. So do you have it up? Who's got it up? Announcements, I, I assume Councillor Hensby, but I don't know that. Councillor Hensby. Oh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, it's that time of year for your flu for your flu shots as well as COVID uh, vaccines still for the one to get the boosters. There's going to be a clinic uh, available Thursday at the Henry Ball Center in West Fall on Main Street uh, in the afternoon. I believe it's from uh, 10 to 2.30. And also on the following Monday, the December 19th, uh, at Lake Echo <laughs> Community Center from 10 o'clock till 2. So make sure you get yourself uh, immunized and be safe for this holiday season. Indeed, good advice. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of uh, quick notes from the community. I want to say congratulations to the Harold T. Barrett Junior High Girls Volleyball Team. They've just won the uh, Mariner Zone uh, Girls Volleyball Championships, and uh, so congratulations to them. And also, uh, congratulations to a couple of community members who have recently been awarded the uh, Queen Elizabeth II Platinum Jubilee Medals. Uh, in particular, retired Major Bruce Bartow, who uh, I mentioned here a few weeks back for his uh, uh, his uh, marathon run in support of the Terry Fox run, and also uh, Deborah Lucas, who is the uh, the chair of the Lucasville Community Association, both receiving their medals in recent weeks. Congratulations. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Kent, hope you're feeling better. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Doesn't sound like it. I don't sound good. <laughs> I'm not 100%, that's for sure. But I needed to feel human and be out of my PJs today. So thank you all for that opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I kind of look like I do. Um, I want to acknowledge and support Carolyn Hockley, who is a Dartmouth resident, friend of mine, who has, uh, uh, Mayor and I both met her on the doorstep in, a, in an election many years ago. She launched a new children's book last night, and it's called Green Bin Nation, The Secret Within Citadel Hill. And this really is all about recycling, uh, utilizing your green bin, children who actually end up under the harbor with a whole different uh, group of, uh, I'm going to call them gnomes or a, 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 a hidden city where they are, you know, uh, contributing to the importance of and why green bins are so important in our city. So what's really exciting about this is, as well, is it's educational, of course, it's, it, it, it tweaks your imagination, it's for children, young readers, but Carolyn is also a member of our staff in government relations, and her illustrator is Jenny U Urich, um, she's with Planning and Development. So if you don't have this book yet, here, counselors and members of the public, this this is a must do for a, a great little Christmas um, uh, present for young readers 
or if you need some unique gift or promotional act, uh, item around our waste management and the importance of recycling, the importance of protecting the environment, this is a fun one. So congratulations, Carolyn, and thank you to uh, members of council and mayor for coming out to her launch last night at, at uh, the uh, Dartmouth Sportsplex. Thanks. Thank you. So the author is with Gria at HRM, the illustrator is with Planning, and the official agent is a counsellor uh, here. I, I would just want to say this, I, I'm, it's a great, it's a charming book, I encourage people to read it. Um, the author, Carolyn Hockley, is a great um, supporter of student writing. She's done some amazing stuff, and I think the world could use more creative uh, writing uh, in a good way. So uh, congratulations to her. Councillor Diego Gamma. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, some sad news to impart. Uh, our condolences go out to the family of Frances White, an amazing volunteer who passed away at the tender age of 56. He was an amazing um, volunteer. <clears throat> Excuse me. He um, you know, was with the Knights of Columbus. I sat on various uh, church committees with him and community committees. And, uh, you know, so our condolences to uh, his wife, Tanya, his teenage son, Adam. One of the things that uh, France has always supported and uh, would like to acknowledge the work of the Fall River uh, Christmas Express. Over the last week, we have um, been able to pick up more food than you can imagine um, to be able to food about, feed about 100 families uh, this Christmas. So we're very excited about that and, and congratulations to everyone who donated and gave food, who spent time sorting. We'll be packing the food on Wednesday evening and getting ready to deliver it uh, the 21st of December. So thank you to all those amazing volunteers, those who gave and those who worked. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. We extend our best wishes to the family. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, on, in, on the Saturday paper, uh, there was a story about uh, Sophia McGinnis. And Sophia is a 10-year-old in Lower Sackville who, uh, this is going to be her last Christmas. She has a, um, she has brain cancer, it is terminal, it has a 0% survival rate. Um, she is asking this year for everybody to send her a Christmas card. And that Christmas card uh, can be sent to, the, the address is on the inside of the paper. It can be sent to Natalie Frozell, 165 Prince Street in Lower Sackville, B4C1L4. Uh, Sophia is an incredibly strong and an incredibly positive young lady. Uh, she has gone out recently with her family and has picked up $800 to $1,000 in stuffies to give to other kids in the community. It's a testament to maintaining po uh, positivity. I hate that term because of uh, a former counselor. Um, but, uh, and, and I apologize for using it, um, but, um, um, but she is a testament to remaining positive even in um, incredibly serious times. So for anybody, please pick up the Saturday paper if you can and uh, send a, send a uh, Christmas card to Sophia. Uh, this is gonna be a challenging Christmas for a lot of people in, in that neck of the woods. Uh, there is, related to that, we have a, a, um, a homeless challenge in Lower Sackville. Uh, a number of people have been working on that. The Sackville Area Warming Center is part of that. And a new shelter has opened up with the Sackville Area Warming Center. This is at the former St. Elizabeth Seton site on Metropolitan Ave. There's going to be a public meeting related to the, uh, the new winter shelter. It's, it's only in place for six months. That public meeting is going to be Thursday evening at the Kinsman Hall at uh, 71 First Lake Drive, and that's at 7 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hensby. Oh, sorry, Councillor Smith, and then we'll go back to Councillor Hensby. Sorry, Mr. Murray, that threw me off. Uh, just um, two, two quick announcements. One is thank you everyone who came to the Halifax Explosion Ceremony on December 6th. 
Uh, it's always a moving and uh, important ceremony, and I believe it also was our deputy mayor's first gig, uh, and he didn't mess it up, Mr. Mayor. So, good good job to him. He he got a couple a couple applauses by some of the members in the audience. So so good job, deputy mayor. Um, so again, always always thankful to be the MC for that event. Also, too, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the recipients of the Queen's Jubilee Medal uh, that was given out by MLA Susie Hansen. Um, some of the names uh, from the community, uh, some of the unsung heroes that received it, which you know you always appreciate. Uh, uh, Ms. Wanda Lewis, Linda Mantley, Brenda Steed Ross, uh, Mr. George McCormick, uh, Lieutenant Jerry Kowalski, um, Devon Bundy, uh, and myself. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, wasn't expecting a round of applause, um, but thank you, colleagues. Um, so, so yeah, just thank you to Emily Susan Hansen for recognizing uh, community members uh, who are sometimes unsung heroes who are just doing their work behind the scenes. So, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, speaking of the vein of uh, unsung heroes, I want to acknowledge and congratulate the, the, the most recent Order of Nova Scotia recipients. Four of the five are Halifax residents. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that the late uh, Ken, uh, Kenzie McKenzie from Sydney um, for his art, artistry and, and music and culture, but also for our local residents, John Berlow, the well-known historian here in Halifax area. We have Dr. Strang that kept us uh, orderly during the pandemic period and hopefully as we still go through recovery. As well as Rust and Southwell has been very busy with the, uh, the African Nova Scotia communities of the BBI, the, the Black Business Initiative. And I also want to congratulate most of all uh, Hope Swimminer from Seaforth in my district for her tireless work in regards to protecting and saving and, and promoting the, the wildlife um, lives of Nova Scotia. So I'd like to thank uh, all the Order of Nova Scotia recipients and congratulate them all. For sure. Thank you very much, Councillor. There's no further uh, announcements. Uh, approval of the minutes of November 22. So moved. moved, seconded. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. The order of business. Um, so, Mr. Clerk, we are proposing that we will go into in camera right after item number uh, five. Actually, why don't we do it after uh, 11? Um, we do have two heritage hearings uh, right at one o'clock um, and we need to talk about the public hearing and I'm not sure maybe that's something Councillor Austin is proposing. Um, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like, I mean, it's uh, always a difficult thing to uh, cancel a public hearing at the last moment, so to speak. Um, but I feel in this case, it's necessary that we uh, defer this um, and whatever rescheduling that entails, um, since the area councillor is unable to attend today through no fault of her own. Um, so I'd like to propose that we uh, defer that item. And Okay. Seconded by Councillor Mancini, so that will have to be re-advertised. Re um, and will we have it at the first meeting in, in the new year? Uh, we would have to talk to our colleagues at planning. It would depend on advertising. Okay, so be, it would done, be, be done at the next potential date. All right, uh, any questions on that? And we would have to let people know today. Uh, uh, Mr. Clark. Mayor Savage, we do have one added item for the agenda today. That is a ratification of the decision from budget this morning. Okay. On the um, deferral of the public uh, hearing, is there any questions on that? Uh, we, I want to echo what the deputy mayor said. It's, it's, un, it's unusual. We don't do this uh, at this point in time, but because of the inability of the councillor to be here, which she would like to be, uh, she's asked that that be deferred. Councillor Clary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just on the deferral of the public hearing, I guess, I mean, it's the first time I can recall where we've done this in the six years I've been on council. Um, you know, is, uh, has anyone asked the applicant about this? I mean, how do I, has anyone consulted with planning and development? I mean, it, this is a huge impact for all parties, uh, council included, and I know the local councilor is local, but it's one of 16, one cent of 17 votes. Um, I'm just, you know, uh, to move something like this is unusual. So I'm just wondering if we have any feedback from the folks who would be involved in this. 
or is this just kind of spur of the moment? Mr. Clerk, uh, what would be the process if this was deferred in terms of the applicant and uh, planning and development to make sure that... Because I guess the big thing is, is there cost to the applicant? Because I know we have to advertise for this, so is planning and development going to charge the applicant again to re-advertise for this? Or are we going to absorb that cost? Because I don't think that's fair if we defer it to make the applicant pay for more advertising. I see. Kelly Dente, uh, President of Planning. <laughs> That's what we do in lieu of salary increases around here. Mm, I'll take that. Um, the advertisements occur online now, so there would be no newspaper cost associated with it, uh, but we're here to follow Council's direction. Uh, we would have to reach out and contact the applicant and, and do a notification for the, to the community, but also we'd have to post notices here for folks who didn't see that and would show up. So a little bit of inconvenience, but we are at uh, Council's pleasure on that. And the notification of the community, that comes in the form of a postcard or some sort of mail out, which would be a cost to us, a hard cost to us. Direct mail out, that's right. And would, are there any timing implications to this, uh, Kelly, that we should be aware of that a delay would impact? Mm, I would have to check. I mean, it is for a single unit dwelling, so I don't, I don't expect the delays are, you know, uh, extensive, but it is, sure, it's a, it's a delay, yeah. Deputy Mayor? Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, it, in terms of like, you know, have we done this before? We actually did in our last Harbor East Community Council meeting um, because there was a public hearing in uh, one of our councillor districts and the, the councillor, as we can all hear, was uh, quite under the weather, so wasn't able to attend. Um, and so, you know, yes, it is one vote of 17, but I mean, to me, like, you know, we all look to the area councillor with some degree of deference and for their take on things. Doesn't mean that you always vote their way, but, uh, you know, that's pretty valuable input. And so I, I think it's a professional courtesy to a colleague um, where they're, it, it, it's different if they were away um, through some, well, I just chose not to come today, but you know, this is beyond their control. So uh, I, I think we should defer it. Thank you. Okay, I think we should vote on this one on the machines, Ian. Is that, uh, this is on the deferral of the public hearing and the process that will follow. Okay, all those in favor? On the deferral, yeah. Okay, so that will be done and I, whoever contacts the applicant will explain the circumstances, uh, I hope, uh, and pass along our um, apologies for late notice. Um, on the other changes then, um, uh, I'll just look for show of hands, everybody's okay with going in camera uh, right after number 11. Was there other changes? Uh, the only other addition ratification. was ratification. Everybody's was okay with the ratification of what we did? Okay, then does somebody want to move the approval of the order of business as amended? Moved by Councillor Lovely, seconded by Councillor Stoddard. All those in favor? Opposed? That's what we'll do. On the consent agenda, item five. Councillor Mancini. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to have 15.5.1 uh, uh, taken off the consent agenda, please. 15.5.1 will be taken off the consent agenda. Councillor Morse. Thank you. I'd like to have 15.1.5 taken off, please. 15.1.5 will come off consent. There's no other changes. Does somebody want to move the consent agenda as amended? Mo 15.15 and 15.51. Moved by Councillor Mason, seconded by Councillor Russell. We're going to go to the machines on this one. That is passed. So just so people know, 15, the following items are passed on consent. 15.12, which is uh, facility operating agreement for the Bay Community Center. 1516, which is uh, HRM asset names. 
deemed passed on consent. 15-110 is uh, amendments to the planning district uh, for Goodwood. Passed on consent. 15-41, Bedford West Park Facilities Plan is deemed passed on consent. 15-42, Halifax Public Gardens proposal deemed passed on consent. 1561, amendments on the taxi broker fee system passed on consent. 1581 and 82, 152 from the Heritage Advisory Committee. Um, 1608 Hammonds Plains Road and uh, 58, 12, 14 North Street, Halifax, are deemed passed to the next stage. 1583, 6221 Coburg Road to the Registry of Heritage Property, and 1584, 1308, and 1390 Roby Street, passed on consent. The two that we will take off consent are 1515, which is uh, the MPS amendments for Main Avenue in Halifax, and 1551, which is the district boundary review phase two. So that's been voted on. Business arising out of the minutes, calls for declaration of conflict, motions of reconsideration and rescission, none. There is no deferred business. There's no tabled matters. Uh, as indicated at this point in time, if somebody wants to move it, we will go in camera and come back in public as soon as we've done that. Moved by Councillor Hensby, seconded by Councillor Kent. All in favour? Carried. We will resume in, uh, in camera.
All right, where's John? Okay, we just need a clerk. So, all right. Okay, we're back in public session. We have two heritage hearings at one o'clock. Um, we're gonna move the ratification of in camera up. Ian? Okay, so we, ratif we did the minutes. Um, Councilor Hensby, you wanna move the minutes? I'll just move the minutes. All those in favor of the in-camera minutes? Aye, aye, aye. Opposed? 17.2, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. I move that Halifax Regional Council one adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated November 29th, 2022 and two direct that the private and confidential report dated November 29th, 2022 be maintained private and confidential. Second, Councillor Hensby, uh, ready for the question? Question. question. That's carried. 17.3, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated November 30th, 2022, and 2 direct that the private and confidential report dated November 30th, 2022 be maintained private and confidential. Second it. Seconded, Councillor Hensby. Ready for the question, colleagues. That motion is carried. 17.4, who was that, uh, Depu uh, Deputy, Cou uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated November 30th, 2022, and 2, direct that the private and confidential report dated November 30th, 2022 be maintained private and confidential. Seconded by, who was that, Councillor? Kent, seconded by Councillor Kent. Um, ready for the uh, ready for the question? Are we voting already? The voting is going too fast. Okay, that motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, we're just going to resume our meeting. Correspondence, Mr. Clerk. Correspondence has been received for item 15110, 1551, 12 and 12.2. All correspondence has been circulated, all members of council. Thank you. Petitions, colleagues? No petitions, no information items brought forward. We'll go to reports. 1511 is proposed amendments to administrative order 29, civic addressing, renaming of Cornwallis Street. Councillor Smith. Mr. Mason? Okay, cool. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, this is our dividing line, so we're just kind of fighting who gets, to put the, who gets to put the motion on the floor. So I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt the proposed amendments to Administrative Order 29 respecting civic, civic addressing policies as set out in Attachment A of the staff report dated December 8, 2022 to approve the renaming of Kowalda Street, Halifax to Nora Bernard Street, Halifax as, as identified in Map 1 of the staff report dated December 8, 2022. Second. Second by Councillor Mason, uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I don't think there's a presentation on, on this item right. Uh, so what I would like to do, though, if, if I can, is, is ask uh, Gail to, to come up, uh, only because I think the process that we used for this is one that, that for folks who might not have read the report, it might just be worthwhile just giving a high level uh, how we got here, because I think this process was one that 
included the advisory uh, group, um, which was HRM folks, but we really got uh, an, an outstanding amount of uh, feedback from residents and community members and at two stages. So I'm just, uh, I support this. I think this is a great, a great step forward. There were some other names that were very close to, to being recognized and, and names that were surprising to us as well. So I just wonder, Gil, if you can just give a really high level of the process of how we got here and also to speak to the fact of how we got such a great engagement from communities and abroad. Gail McLean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Gail McLean, former Civic Addressing Coordinator. This is my last street renaming report and I'm delighted it's this one. <laughs> Not until I die. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, as you know, street renamings in the past have only involved the property owners that live on the street and often the tenants as well. Uh, after the task force recommended the renaming of Cornwallis Street, Regional Council specifically directed staff to make the consultation a broader municipal-wide participation project. Through our partners at Corporate Communications, we came up with a corporate plan on how to do that engagement. We were fully supported by our colleagues at Corporate Communications who made recommendations on how to engage on a completely municipal level. We worked with the local councillors to determine which specific groups in the north end of Halifax we needed to engage and as always the direct communication with the property owners on the street. I don't have specific numbers for every other project we've ever done but I'm confident in saying this is the highest level of engagement we have ever had for a renaming project. We asked on the survey for all of the participants to indicate if they were Cornwallis Street residents or owners, and we had 75% of the Cornwallis Street participate in the project through the survey. On a go-forward basis for these values types of renamings, staff would most likely recommend that this be the procedure for those based on the success of this project. So to just start on that to close up, I, I think that um, one, we heard from the community and, and, and abroad that this was a process in, in a name that they supported. Um, and, and also, I just hope in the future we can look at maybe using this. I know it was a lot of work on Gail, so I also want to bring up to say thank you because you were doing a lot of work to even to get the advisory board together. That I know that took some, some work. So just thank you for that, and, and I hope we can use this for future um, street namings in, 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 the, in this sense. So thank you, Ms. Mayor, and that's it for me. Support this. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to chime in too and say, uh, geez, Gail, gonna miss you. It's been a long time uh, doing this and you worked really hard on this and our staff faced, you know, the, the people who oppose this change, uh, many of them are very, very hold deeply held beliefs and sometimes uh, uh, in the way they present those beliefs is not in the most friendly or uh, constructive way. And so I think, you know, I just wanted to recognize that Gail uh, and staff uh, did a lot of work in what could be sometimes adverse conditions and I really appreciate you being, remaining calm. I would not want to pay, play you uh, poker for money with you. I think your poker face is probably pretty good. So, uh, so thank you for everything you've done. And this is, a, you know, for those of us who've been here since uh, the beginning of the discussion about uh, uh, Cornwallis. Uh, this is another uh, important delivery on the promises that we've made to this community that tr traditionally was not listened to and respected by, uh, by the province and by this municipality. And I really am glad that we're able to deliver this today. So thank you all for supporting this. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Okay, ready for the question, colleagues? That's Kerry Gale. Thank you for your great service to the municipality and that job that you've done and good luck with everything else. We appreciate your work. Thank you. Okay, 1512 was passed on consent. That's the facility operating agreement for the Bay Community Center. 15.1.3 is first reading on bylaw C901, charges for stormwater from municipal streets. Council, what is your wish? Councillor Hensby. 
Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. The Health Actuary to Council One for, uh, give first reading to bylaw C901, repealing bylaw not C900, the uh, charges for stormwater from the municipal streets bylaw. Uh, set out in appendix uh, attachment uh, one of the staff report dated November 30th, 2022, and two adopt the boundaries for the new stormwater right of way area rate effective on <laughs> April 1st, 2023, as uh, shown in an attachment two of the, of the staff report dated November 30th, 2022. Second, Second by Councillor Russell, uh, Councillor Hensley. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Madden. I don't know if there's anyone present to talk about the stormwater billing. Is there someone? Good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Angie Spinney, Senior Financial Consultant. Uh, just in regards to this not being taken effect till the new fiscal year, what about the billings that were issued this year? Were they going to be based on the old calculation and, and, and still for, we have new territories, my particular district as well as in, in the Western region and District 13. I'd like to know in regards to stormwater fees, are they going to be charged at the, uh, the current rate or they were going to be policy change and changing that for the next next billing cycle um, so there would be a prorated charge for the period once uh, council uh, implements the change so um, the uh, charge as set out by Halifax water would prorate it now that they've had approval from the utility and review board however it is uh, up to council to uh, set the the rate and to implement this policy um, through the budget process so um, you uh, the, as set out in the council report, um, the change is set to take effect on April 1st, 2023. Okay, but back to the current fiscal year in regards to the current billing. Uh, we took over new territories on June 1st, so will they get a, a prorated bill for 10 of uh, 12 months of the prorated bill, or are they going to be charged a whole fee for the whole fiscal year? Um, I believe Halifax Water will be charging them the fee for the whole fiscal year, so they will still uh, charge the the $40 per um, customer uh, for fiscal 22-23. Okay, well, Mr. Mayor, I think those are some of the nuances I think we need to work out in regards to the, the current billing. You know, they do not have the benefit of the service for a full, for a full year. It should only be 10, 10 twelfths of the billing as well as um, there's been some discussion about this administrative uh, operating uh, additional fee on administrative fee of being charged $25 to set up an account with Halifax West. They were involuntarily became customers because of the download of the province. And here we are, you know, charging an additional $25 plus the stormwater fee uh, on top of this. Um, you know, I think there's some discrepancies. We have to review this policy and how this become about. And like I said, it was an involuntary registration. They should not be charged a $25 registration fee, and they should be prorated in regards to stormwater fee. All right, thank you. Councillor Kent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to staff, I'm just wondering what the, should this pass, what would the communication piece be um, like for the residents? Because this is a big, this is a big change, right? Um, I believe we would have a thorough communication process um, mm -hmm. that would, uh, so the new fee would be uh, introduced in the Halifax uh, regional municipality tax bill for 23-24, so we could have a, a thorough communication um, through that uh, distribution included with the tax bills. Yeah, I think I just wonder if things like this is it's really important that we get that message out. Um, getting it at the bill tax bill time is a is a can be traumatic at the best of times for, for people and anxiety provoking. So um, I'd, like to, I'd like to think that we would get ahead of that a little bit more. Perhaps that can be considered. Um, and uh, communication pieces often come out of our, as counselors, our, our networks. Those are not, it's another option because uh, there, there will be an uptake on questions around this. There's no question about that in my mind. But thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Love. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I could probably talk on this issue for a very long time, but I won't. Um, <laughs> I will say we're getting better um, at creating some equity with, within this payment process. Um, to Councillor Hensby's point about the involuntary registration fee of $25, 
um, while it is, is involuntary from the perspective as being a customer of a utility, it was approved by the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board in their order. They um, uh, included uh, the consideration for that $25 fee. It is important for us to also acknowledge the fact that these folks are customers of Halifax Water because of a statutory requirement with the province of Nova Scotia and provincial legislation. And so through provincial design, we are here we are. However, it is important to recognize that a person who is paying that full fee um, for the right of way uh, is paying twice. They're paying in their income taxes to the province for a service that they should have received for many, many years, stormwater service, and many did not. And now the onus is on the utility to provide that service and upgrade that infrastructure, which will cost. And it will cost all ratepayers um, to upgrade that service. So I think uh, when we jump from 4 million to 5.3 million, according to the Utility and Review Board, that is what the municipality is required to pay now. And as more provincial roads are downloaded to the municipality, that fee will continue to rise. So I, I think that this again is a conversation that needs to happen at the service exchange agreement uh, for the municipality and the provincial government uh, to, to work on because stormwater um, is not going away and it is getting worse and the infrastructure is costing more. So we do have to have a much more equitable equitable approach, uh, but I think that this gets us where we need to be, and I just want to thank staff um, in, uh, in, in, in working on this and putting this forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, this topic has probably had more confusion than any other in the last uh, <laughs> number of years, and e even just now in our debate, I mean, uh, Councillor, I, I, I get the sympathy about, you know, you didn't want to be a customer, and then uh, you're becoming a customer, and you're paying $25 to be a customer when you didn't even want to, but that's kind of, that's actually not even part of what we're talking about today, what we're talking about, and I, you know, I hope, uh, I like the idea of having a communication piece on this in the tax bill. So when you open your tax bill, there's an explanation in there that says that this is what this new charge is. I just really want to emphasize for staff, please make that in plain English, right? Like, you know, <laughs> if it's bureaucratic, they're just going to get confused as to which charge is which. And it's like, but I'm already paying on my Halifax water bill. It needs to be plain English. This is the fee that the municipality pays for the storm service to your sidewalks and your roads. This is the public good piece. Uh, it's not a service to your individual property, right? Um, and so it's just been, there's so much confusion confusion on this and I think as council trying to do the right thing over time, um, you know, inadvertently added to that confusion with uh, some of the ideas along the way. And so I think this clarifies a lot. Uh, I would have preferred on the general rate, but an area rate, uh, I'm okay with that. But uh, really when we're communicating this, we really need to emphasize this is the common good service for roads and sidewalks. This is not a service to individual properties that, and that's what this is about. So I just really want to emphasize that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Hensby. Hey, uh, just two other things I want to clarify in regards to this whole report and in regards to if a property has been exempt from its own personal stormwater um, charge because it doesn't contribute any runoff to any of the stormwater network, would they also be exempt from this area rate of stormwater uh, rate? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, um, I would uh, have to get back to you and verify that, but I believe because this is a charge for the public good of the roads uh, and the sidewalks that they're benefiting from. And Maybe my colleague Renee can uh, further help me with this answer. Hi, Renee Towns. I'm the Treasurer of Finance and Asset Management. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. Uh, Halifax Water had a methodology to ap approve exemptions. Uh, HRM does not have that. That same process, so those uh, those folks would be charged. So if a property has no contributing factor to the stormwater infrastructure, they'll still get charged with the common area rate. Even if the property's out in the woods, has no connectivity to roads or everything, but it's caught in the catchment area of this uh, regional zone, they're still going to be charged. If they are in the catchment zone, they will be charged. So a property out in the woods, no connectivity to any roads, not even to cow path, whatever, 
basically a, a vacant wood lot is going to get charged a stormwater right of way charge. If they're in the catchment area, they will be charged. <laughs> The general rate or Halifax water could continue no, the general to rate is still, the same thing will still apply to the general rate. You see, you're being charged for service you don't even have access for. So there's some there's some difficulties with this that I think that uh, you know this is better than it was, but it's still not perfect. Councilor Russell. Thank you very much. I'm I'm uh, curious about the communication, uh, as uh, has been mentioned a number of times, where this is going to impact both the uh, Halifax Water Bill and the HRM Tax Bill. Um, would we be working with Halifax Water to ensure consistent communication uh, is provided in both sets of bills, uh, so that uh, so that any customer that that does get both bills would say, you know, Halifax Water is charging me and HRM is charging me for exactly the same thing. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, we can certainly reach out with our Halifax Water colleagues and ensure there is consistent communication so that uh, Halifax Water rate payers uh, are aware that um, the charge is now moving to their HRM tax bill and being removed from their Halifax Water bill, and now that it is a replacement uh, of that charge over to their tax bill. So we can certainly work with our colleagues. We have a close relationship with them, and so we can certainly Super. Do that. Thank you very much. All right, anybody else? Ready for the question? That motion carries. Colleagues, the noon gun has gone. We'll take a break. We'll be back at one o'clock with our two heritage hearings and then we'll pick up where we left off with council.
Okay, folks, we're going to go. Just waiting for Tony, okay. Okay. All right, folks, we have a couple of heritage hearings. The first one is case H00525, 1460 Oxford Street. I'll begin with staff. Good afternoon. And catch up here a little bit. Okay. And now my computer isn't working. I'm very sorry. Give me three minutes. I'll do this as quickly as I can. <laughs> Good to go. Good afternoon. There we go. Ah, thank you for your patience. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, hello, my name is Jenny Lugar. I'm a former heritage planner. I'm currently on the current planning team, but I'm carrying through a couple of these registrations here. Um, so today we are looking at uh, case H00525, which is a heritage registration application for 1460 Oxford Street. So on December 13th, 2021, a third party application was made by the Halifax Military Heritage Preservation Society to consider the inclusion of 1460 Oxford Street in the registry of heritage property for the Halifax Regional Municipality. 1460 Oxford Street is owned by Dalhousie University and was used as the residence for the university president for much of its history. It's located on Oxford Street, south of the intersection with Coburg Road and across from the Dalhousie University Studley campus, as you can see on the map on the screen. At their October 26, 2022 meeting, the Heritage Advisory Committee evaluated the subject property based on six criteria. 
Each criterion has a maximum score with the total maximum points uh, that can be awarded being 100. I'll go through each of these criteria uh, and summarize the scores that HAC awarded at the end of the presentation. So the first category is age. The construction of the residence, which was known as Oakville when it was built, was begun in 1867 and completed in 1868. It's seen here on your screen about 30 years after its construction in uh, circa 1900. The second category is historical importance for historical relationships. 1460 Oxford Street has associations with its original owner, Levi Hart, uh, with Prime Minister Richard uh, B. Bennett, and uh, several Dalhousie presidents, of course. Levi Hart, the original owner who commissioned the property, was a merchant who traded in the West Indies and in the United States. Levi Hart is known to have supplied Confederate blockade runners with coal and other goods, aiding the American Confederate South's efforts in the war. Due to the role that he played supporting the Confederacy, staff encouraged HAC to discount Hart's contributions to this category, which we often do with historical figures who um, we, can, we can understand that their actions were not something that we might support in a modern sense. Uh, Dalhousie alumnus and later Prime Minister Richard B. Bennett financed Dalhousie's university's purchase of the property for the purpose of the president's residence and went on to later to donate $750,000 dollars to his alma mater. Uh, Bennett was a contentious prime minister who's known for unsuccessfully navigating the country through the Great Depression, but in spite of this, uh, he was also known for his campaign for women to run for political office and also for his personal charity. He's reported to have spent his evenings reading letters written by desperate Canadians during the Depression and is known to have donated upwards of $35.4 million of his own money to such families. As the president's residence, 1460 Oxford Street also served as the home of several presidents, including Arthur Stanley Mackenzie, Carlton Stanley, and Alexander E. Kerr. Dr. Mackenzie is noteworthy as the first non-reverend president of Dalhousie and for how instrumental he was in the growth and expansion of Dalhousie, including facilitating the major relocation from Grand Parade, which is the building that we currently sit in, to the Studley campus. Dr. Mackenzie was the president during the purchase of Oakville. Dr. Stanley the, was a somewhat contentious president who attempted to overhaul university policy and ruled with uh, what is reported to be, have been an iron fist, though some, key, though some key reforms towards modernization were made as a result of his tenure. And then finally, Dr. Kerr was a Lewisburg, Nova Scotia native and had a successful ministerial career uh, prior to his appointment as president. He oversaw the arrival and education of World War II veterans and the construction of several prominent Dalhousie buildings, making him one of the most celebrated university presidents to date. Uh, so the third uh, category is significance of the architect or builder. Historical research that was done for this registration was unable to determine who the original architect or builder was for 1460 Oxford Street. As a matter of interest, the report, uh, which is um, appended to the staff report, the research report, does note that Andrew Cobb completed some interior renovations in the 1920s following Dalhousie's purchase of the property. However, as these were only interior renovations, this should be considered interesting historical information, but it didn't contribute to the score that was awarded by HAC due to the fact that the Heritage Property Act doesn't apply to the interior of privately owned buildings. It's also worth noting that when historical research can't be determ cannot determine the architect or builder for a residence, staff recommend a score of zero. In this case, HAC decided to award one point. The explanation given by members was that while we don't know who the architect or builder was, uh, there must have been somewhat noteworthy given the commendable architecture of the residence and the fact that the building is still standing. Just wanted to give a little bit of context there. So the fourth uh, category 4A evaluates architectural merit for the construction type. The residence at 1460 Oxford Street shown here uh, was built of light frame wood construction and with a brick and granite masonry foundation. This was a relatively common construction type uh, for this period. Category 4B evaluates architectural merit for style. So the residence uh, was constructed in the Italianate style, which was popular in Nova Scotia between 1850 and 1890. 
It's one, uh, it being Oakville, the residence, is one of two original twin mansions. Oakville was built for Levi Hart, while the mansion next door, which was known as Armbre, was built for his business partner, John T. Wilde. The Armbre Italianate Mansion has since been demolished. Um, it's in the location that Armbre Academy currently sits, um, but was, yeah, but was located at that site. So there are a number of uh, noteworthy Italianate mansions in Halifax. However, this is a rare example in this neighborhood where the majority of the neighborhood was built during the turn of the century and at the beginning of the 20th century. This residence is a really excellent example of the Italianate style featuring several key Italianate elements, including a hipped roof, uh, heavily decorated brackets, round-headed windows, and the rooftop belvedere with a widow's walk. I'll go back one slide here so that you can see what I mean. The Belvedere is the um, uh, the small structure on the roof of the building there, and then the Widow's Walk is the um, fenced-in area around it. The fifth category is architectural integrity. 1460 Oxford Street has excellent architectural integrity, both in terms of its original layout and the physical condition of the building. Only very minor alterations have been made, including a small addition to the rear of the first floor and the removal of part of the rear veranda. Architectural features such as the window moldings, the bracketing, the frieze work, and the dentals have been excellently maintained by Dalhousie University in the nearly 100 years of their ownership, as can be seen when looking at the photo of, uh, from 1900 uh, on the left of your screen versus the photo from 2022 on the right of your screen here. The sixth and final category is the property's relationship to the surrounding area. So the subject property is strongly related uh, to its surrounding area as one of the early rural estates in what we now call the Old West End, uh, which was largely developed on the prior family's former estate, which was much larger than all of these large estates. It's also one of several institutional buildings in the area, and specifically on this block of Oxford Street, uh, which is very institutional, as shown in the aerial image on the slide. This includes the Beth Israel Synagogue, Armbray Academy, the First Baptist Church of Halifax, and of course across the street, the Dalhousie Studley Campus. So HAC evaluated the property based on the registration evaluation criteria and awarded 1460 Oxford Street a total of 64 points. The property scored full points for architectural merit for style, full points for relationship to the surrounding area, and nearly full points for architectural integrity, whereas it scored very low for the significance of the architect or builder, of course, since that individual was unknown. Here's the recommendation, and thank you uh, today. Thank you very much. Don't see any questions of clarification. So I'm open the heritage hearing. Is the property owner here? And do they wish to address uh, council? Welcome to council. The floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Hines Jenkins, Director of Government Relations with Dalhousie University. Thank you for the opportunity to bring comments from the university today. For more than 200 years, Dalhousie has been a proud contributor to the character, vitality, and growth of Halifax as a vibrant and thriving city with exciting prospects. We recognize the contribution of our built environment to the city's character and are committed to continuing to grow with HRM in ways that align with our shared values of inclusivity, accessibility, and sustainability. We understand this council's interest in identifying iconic historic buildings and the motivation to utilize the tools at hand to ensure their preservation. We were very pleased that regional council's September 29 dialogue and direction on university owned historic buildings recognized the need for conservation to be balanced with future growth. Council called upon HRM and university staff to collaborate to ensure heritage review of university-owned properties considers both long-term preservation goals and the need for future university growth. Those dialogues have started. DAL and HRM staff have agreed on a high-level framework for the 36 Dalhousie buildings included in HRM's report on potential university heritage assets. We are keen to see this broader approach applied to all Dalhousie buildings being considered for registration so that a strategic lens reflective of both heritage priorities and growth imperatives is applied consistently. 
1460 Oxford Street was excluded from that report. We would encourage Council to deal with this property on a timeline that allows for this broader dialogue to play out in a way that is inclusive of 1460 Oxford Street, not separate from it. Thank you. Thank you very much. See no questions of clarification. We will uh, look for a motion to close the council. You have a question, okay. Were you trying to get on the board? Uh, yeah, I pressed on, but after you had already looked. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Councillor Austin, <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to clarify, I just want to clarify the last point. Uh, when you're talking about that process, is the request then from Dow not to proceed with registration today, or are you okay with this? Because it seemed like that from the correspondence. The request from Dow is to consider this at the same time that we're having the broader conversation about all of them, so to defer the decision. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. There's no other questions of clarification. I'll look for a motion to close the heritage hearing. Second. Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Cleary. All in favor? Um, okay, what are the wishes of Council? Councillor Mason? Thank you, Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council approve the request to include 1460 Oxford Street, Halifax in the Registry of Her Heritage Property for Halifax Regional Municipality as shown on Map 1 of October 21st, 2022 Staff Report as a Municipal Heritage Property under the Heritage Property Act. I so move. Thank you. Seconded by... Councillor... Stoddard, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just very briefly, I, I thank uh, both the uh, uh, owner and staff for their submissions. Uh, you know, while that other process is, is underway, this is before us now under the statutory process, and I don't see any particular reason to delay it. It, it meets the requirements, and that other process may end up with uh, no positive outcome. Like, the, 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 we can't presuppose that it will result in any recommendations at all. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm pleased to see this building uh, being recognized for its important contribution and uh, look forward to council support. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Are you ready for the question? Mr. Okay, your name's not showing up on my board, I wonder. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I appreciate uh, Dalhousie coming forward today to make the presentation known to us, but uh, in regards to that other context, that other, that other study and review, I believe that's more with the institutional buildings uh, in regards to the uh, various uh, educational faculty buildings. This being a residential building, I think it should be treated uh, differently and, and on time with, uh, with the application here today. So I think they deserve to be in separate processes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Are we ready? Anybody else? Councillor Purdy. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I was just wondering, so the timing of this, so this, this application must have been initiated prior to the, the greater Dow application for those, and so that's why it wasn't included in, in that, that particular process. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Ready for the question, colleagues? Okay, that is carried. Thank you. We will move to our second heritage hearing, which is 1322. Roby Street uh, to go into the Registry of Heritage Property. We have our staff back. Hi, welcome back. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I am all queued up and ready this time. <laughs> um, so again, my name is Jenny Lugar. I am a heritage planner, but I'm currently in current planning. Um, this is case, case H00545, and the property in question is 1322 Roby Street, Halifax. In April 2022, a third party application was made by the Friends of the Halifax Common to consider the inclusion of 1322 Ruby Street in the Registry of Heritage Property for the Halifax Regional Municipality. 
1322 Roby Street is owned by Dahaz University and has had various institutional uses since its purchase. It's located on Roby Street near the intersection with University Avenue and directly across the street from the Dalhousie Faculty of Dentistry, as you can see in the map on your slide. As before, um, at their October 5th, 2022 meeting, the Heritage Advisory Committee evaluated the subject property based on six criteria. Each criterion has a maximum score with the total maximum points, which, be, which can be awarded being 100. I will, uh, as I did before, go through each of these criteria and summarize the scores that HAC awarded at the end of the presentation. The first category that we evaluate is age. So originally known as 58 Roby Street in the Roby's Field subdivision, the deed history for the property indicates that the house was built between December 1877 and March 1878. The building is shown here on your, map, on your uh, slide uh, on the 1878 Hopkins City Atlas with a red arrow indicating uh, the building. The second category is historical importance. 1322 Roby Street has associations with many prominent Nova Scotians, uh, but most notably with the McAlpine family. David McAlpine uh, founded the D. McAlpine and Co. Publishing Company Advertising Agency in St. John, New Brunswick in 1861. David's two sons, Hezekiah and Charles, went on to work for and eventually run their father's company, which in 1866 took over the publication of the Hutchinson's Nova Scotia Directory. They renamed the publication to the McAlpine's Nova Scotia Directory, and the rest was history. The company produced directories for provinces and cities throughout the Maritimes and abroad, which were printed and updated yearly to help residents find businesses and the homes of other residents. Estella and Hezekiah McAlpine purchased the home at 1322 Roby Street, uh, which was then known as 58 Roby Street, in 1898 for their family. And not only did the family live there between 1898 and 1901, but they also ran the Nova Scotia contingent of the printing press out of the home during this period. In 1901, Hezekiah and his wife moved to St. John, New Brunswick to operate the company in St. John, while his brother Charles and wife Annie moved from St. John and purchased 1322 Roby Street in 1901 from their uh, brother and sister-in-law, where they would then reside until 1906. The importance of the McAlpine directories as a primary historical resource in Nova Scotia cannot be overstated. The directories contained personal information like names, place of residence, relationships, and also commercial information due to the high instance of advertising in the directories. This is a resource that we as heritage planners use uh, frequently. Several other noteworthy individuals either owned or resided at 1322 Roby Street apart from the McAlpine family. The home was built for George McLean, the first manager of First Merchant, first Merchant Bank, excuse me, which is now the Royal Bank of Canada. McLean was later fired from the bank amidst a money embezzlement scandal, but this house had already been built. The second owner was Reverend Thomas Watson Smith, a Methodist minister and distinguished writer and historian. Smith is best known for his progressive abolitionist beliefs, having written the, the historical work The Slave in Canada in 1899, when most contemporary historians from the time were still denying that slavery had ever existed in Canada. Following the McAlpines, Alexander Hobrecker owned the home for a short period, but never lived there. Hobrecker was a prominent businessman and resided in what is, now, what is known as the Olin Mansion on Young Avenue. Hobrecker rented the home to Dr. Arthur Stanley McKenzie, who at the time was a professor of physics, but would go on to be the president of Dalhousie University from 1911 to 1931, playing an instrumental role in the growth and development of the university. James T. Wilson was the next owner of the property who lived in the home briefly before renting it to tenants. Uh, his tenants were father and son, uh, John and Hugh Frazier, who owned Frazier Brothers, a horse stable for boarding and hire, which branched out into automobiles in the 1910s, eventually forming one of Halifax's early taxi companies. And finally, the property was owned by Dr. Gordon Wiswell, a pediatrician at the Halifax Children's Hospital, which became the IWK, and eventually the physician in chief at that hospital. Dr. Wiswell went on to become a professor of pediatrics at Dalhousie University and was largely responsible for the development of, the modern, of a modern pediatrics department. He resided at 1322 Roby Street until his death. Shortly, uh, shortly thereafter, his wife and children sold the home to Dalhousie University. The third category is the significance of the architect or builder. George McLean commissioned the master builder, sorry, commissioned master builder Samuel Manners Brookfield to build this residence at 1322 Roby Street. 
Brookfield was an English immigrant who took over his father's construction business following his death in 1870 and built several notable buildings in Halifax and across the Atlantic provinces. Some of his works, which are still standing today, include the Northwest Arm Memorial Tower, more colloquially known as the Dingle Tower, the Maritime Telegra Telephone and Telegraph Building on North Street, the Freemasons Hall on Barrington Street, All Saints Cathedral on Cathedral Lane, Mount St. Vincent University, Victoria General Hospital, the Bank of Nova Scotia uh, slash Bank of New Brunswick Building in St. John, New Brunswick, Anglican Cathedral of St. John the Baptist in St. John's, Newfoundland, many banking buildings, many bank buildings across the Halifax Regional Municipality, and many homes in the Halifax South, Halifax's South End. The fourth category has two subcategories, architectural merit for construction and architectural merit for style. In terms of construction, the residence at 1322 Roby Street was built of light frame wood construction and with a brick and coarse rubble masonry foundation. This was relatively common, uh, relatively common construction type for this period. In terms of architectural merit, the residence was constructed in the Second Empire style, a style which took inspiration from urban planner George Hausman's vision for Paris. The style was popular in Nova Scotia between 1860 and 1880. The mansard roof, which is characteristic of the style, was devised to create more usable space on the top floor of homes. This is one of only a few Second Empire style homes in the neighborhood and is uh, certainly the best example of the style in the, in the vicinity. Character defining elements include bracketed gable dormers on the mansard roof, ornamented cornice supported by decorative corbels and a simple paneled frieze, decorative brick chimney stack, three bay windows, two on the front and one on the south side of the home, and a front door with a semicircular pediment supported by large corbels and smaller medallions. The fifth category is architectural integrity. Integrity speaks to the intactness of the character defining elements and not how well the building has been maintained. So 1322 Ruby Street has excellent architectural integrity, both in terms of its original L-shaped layout shown in the images on the slide and in its physical condition. Some minor alterations have been made over time, including a small addition to the front right of the building, which is presumably a door to the basement. This doesn't affect any character defining elements, though it does have a minor impact on the symmetry of the facade. The door and uh, windows are also likely non-original to the house. Architectural features apart from that have been excellently maintained, including the dormers and bay windows and the decorative features such as corbels, medallions, paneling and pilasters, etc. The layout of the house uh, as shown in this 1878 map is uh, the same as it is in, shown in this 2022 aerial image on your screen here. The sixth and final category is the relationship to the surrounding area. The subject property has a historical and contemporary relationship to its surroundings due to the residential and more recently institutional uses on Roby Street and in the neighborhood. The home was one of the first residential buildings developed in the Roby's Field subdivision, the subdivision plans for which are shown uh, on your screen here. There are also several registered heritage properties in the immediate vicinity, including 1328 Roby Street, which abuts 1322 Roby Street to the north. This also includes the Carlton Street Early Victorian Streetscape, which is about a block away from the subject property. The others are shown on your screen here. So HAC evaluated the property based on the registration evaluation criteria and awarded 1322 Roby Street a total of 78 points. The property scored uh, particularly high points for its historical importance, largely based on its relationship to the McAlpine family, but also on several other noteworthy residents. It also received full points for the significance of the builder, Samuel Manners Brookfield, who built several noteworthy buildings in Halifax and the Atlantic provinces. There's the recommendation. Thank you very much. Thanks again. I see no questions of clarification. No hands or anything. Uh, I'll open the heritage sharing and invite the property owner again, please, to come and make a presentation. Good afternoon again. I'm Laura Hines Jenkins, here today re representing Dalhousie University. As discussed during the public hearing on Kate, case H00525, Dalhousie and HRM have a long held and shared commitment to the preservation of iconic historic buildings. In response to a recent council motion, HRM and Dalhousie staff are working collaboratively to develop a high level framework through which 36 Dalhousie buildings will be considered for possible heritage preservation. 
As directed by Council, this process will consider both preservation goals and further university growth. We are keen to see this broader approach applied to all Dalhousie buildings being considered for registration so that a strategic lens reflective of both heritage priorities and growth imperatives is consistently applied. 1322 Roby Street is currently excluded from this approach. We would encourage Council to deal with this property on a timeline that allows for it to be incorporated in this broader dialogue, not outside of it. This is particularly relevant for 1322 Roby Street since it is currently being considered for housing development. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hines Jenkins. Any questions, Councillor Mason? No questions. I'll put the motion on the floor if no one else is on the list. All right. No other questions. Uh, clarification. Then I look for a motion to close the heritage hearing. Councillor Cleary, Councillor Outfit, all in favour? Opposed? The heritage hearing uh, is closed. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. I'll move that Halifax Regional Council approve the request to include 1322 Roby Street, Halifax in a registry of heritage property for Halifax Regional Municipality as shown on Map 1 of October 3rd, 2022, staff report as a municipal heritage property under the Heritage Property Act. Second, Councillor Stoddard. Councillor Mason. So pretty much the same comments I made last time, though I really appreciated uh, to Ms. Lugar the uh, map that shows kind of the importance of the concentration of heritage in that access going down Carleton Street and University Avenue and how that's being recognized and protected. And, and I think this is a part of that. So I'd ask Council to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, just a quick question for our planning staff uh, and possibly our solicitor. I'm not sure if anyone knows this off the top of their head, if they have um, the Heritage Act in front of them. Um, I have a feeling, and so these are third party applications coming in. And we, I mean, statutorily, we can't just say to a third party applicant, no, we're not considering it. Uh, would there be anything under the Act? Uh, I mean, we can't defer things indefinitely. And to Councillor Mason's point, we have no idea what the outcome of any negotiation would be. Um, would, would a motion of council to say any third party apps by pro of properties owned by Dahazi University go on some shelf until su such and such a time? I mean, is that even legal? Like, is that something we could do? I, I guess when we're looking at these, I have a feeling there'll be more third party apps coming in. And so, you know, the, the situation is going to be the same. We'll have a representative from Dalhousie say, you know, don't do this, consider some other timeline. And then legally we have to follow some process. So. Can someone help me on, you know, if we wanted to stop this uh, or pause it, is there a legal way to do so? Not saying we want to, but I just have, I see a trend uh, uh, happening. Mr. Murnahan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Aaron Murnahan, Principal Heritage Planner with uh, Planning and Development. Uh, through you to the Councillor. Um, as staff, really, we're dutified to take any application uh, that comes through the door if it uh, meets the eligibility under the Heritage Property Act. And as currently, as you know, the Heritage Property Act does not preclude third-party applications. So if we get one through the door, certainly we are required to process it and take it through to the Heritage Advisory Committee. However, it's certainly Council's discretion uh, what happens from there. Um, and, and there's certainly no, no sort of limitations on council, if you will, with regard to how they uh, proceed, whether they want to defer those applications or, uh, you know, not schedule a heritage hearing at all. Um, but beyond that, I would maybe defer to, uh, to legal staff to provide some advice. Any further advice, John? There are time limits set out in the Heritage Property Act in terms of, you know, the, the framework, but fundamentally it comes down to the right to have a decision within a reasonable period of time um, and the risk that some action may be taken in respect of the building that's being proposed for registration in the interim where council um, has deferred or, or put aside something like that. So there are some challenges, but there's not a lot of clear direction. That's kind of what I figured the answer would be, so maybe I'll metaphorically look over to Dalhousie and just say maybe you want to speed up the process of talking with us so that, you know, we can prevent your presence with the same, you know, presentation uh, over and over again. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make a word on this. I'll just do it from here. I'm not going to, it's not really debate, it's a comment. I'm going to support this registration, but I echo what Councillor Cleary said on both of our parts, on the city and with Dal, that it's important that we 
come up with a plan that we balance heritage with the needs for housing in, in, the, uh, uh, in the community. But I think this one goes back to April or something and Dal was informed in June. So I will support this one, but I would say uh, that this work that we're undertaking is, uh, is important for the past and the future. Anybody else? Council, uh, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just want to clarify too, if this does um, proceed with the heritage status, you, you, there can still be development on the land. They just have to, right, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and I think Dow's indicated they would do that if right. in this case. Okay. I think that's in the public record, uh, so. All right, ready for the question, colleagues? That passes, thank you very much to the uh, staff. Thank you, folks. Thank you to uh, our guest, uh, Ms. Heinz Jenkins from Dalhousie. Um, okay, I'm just gonna reaffirm for anybody who may be listening that the public hearing tonight in a rather unusual circumstance is gonna be moved to a, further, a future meeting so that the re uh, local councillor can be part of that uh, discussion. We're gonna continue our uh, council agenda at 15.1.4. This is councillor appointments to boards, committees, commissions. Who would like to show leadership on this? Councillor Blackburn. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I will uh, put the following motion on the floor. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 suspend the rules of procedures requiring the Executive Standing Committee to review the nominations outlined in the staff report dated December 2nd, 2022 and make a recommendation to Regional Council to appoint Councillor Lovelace as the representative from the Transportation Standing Committee to serve on the Canadian Urban Transit Association for a term to the end of the council term. Three, appoint Councillor Deagle Gammon as the representative from Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee to serve on the Halifax Regional Water Commission for a term to the end of the council term. And four, appoint one member to the Halifax Regional Water Commission for a term to the end of this council term, I so move. Second, Second Councillor Mason, anything on it, uh, Councillor Blackwood? Uh, nothing further to add, no. Anybody else? We ready for the question? Did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, there's four motions in front of council today. The fourth motion is looking for a name for somebody to be um, put on to the Halifax Regional Water Commission, uh, the Halifax Water Board. So there are three names that are put forward that have been put forward for this, Councillor Hensby, Councillor Kent, and Councillor Purdy. We are looking for one nominating. Are there one any nominations? Councillor, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would like to nominate Becky Kent uh, to the Halifax Regional Water Commission. Okay. Is it Councillor Kent? Oh, she's not here. Is it Mike Kent? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Councillor Purdy, currently... you second that? And do we have a reason to believe she'll accept? She's currently Vice Chair. Okay. We will appoint uh, all those in favour of, uh, can we just do that by show of hands or do we have to vote, uh, Ian? Show of hands, all those in favour of Councillor Kent being uh, conscripted to the Halifax Regional Water board without her pre being present. Thank you. Oh, that's fast. So that'll now, thank you for that clarification. There we go. I wondered where you went when I saw your chair. Well, she's vice chair. I thought maybe you were Christmas shopping. I wasn't sure. <laughs> so we now have a complete motion as amended. Are we ready for the question on, on the motion as amended? That's carried, thank you. We will move to uh, 1515, which was taken off consent, and this was the municipal, plan, municipal planning strategy amendments for 44, 44B, 46, 48 Main Avenue, Halifax. Councillor Morse. Just thank, you. thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll put it on the floor, I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to one, initiate a process to consider amendments to the Halifax Municipal Planning Strategy and the Halifax Mainland Land Use Bylaw to allow mixed use medium density development within the study area outlined 
within the staff report dated December 5th, 2022, and two, follow the public participation program for municipal planning strategy amendments as approved by Regional Council on February 27th, 1997. Second by Councillor Stoddard to Councillor Morse. Thank you. Um, I took this off consent just because I wanted to um, make a couple comments to staff. Um, They're gonna be working on, this is essentially moving something forward for another staff report. Um, it's, it's looking at the zoning for um, new housing developments in the Dutch Village Road area. Um, again, Dutch Village is an important part of my district. Um, and what I would, uh, request that staff consider um, when they're doing the staff report is um, because of the proximity of these potential housing developments, um, they're at the bottom of Main Avenue. Um, they're very close to the um, regional center. They're on a bus rapid transit route. And so I don't think that the, um, I, I'm just going to ask them to look at the parking requirements and perhaps use the regional center as a, a model for these um, particular rezoning applications. And um, I also wanted to ask if uh, we could look at the allowing uh, a different length of building as well. Just something to consider in writing of the report. So my understanding is that I just had to bring this up to staff and that I don't need to move a motion on this, but just uh, these considerations on both parking and the building length. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Cyrus Smith, uh, Planner 2. Um, yes, so we don't need a, necessarily a change to the motion, but we can certainly make note of the uh, the decrease to the parking, and then you wanted to decrease the, the building height? I just wanted to... No, no if that. you could look at potentially increasing the building length um, due to the irregular lot sizes in this area. This is a former farming area, and the lots are quite irregular and it doesn't back on to single family homes. So if you could look at in those circumstances whether the building length could perhaps be um, longer. Okay, great, yeah, we can definitely do that. Okay, all right, that was all I wanted to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Ready for the question, colleagues? 1515. Carried, thank you very much. 1516 has passed on consent. That was HRM asset names. 1517 is the uh, master planning initiation for the M District Future Growth Node. Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to, one, initiate a process to consider amendments to the Regional Centre Secondary Municipal Planning Strategy and Land Use Bylaw to enable comprehensive development of the M District Future Growth Node located between Micmac Boulevard and Horizon Court. Two, consider as part of the M District Future Growth Node planning process the October 26, 2021 direction of Regional Council to prepare amendments to the Regional Centre Land Use Bylaw to increase the maximum tower dimensions established for the Micmac Mall Lands ML Special Area, and three, follow the public participation program as set out in Attachment A of the staff report dated December 5th, 2022. Second, Councillor Mason, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm happy to have this uh, coming forward before us. Um, there's certainly been, there's a lot of interest in Dartmouth in this one uh, as it broke in the media. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a big proposal. Um, but you know what? The center plan identified Micmac Mall as a place that it makes sense for this sort of density, for it to be in a more intensive place. Because what we're talking about is filling in paved parking lot um, next to one of our busier transit terminals, uh, close proximity to parks, close proximity to services. There's a, it'll probably need to be a bigger school, but there's a school up the hill. And so, and, and it's, it's great, for, uh, it's a great location for transportation. So uh, this was identified in the center plan as a future growth node precisely for this moment. Um, what the center plan has not done, which is what we really need to do here is figure out, well, what exactly is that gonna look like, right, on the, on the property, right? We know that it's a place we want more intensity. Uh, 
significant intensity, but we don't know exactly what that looks like, and we haven't had any community feedback or on any of that. So what we're initiating is really that visioning process. We're, uh, as the report notes, we're hoping to uh, pair it with preparing the development agreement alongside, if that process goes well, to try and not be too bureaucratic about things. Um, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what the broader community has to say in terms of what, well, what do they want this uh, small town that's going to be built here uh, to look like. And uh, there's a couple things just, you know, uh, I'm fine with this as a starting point. You know, the, the, I, I'll just note if the proponents out there are listening or anything or our staff, um, the one kind of piece just that I'm a little concerned about just from the beginning is how, how this relates in terms of public space. Because, you know, Micmac Mall was built for the automobile, right? So it faces inward, right? Like all the life of the place, the public space, it's all inside. And if you drive around the place, it's uh, parking and uh, and just you know an entrance here or there. So the facades are pretty empty. Um, so if we're thinking about what the potential of this future place is going to be to leave that existing mall facade basically as is and wrap a, a service road around it. I mean, I don't think that that's necessarily off to a great start. So, uh, you know, these are details that we can certainly have time to sort out um, in how all these pieces interact and how we really create a pedestrian oriented desirable location to come. So uh, I look forward to hearing more uh, from the community and seeing where this process takes us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy. Uh, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to reinforce what, uh, what, and I have a question for staff, actually, what uh, Councillor Austin just said. So uh, it's a great starting point. Strong support for this. It's exactly what we, we intended in the center plan. My, my question is just looking in the report and reading the old Nova Scotia article about it after the report, I saw things in there that I don't think quite meet the design guidelines that I believe they would be bound to meet in the, in the, uh, the design guideline manual for center plan applies to development agreements, uh, specifically both kind of uh, on the front bit facing King's Arms, uh, the back of those buildings facing the mall would be, they're, they're proposing 14 story, you know, at this point, it's all just massing models and I know that, but 14 story straight up, no step back, right? Just asking for wind tunnels for days there and also up against the property uh, to the northwest, up against their neighbor's property. So I, I just wanted to confirm that those design guidelines would apply. And I also think, you know, like this is very similar to what they did in the center of uh, Mississauga, right? At uh, whatever the name of that big mall is where, uh, uh, yeah, square one where Hazel McCallion built the mall and, and, you know, supported that and then decided it didn't work and they surrounded it with towers. But it's, I've been there. It doesn't still really work to reinforce what, what Sam's saying. Like you really need to have an emphasis that the mall needs to change how it faces the street and the community or you just kind of end up with a warehouse of people around a kind of very hostile space. So the, on the design guidelines was one question and the other is like how much flexibility uh, the linear parks as proposed, it, it doesn't have the same kind of detail that we saw when Penhorn came forward, if I can be blunt, talking about a different design where it came forward and we we're like, yes, this is sensitively done, a lot of this makes sense. And, and I'm wondering like how much uh, uh, guidance do we have about in terms of the green space requirements? Because if you're going to put those big, big towers there, you've got to, you know, the kind of things that we don't see yet are what are the shadow impacts and what's that going to feel like when you're walking by the big service road that goes, uh, you know, around by Old Navy and Decathlon and that kind of thing. So uh, those are my two questions are like, what are we thinking? What kind of controls and, and, and guidance do we have on parks and, uh, and do the design guidelines apply to what extent? Thank you very much. Uh, Kathleen Frelick, I'm a planner with our plant growth team. Um, so the proposal that you see before you is um, sort of a starting point from the applicant. Ultimately, we will be doing, undertaking a planning process that will come up with policy that will be used to guide and refine that, that any application that the property owner may submit. Um, so in this instance, that would be our opportunity to look at the design guidelines and make sure that they're implemented through our policies, as well as working with our parks and recreation staff to make sure that we're aware of the, the park needs and open space requirements for a development of this size. So that'll all be sort of figured out through this process. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mayor. So uh, Councillor Mason asked my first question just around the design guidelines piece, so uh, check mark for that. Don't need to rehash that. Another question, well, two other questions I have is one just related to the, the DA process, because this, will this be the first uh, growth 
future growth, I'm not, I'm not calling it node, but future growth area that we'll be completing under the new center plan? Or have we already done other ones? There's so many that I try to keep track. I know Pinhorn might, actually, Pin, is Pinhorn the first one? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, there has been a few of the future growth nodes. Some of them had policy approved through um, center, the center plan process. Um, so this would be, I'm not sure of what number in the list, um, but certainly not the first that has gone through this process. Is it, would it be the first where there wasn't um, uh, work done ahead of approval of center plan? Um, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Uh, no, there are some that we have not even sort of gotten any interest from property owners at this point. So right. we're sort of initiating them um, to date uh, as as property owners show interest or as mm -hmm. there is sort of general community interest. Um, so um, certainly not the last and right. definitely not the first. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not the last. So so yeah, I, I, I am curious on how the, the process will work related to the DA piece. The other question that I'm, I'm thinking or I have is, so say the proposal we have right now is we don't we don't like, this is theoretical, we don't like it and we are asking for different, maybe more townhouses, maybe single family dwellings, you know, just whatever, not what's on, the, on paper. Knowing what has happened uh, with the provincial government, could they overturn our process and say, yeah, we like that, that DA that's here since the changes with the the legislation, this is the one that you have to build. Is, is that a potential that can happen? Um, we are currently proceeding under the assumption that we would be following our standard process. Who's to say? Uh, but our, our approach right now is, is that we are following right. our standard so, process. So, so. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's hard. Yeah, I, know, exactly. I know, I know it's hard. So thank you for that. <laughs> my own, my, my my wonder is is just what would happen down the road, and we don't have a, a, a crystal ball. Just how the current changes would affect a project like this um, if they were decide to decide that they don't like our process. So I just, and I know you don't maybe don't have that answer right now, but it may be later on. Maybe that's something that could be answered of what could happen if, if we do this process and, and the province doesn't like it and then they enforce their mighty hammer and will on us? And well, maybe, Kelly, you have an answer now, but I would, this is more yeah, than no, I was I think that is a, that's say. something for the future, but Kelly, <laughs> right. if you uh, want to speak to it, you're, you have some good knowledge of this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just would say that that's all speculation at this point. We assume that our regular process will be followed through good. with the policies that are in place and, and refined for the future growth node. So okay. We, yeah. Well, with that, thank you. And, and with that, I agree with Councillor Austin's comments. When, when you look at it from a, a aerial view, it, it does feel like it's almost like a compound with, with residents. So I hope that as we dig deeper, we can kind of look at more integration. So I won't talk too much about that, but I'll uh, just say this is a good start. Thank you. Just on that point, uh, Kelly, I think it's fair to say that w we're in a new world. We don't know exactly what the future holds, but this developer has bought this to us and is working with our staff I think on the assumption that we will work on this together and bring it to council. That would be my sense. Um, not knowing the future, we just can't say for certain. Absolutely agree. We've had very positive conversations with the developer and uh, yeah, it's, it's been working through this process that, that we understand and know. Yes. Who's the owner? Yeah. Councilor Morris. Thank you. Just curious, um, a question about the economic viability of the project, because th this sounds like a slightly different thing than what we've been doing before, where we've been putting residential development um, around sort of a defunct mall, but this is going to be a working mall, a functioning mall. Um, so where's the parking going to be? Because the whole economic model was built on drawing from a wide area and having a lot of people come to park there, and now we're going to be putting housing there. So how, how is that going to be blended? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the proposal does include, as it stands right now, and again, it will be going through that planning process to be further refined, uh, but the proposal as it stands does include underground parking in the, um, the developments. Uh, I believe there's four different access points, um, but again, that would be a level of detail that would come up sort of further down the process. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, 
you know, it's important, I think, just remember that we're initiating a master planning process. So the application in front of us isn't binary. Here's what we're proposing. Let us do it. Uh, and, you know, if you think about the history of this already, Penhorn we started before the center plan was finished and uh, province took it over. Uh, I'm not sure if Southdale, Mount Hope area was uh, classified as a future growth node uh, or what we're finding present growth nodes in all of these, uh, but province took that one over. West End uh, Mall, for example, the Halifax Shopping Center Annex, that is coming under, that we started, initi we initiated that master planning process about a year or so ago, if I recall. Um, under center plan, province hasn't touched it. My suspicion is that the ones that require our staff to do a tremendous amount of work and require Halifax water and park planners and all the rest of it to, to lay out the street network and you know West End Mall Annex, that was a different kind of beast because uh, over time everything will be gone in phases, whereas this one, there's a chunk that's remaining and you're building around it. What happens to the chunk in the middle at some point in the future is yet to be determined. Um, but you know, I my feeling is that the province, because this requires so much work from us, is just gonna let us continue to do it until such time as they think we're not doing a great job and then they'll try to take it over and they get credit for it. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm happy to see this move forward. I think this is exciting. This is incredibly exciting to see stuff like this where we have essentially now uh, ginormous uh, asphalt uh, car storage that is turning into homes. Uh, we should all be applauding this. Uh, and so I'm, I'm happy to see this move forward. I'm also happy to see the uh, Halifax Shopping Center annex come back to us before this one does because that was started a year earlier. So hopefully uh, you know, we can learn a lot from each of these as they move forward, but I'm excited. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, no shortage of applauding this. This is the right spot for growth and density, uh, for sure, in Dartmouth. That's why it was identified. Um, and when I think back to Penhorn, right, the earlier drafts of Penhorn, um, it weren't, they weren't, they differed from the final one there too, and it improved markedly along the way, and I expect the same will happen with this one, and we'll get a good result at the end of it. So uh, as we embark on that, I did want to just comment on the future growth node piece. So in Dartmouth, the future growth nodes in the center plan, you've got Penhorn, uh, Micmac Mall, Dartmouth Cove, Shannon, Par Shannon Park, and Southdale. Of those five, three of them, we had done extensive work on. Um, Dartmouth Cove, we had partnered with the province, then developed Nova Scotia, did a plan for that. Shannon Park, which my colleague to, to the left of me here knows all about, um, the work with the, fed, the, the federal government was doing there. And then of course at Penhorn, where we initiated planning at Penhorn, uh, back before the property owner was even ready to be, to even contemplate doing anything. We did our process there because we said, you know what, this is a good spot. The two in Dartmouth that really haven't had any thought, it's Micmac Mall and it was Southdale. And you know, when it comes to the province and uh, Penhorn, as far as I'm concerned, they snatched the baton right there at the finish line. Uh, that thing was basically done. Thank you. I agree with that. I just want to say, as somebody that, that grew up looking at Micmac Mall as it was being built, and since it was built, I think this is exciting. And uh, um, you know, we, we, this is something that we've envisioned for growth for some time. Councillor Cleary is quite correct. This will be a great improvement. I think it's gonna be a really phenomenal thing. And I gotta say, the investments that the owner have so far made in Micmac Mall, which was everything to us as kids, ha has been great. I walked through Micmac Mall the other day and even talked to Woody. I didn't talk to Woody. I saw the kids talk to Woody. Uh, but it, it, felt like, it, it felt like the glory days of Micmac Mall, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure that there'll be some really good stuff that comes out of this development uh, around it. So uh, pleased to see it. Lots of work left on behalf of everybody. Ready for the question, colleagues? Like I really didn't talk to Woody. It was other kids that were talking to Woody. No inside information. That's uh, carried. Thank you, uh, Councillor, Deputy Mayor. Uh, colleagues, um, 1518 COVID-19 transit funding. Councillor Mason. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council, oops, that's the wrong one. Uh, I move that Halifax Regional Council one, agree to the terms and conditions per the letter of the Provincial Minister of Public Works and attachment one of the staff report dated December 6, 2022 by authorizing the mayor and municipal clerk to sign the attached letter to receive $8,655,876 in funding from the Government of Canada and Province of Nova Scotia related to COVID-19 impacts on transit services. And two, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to allocate funding to Halifax Transit as a, a re revenue recovery to cost center R631. Second by Councillor Cleary, Councillor Mason. I, I've struggled with whether I would say anything at this point, but I just, I just can't <laughs> not say it. And everybody around here knows what I'm going to say and I'm going to talk about. Like, God bless our provincial colleagues. But, uh, you know, when you look in the staff report uh, on page two, it, it summarizes what's been requested in the letter from the province and it says, that uh, the province of Nova Scotia to address, work with the province of Nova Scotia to address barriers and increased housing supply and density, which could include further progress on A, reforming zoning and land use policies, enable, B, enabling and supporting construction of new housing and more density and proximity to new public transit projects, C, reforming municipal development charges or equivalent for new builds, and D, speeding up approval processes through innovative tools such as digital permitting systems. So, I mean, the first order question is, why is this in a transportation funding thing where the money, I believe, unless I'm mistaken, is coming 100% from the federal government anyway? Like 100% from the federal government. It's just a pass through through the province. We've been waiting for it for the entire fiscal year. It's finally here. Great, thank you for that. Thank you for letting us have the money from Ottawa. We appreciate it. But the question you gotta ask is, what, what, what are these, why, why, what are these? Like, why are these even here? Uh, it's hard to put a sentence together because I'm just so speechless. So, you know, reforming zoning and land use policies, we should sit down and have a conversation, right? Ministers should come in and have a chat with us and we should, you know, we can go have a beer at the old triangle and sit in a snug and we can have these conversations, right? But what does that mean? That doesn't actually really mean anything without context. Uh, we, uh, you know, we just talked about in the previous item how we have reformed our zoning policies and practices which enabled Micmac Mall and Penhorn Mall and Halifax West End Mall to be future growth nodes that I think combined that's four or five thousand units worth of development, just those. So we know that we need to continue to do that which is why we're working on the regional plan and the suburban plan and the bus rapid transit corridor interim plan. Uh, B, enabling and supporting construction of new housing, more density uh, on public transit projects. That We're working on that. That should be coming back in the new year. Uh, I'm going to skip to D because I want to come back to C. Speeding up approval processes through innovative tools such as digital permitting systems like Posse, right? Like the system that we just rolled out phase three of that you've been doing for 18 months. That's done. So thanks for that. But the C, reforming municipal development charges or equivalent for new builds. That's the one that killed me because there's been a lot of speculation around here that a lot of what the provincial government is doing is cutting and pasting from Doug Ford's government in Ontario. And we don't have a comprehensive development charge thing. Like just for the public in the, out there in the world to know, in some cities and towns in Ontario, it's 60 to $80,000 per unit that's charged upfront for future capital costs. And in Nova Scotia and Halifax, you know, we have development fees and we have those things, but the only development charges that I'm aware of outside of some development agreement settings perhaps is uh, Halifax Water, which council doesn't control, right? Which is controlled by the Utility Review Board. And that is a whole other conversation when it comes to the province right now. So I, I, I'm just gonna stop there and just say, I want to work with the province of Nova Scotia. I do, but this is ridiculous and dumb. And I just can't accept that this is there. I'm tempted to vote against it, except why bother? I don't think that it's, I don't think that this is binding in any meaningful way and you know the federal government wants us to have that money so I'm going to vote yes but I just wanted to go on the record and say those things. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Okay. Did I miss anything? Was there a question though? Uh, no. No. Okay. Just stay there though Jerry. Um, good to have you. Um, Councillor Cleary. I feel like for Councillor Mason I need the Star Wars gif. Uh, it's a trap. <laughs> You fell into their trap. You mentioned all the stuff they asked for. That's what they were looking for. They're looking for people to go, oh, the province asked for these things and let's write about these things so it'll appear online and stuff in newspapers. Uh, we're, I mean, it's performative. We're already doing all these things. In fact, they could have just said, do all the stuff you're doing. Take the money, do all the stuff you're doing. Because we're already doing all this stuff. So I, I don't think it matters very much. I'm voting for it because we're already doing all these things. And who cares who gets credit for it and who cares who writes the headlines about it? All I care is that we got the money. There you go. Pr federal money. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I mean, this. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was funny to realize um, that this is federal money because uh, you wouldn't know it from all the press releases and the uh, the performance that was uh, that happened a week or two ago when this was first announced for different municipalities. That this was basically a flow through that wasn't being matched in any way by our provincial government. Um, the the piece, and I, I do have a question on it because my initial reaction was exactly Councillor Mason's of being oh. Oh my goodness, I can't believe that they'd be so petty to insert this in here. Um, my question is, because uh, as I've kind of been poking around a little bit on it, um, is this really coming from our provincial government or is this more, because I understand that the feds are actually requiring a connection between transit and housing. Um, in in the in in this funding. So um, if you're our <laughs> basically what I'm fishing for is this has this rolled down to us from that, or has it been inserted by our provincial government along the way? Jerry, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor Jerry Blackwood, CFO. So you know just a couple of things on that the money. Uh, is a flow through from the federal government through to the province. Um, I will say this, I agree with Councillor Mason, this is a bit of a convoluted um, funding application for straight up transit recovery because they incorporated the element of, of housing. Um, the province in terms of, uh, of getting approved for this application, okay, so the federal government did approve it and they uh, accepted the uh, funding that the province is putting towards housing uh, that they put forward in the budget. And the terms and conditions that were in, uh, that were put to us by the province were put to um, uh, the province by the federal government in terms of a term sheet. So it, it was basically, you know, what, what the federal government put forward to the province, the province put for us. We're doing all those things. Uh, so that's how, how we're gonna get our money. But it's, it's weird because when you look at the funding announcement, uh, it does uh, provide a bit of an expectation that we're gonna get matching funding, but the element of housing was in there. And, and, and that's why we're not getting straight up matching funding on that. So, okay, <laughs> there's a lot there. Um, so the feds, uh, they announced this fund. They say you need to have, uh, needs, we want results on housing provinces. You need to put up housing money. So the province told the feds, you know, here's the money we're putting into housing already. Will you count that? And the feds said yes. And so then this rolls down to us with these conditions. Did I follow that correctly? That's correct. So the province's application was accepted by the federal government, right? So it had to go through the federal government criteria and the application included their contributions uh, uh, towards housing in terms of funding, which, which exceeded the, uh, the funding for uh, the province of Nova Scotia. So that, that's why we're not getting straight up matching dollars that we would get uh, on other, uh, other types of applications. Okay, uh, well, thank you for the info on it. I mean, I, I, I get that the province had to, you know, there, there's some complexity here on the federal provincial relationship, but I mean, some of these things are awfully specific. Um, and you know, the one that uh, gives me the most pause is this reform development charge, because when, um, Conservative governments elsewhere have talked about reforming development charges. Um, they, they mean getting rid of them. Um, and of course, our budgets are stretched. If we get forced on that one, or well, even when the minister was in here, he was referring to density bonusing as a tax, when that's actually money that then goes out to nonprofits that actually are creating the housing for the most for the most uh, needed in our community. So uh, you know, I, I do have some concerns about some of some of the tone in this, but. Uh, I think ultimately Councillor Cleary is kind of right. Um, it's, there's nothing so binding, and if they're going to do something to us, they're going to do it to us anyway. So <laughs> anyway, take the money. Councillor Smith. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Austin pretty much summed up uh, a lot of what I wanted to say. I just, two things that I want to, one, I want to get a clarification, Jerry. 
related to the federal government passing down what they want to do with housing and, and then the provincial government putting that on us, that sounds really off to me and I don't, I'm not saying that that's not what happened. It just, you know, just being in Ottawa last week in, in uh, a meeting with the MPs, a lot of what's in here is stuff that we were hearing from the conservative federal leadership, not the, the liberal uh, government um, related to housing. So even the points in the letter from the province don't seem to match up with what the federal um, government is asking for related to housing. So it, but it does match up very clearly with what the conservative government was sharing with us at FCM. So I don't know, uh, and again, I'm not saying you're wrong, it just doesn't feel like it's actually aligning with what the government, current government is, is saying and what the, the opposition government is saying. So I, I don't know, maybe it might be worth getting council, uh, if it's possible, just a memo on that aspect, because it, it does seem a little off to me if in, if the federal government put that in the province and the province is putting that on us. Uh, just, again, being in Ottawa last week, this was not part of any of the conversations I heard with the current government. Um, the, the, the other, the question that I have is, when you read the report, it pretty clearly highlights that this is the government of Canada and provincial and province of Nova Scotia uh, project. When we know that it flew, flowed through the pr province from the federal government, and maybe this is nitpicking and maybe this is me being petty, but I, I feel like we should remove the ands in the report because it's not federal government and province of Nova Scotia. It's for, for federal government um, through province of Nova Scotia. Like they're not, they're not contributing. And again, I'm nitpicking here, but I don't, it, it reads if we pass this as if the province, we are now kind of giving the stamp of approval that the province actually contributed to it in the way that it's written, which is not really the case. So I don't know if it's not if, the case at all. Yeah. Sure. So I, to me, I feel like we need to change that in the motion, if to make it factual. Um, the, but also, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being a little uh, petty as well. Yeah. Um, thank you, Councillor. So, just just two things, right? The first part of your question is on those terms and conditions. There was a term sheet by the federal government that was put to the province right, as part of the funding application. So the terms and conditions in that term sheet is what the province then put to us in the letter, right? Can, we, can that yeah. be shared with council? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. The second, second part of your question about, you know, whether the, the, the province is a contributor, all I can say there is that the application was submitted to the federal government by the province of Nova Scotia. The federal government evaluated the province's submission based on their contributions to housing that were part of the funding application process. The federal government approved that application. We uh, are gonna get the, the $8.6 million because of that. Okay, um, so we, we didn't have any, any role in applying for this money. Initially, the application went uh, went from the provincial government to the federal government. Okay, right, and now we are agreeing to those. Basically, we're agreeing to the same term sheet that the province did. Okay. All right, that's that's it for me. I'll come back if I need to, but I think I'm I'm good on that piece. No, no, not the question yet. Um, you know, the number of things that I don't know would would choke a horse. I know this fund as well as anybody in the country because it is the big city mayors who campaigned for this money for transit shortfalls. The city of Toronto alone um, was losing, I think, in the range of six to eight hundred million dollars a year on their transit uh, revenue, all the different transit. <clears throat> the press release that was issued on February 17th by the Department of Finance Canada says to increase the impact of this investment, funding would be conditional on provincial and territorial governments matching this federal contribution. Now, they may have made a deal with Nova Scotia, I'm sure they did, but this was to be matched, and in some cases, provinces exceeded what the federal government put in. In Ontario, for example, they exceeded what the federal government put in, and I think in Ontario it was 300 some million dollars, which the provincial government uh, exceeded um, just before an election campaign. Uh, but this fund, when it came, came out, 
and you know, I've talked to you about this in audit and finance meetings all the way through, we're asking where's our money, where's our money, because it has consistently offset the deficit we have for this year, so I'm particularly interested. But this isn't right, this isn't a housing fund. So the federal government to do it said, we will put money into transit, conditional upon the provinces, and I think it said collaborating with municipalities, and you, you, I'd have to look up collaboration again, in terms of housing. So the, but the provincial government, uh, put together a list that said we've done these things on housing, but what gets lost in this is that it's transit money, and it was supposed to be matched, and it wasn't. And you know, I, you can argue that till the cows come home. In my view, that press release says it all. Um, and so, Councillor Smith is right that the provincial government didn't put any money into this. I don't think it's in the recommendations, so I can't see us changing this, but when I saw the report, you may recall I brought this to your attention. I said, that's incorrect. But, you know, we're gonna take the money, um, we're gonna learn, uh, learn from this, but I wouldn't want people to think that, you know, that we're, that we're entirely happy with it. You know, the relationship we have with the province is important to us, it needs to be strong, it needs to be better than it is. I and lots of others are working on that. But this fund, um, this is entirely federal, money that flowed through the provincial government. Um, it's, a, it's a federal fund, and it would have been nice if we had got the match. It would have meant a lot to us here in, uh, in Halifax. So um, it's a little bit disappointing, but on we go, and life gets better as you keep going. Councillor Smith. You just, uh, Mr. Mayor, you just made me think of, of something. What is the risk of us, well, two, what, uh, two. one, uh, what is the risk of us um, asking for further information before we approve it today. And two, on the point that the mayor made, if we were to uh, contact the federal government to say, just to get clarification on this fund, is this supposed to be matched? But uh, does that help our case at all, or maybe not? I, just I think that the federal government and the province have come to an agreement on this through that letter that they've come up with. And so I think from that point of view, um, that unfortunately okay so that's uh, is is, okay yeah. so there's no all right, I was just wondering if there was room for us to kind of make sure that we're yep. but I, I take it all back and call for there's the a risk to us not taking the money yes uh, which I think is all apparent to all of us so yep. we, we, we thank those who provided it yep. and you learn your lesson and and uh, as Councillor Cleary said we take the money all right call for the question ready for the question colleagues there's no risk man. <laughs> okay, that motion is carried. Colleagues, thank you. Uh, 1519, amendments to the Beaverbank Hammonds Plains Upper Sackville Municipal Planning Strategy and Land Use Bylaw for Carriage Wood Estates. We will go to the Queen of the Bunker in Beaverbank. Councillor Blackburn. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I will uh, move the motion, move that Halifax Regional Council give first reading to consider the proposed amendments to the Municipal Planning Strategy and Land Use Bylaw for Beaverbank, Hammonds Plains and Upper Sackville as set out in attachments A and B of the staff report dated December 7th, 2022 respectively to enable smaller residential lots for, proposed, for a proposed subdivision called Carriage Wood Estates off Daisy Drive in Beaverbank and schedule a public hearing, I so move. Second. Second by the uh, Councillor uh, Lovelace. Yes, Councillor thank you. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, you uh, may be thinking, hey, haven't I seen this before? Or this looks familiar. So uh, this, uh, this came to us before as uh, a uh, proposal to uh, shrink the lot sizes from uh, 60 feet uh, frontage to 40 feet frontage uh, for the uh, entire Beaverbank, Hammonds Plains and Upper Sackville uh, planning area. Uh, that uh, that got, uh, got a resounding thumbs down from uh, the, uh, the community and uh, the uh, developer has since come back with uh, a second proposal and uh, this would just uh, impact the um, the, the lots that are in Carriagewood uh, carriage Estates. Um, this won't add any new housing other than what is uh, proposed. This, uh, in the, uh, the words of the developer, will just make the, uh, the housing that is built there more affordable with the, uh, the smaller lots. And uh, so uh, just uh, looking for uh, support to uh, give this a first reading and take it to uh, the community for a public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. 
motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Um, item 15.1.10 has passed on consent. That was the amendments to Planning District 4, MPS and Land Use Bylaw for Goodwood. 15.111, regulation of short-term rentals. Councillor Smith. Put the motion on the floor. Um, that Halifax Regional Council, one, give first reading to consider proposed amendments to the Regional uh, Municipal Planning Strategy, Regional Plan, Secondary Municipal Planning Strategy, SMPS, and all in use bylaws LUB, as said on attachment A, B, and C, staff report dated September, December 7, 2022, to establish consistent region wide policies and regulations for short term, short -term rentals and schedule a public hearing. And two, direct the Chief Administrative Officer CAO to prepare a staff report that explores approaching to tourist accommodations in rural parts of municipality that are outside of the urban service area boundary. Second. Second, Councillor Mason. Councillor Smith. So I'm assuming, because I don't see any staff in the front getting, uh, scrambling for a presentation. Sorry, hang on. I think we do have a presentation. There is a presentation. Yes. Okay, you were we so do. content Sorry. in your chairs, it looked like. All right. Uh, Let's go with that. Yeah, so I, I will wait for the presentation. Thank you, Councillor Smith. <laughs> I thought there was, but they were very comfortable. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Uh, good day, uh, Mayor and Councillors. Uh, my name is Jill McClellan. I'm a principal planner with the uh, planning and development, uh, with planning and development. And I'm here with my uh, colleague, Brandon Umferville. And we're here to discuss the proposed amendments to our land use uh, bylaws and policy documents regarding short-term rentals. So short-term rentals are considered temporary overnight accommodations rented out by property owners or tenants, typically for a few nights or, or a week. Uh, Short-term rentals have gained popularity as an accommodation choice in recent years. This is largely based on online platforms such as Airbnb, Verbo, or HomeAway. While our land use bylaws and planning documents do not reference short-term rentals, we do have existing policies and regulations that do allow for several types of accommodations related to the short-term rental market. So that would include hotels, motels, bed and breakfasts, and tourist accommodations, and some forms of boarders and lodgers. Short-term rentals are distinguished from hotels or motels, as they're generally located within a dwelling unit or somebody's home. Um, our latest analysis of data took place this fall, um, and this showed that there were approximately 2,007 active short-term uh, rental listings across HRM. This was during the month of August. As you can see, there has been rapid growth in uh, the reopening of short-term rentals since the pandemic. Um, the green line on this chart shows the total amount of short-term rentals, whereas the orange line shows whole home short-term rentals, and the yellow line is uh, the availability of bedrooms as short-term rentals. So those are bedrooms within a home. Um, analysis of the data shows there were nearly 39,000 reservation days in August of 2022, indicating an average short-term rental listing in HRM was uh, about 19.2 days in the last month. So in terms of the background of, uh, of this report that's being presented today, um, this, the idea to explore short-term rentals was first brought to uh, staff's attention through the Community Planning Economic Development Standing Committee in May 2019, where we received direction at that time to uh, consider the development of a regulating bylaw for short-term rentals. Um, as part of this motion, we were asked to do a jurisdictional scan to understand what other jurisdictions, how they regulate short-term rentals, and if they do. Um, we were also asked to do a resident survey to gather public opinion regarding short-term rentals and also to do engagement with the short-term rental uh, uh, industry. So that included hosts, uh, the tourism industry, hotel industry. Um, at, um, based on that motion, staff did that work and we returned to council in September of 2020. Um, and at that meeting, a motion was passed where we were asked to make necessary amendments to the regional plan, our secondary municipal planning strategies, our land use bylaws, to introduce uh, region-wide policies, definitions, and regulations for short-term rentals. Uh, we were also asked to develop uh, registration requirements for short-term rentals, and also engage with the community and industry on, regarding the proposed approach. Additionally, we were also asked to write letters to the province to request amendments to the Marketing Levy Act in regards to short-term rentals. 
as part of this policy di uh, direction from council in 2020, we were um, tasked with looking at requiring all short-term rentals to register with the municipality. So this would include those that were located in your primary residence and those that were considered commercial rent uh, short-term rentals that were located in a uh, income property. We were also asked to look at only allowing uh, within residential zones only allowing short-term rentals within the host primary residence. And then we were additionally um, asked to look at allowing more commercial type short-term rentals in areas where there was mixed use zoning or commercial zoning where other types of tourist accommodations were already permitted. And then looking, we were also additionally tasked with looking at modifying uh, provisions for short-term rentals in rural areas as well. So, when comparing this policy approach through a recent jurisdictional scan, Halifax would be considered on the more permissive side of short-term rental regulations when you look at other regulations uh, from other jurisdictions. Uh, this is mainly attributed to still allowing short-term rentals in commercial zones or mixed-use zones and not including the caps on the nights per year or the caps on the number of bedrooms that could be let out. And I'm going to hand it over to Brandon to uh, continue. Thanks, Jill. Like she mentioned, we were instructed to engage with community and uh, stakeholders on the proposed regulations uh, in that, with that policy direction that you approved in 2020. So we published a survey and held stakeholder meetings uh, with the industry in the province, like I said. And the survey, the public survey ran through November 2020 to January 2021 and was focused on those four council directions, the registration, primary residence requirement, residential areas, allowing the commercial short-term rentals, and uh, the modified approach for rural areas. And like our first short-term rental survey, it was one of the most well-participated surveys that Planning and Development has published with over 4,000 responses. Uh, as you'll see in the chart on this slide, just over two-thirds of responses agreed with the primary residence approach, with the largest share of respondents strongly agreeing with this approach for residential areas. Overall, in our analysis of the survey responses, we found that approximately 80% of responses were critical of short-term rentals in some way and supported uh, regulation efforts for this. A strong majority or 79% of responses agreed with the 2019 ranking of project priorities. You see them here up on the screen. Uh, the top one being the su protecting the supply of traditional long-term rentals as the most important consideration. Other top considerations include protecting the integrity of residential neighborhoods, collecting appropriate taxes, requiring minimum standards, and collecting host information. On our approach to regulation, for short-term rentals in commercial areas, there was a more mixed response with 44% agreeing with allowing short-term rentals as we do other tourist accommodations, uh, as you'll see in the, the, oh, sorry, that chart's about the project priorities, but um, in, this, in the commercial sector, I think it's important to note that three quarters of responses express concern about uh, the conversion of dedicated multi-unit residential buildings to short-term rental uses, um, as well, Approximately three quarters of responses support a modified approach for rural areas that's a little more nuanced in the approach in considering those uh, areas. And then, like I said, the survey saw a high level of response showing a strong interest by the community in this topic. We saw about 77% uh, of people have used short-term rentals in the past and had nearly 600 responses from people who said they ha are hosts of short-term rentals or were hosts in the past. I'm sorry. And so one of the common themes in the feedback from short-term rental hosts was the importance of uh, short-term rentals in providing additional income and offsetting home ownership costs, I think, among the hosts. And based on recent f feedback, staff spoke with some, uh, you know, experts on, or with CMHC and her, have heard that though short-term rentals do offset income, they, uh, most mortgages, our mortgages can't consider short-term rental income as uh, rental income when, when determining income for a mortgage. So next I'll move on to the stakeholder meetings. Uh, staff also spent time going over the council direction and proposed regulation approach with stakeholders. In January and February of this year, we met with the Halifax Partnership, Tourism Nova Scotia, and Discover Halifax. We also met with some individuals uh, who had sought out staff for a meeting, including a retired tourism expert and a Canada Select representative. As well, um, like I said, at all of these meetings, we were, we were presented HRM's proposed approach and then had discussions and received feedback about that. At our meeting with the partnership, we discussed how the use will be regulated through our land use bylaws and uh, how that, the zoning will apply. 
Uh, the group also raised the importance of preventing whole building conversions. And the partnership also raised concern that a balanced approach is necessary to remain competitive among other tourism markets. With Tourism Nova Scotia, their team raised the importance of not introducing redundancy between the municipal system and the provincial regulation or registration process. They also mentioned uh, the idea that not all short-term rentals will return to the long-term market. Uh, and staff discussed our approach to outline how we're trying to target uh, more of those uh, units that will. And Tourism Nova Scotia also outlined the, the growth in this form of accommodation that they're seeing within their studies. Staff also met with Discover Halifax in early February and discussed the importance of finding the balance between the needs of the tourism market while reducing the impact on the housing market. Uh, their team mentioned a community of first approach in which one of their goals is to maximize the economic and social benefits of tourism. Uh, there was support in these discussions for our approach and, and Discover Halif Halifax noted that there's a need for this type of accommodation in Halifax generally and coming out of the pandemic and there's a reliance on short-term rentals to meet some of this need. But again, uh, in careful balance with reducing the impact on the housing market. And through all these meetings, a recurring theme was the idea that a strong long-term housing market that adequately, adequately supports local residents is an important part of what makes a thriving community and ultimately a strong tourism attraction. Staff also met with residents of a Dartmouth neighborhood who expressed or experienced a traumatic event in a short-term rental. And this meeting highlighted the importance of a regulatory framework to ensure safety and compliance. There was also support for a primary residence requirement at the, in the discussions at this meeting. So next, uh, I'd like to outline some recent changes to the provincial legislation related to short-term rentals as they have an impact on the policy direction we're proposing. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about the Tourist Accommodation Registration Act, or TERRA, as it has the biggest impact at this time. In March of 2019, the uh, provincial government passed amendments to TERRA to modernize the legislation and support tourism growth. The changes include an updated definition of short-term rental and a requirement for commercial short-term rentals to register with the province through an online system at that time. Uh, over the past several years, there have been additional changes to Terra, including the delaying, delaying the registration fee and requiring the short-term rental listings to include a valid registration number with their uh, listing, whether located in, uh, sorry, and requiring all platforms to share records with the province if requested, whether they're located in a primary residence or not. Uh, many of these amendments will not come into effect until April 2023 to allow operators and platforms some time to come into compliance. And one of the feedback, pieces of feedback we heard from industry was the need to ensure that the processes are straightforward and not overly burdensome. So staff met, have met with the province to understand their registration process and ensure that it'll work with our proposed approach. At this point, we feel the provincial registration system will satisfy our need for a registration requirement. The province has also ensured us that data collected through that system uh, from hosts will be shared with municipalities to facilitate compliance and uh, with local bylaws. Some of the changes sought to the Marketing Levy Act are outlined um, in more detail in the staff report. So as Jill mentioned, our proposed approach at this point is to make the region-wide amendments to limit short-term rentals, uh, including the primary residence requirement in residential areas, uh, as well as the broader short-term rental permissions in areas where commercial accommodations are already permitted. In drafting this approach and the amendments um, based on discussion around the 2020 report, we know that there are additional factors to consider for short-term rentals in the rural areas. And the, like I said, the approach that the, we're recommending at this point is to make the region-wide amendments and then do more detailed work in the future like you've seen in the motion. Uh, a couple, um, sorry, a bit on the rural approach. We feel that uh, the, the region-wide approach that was proposed, for con was proposed for consistency and to immediately address uh, the negative housing impacts. And it might not be detailed enough for our rural areas. Further considerations we plan to examine are related to the seasonal use of properties as well as inconsistent zoning approaches in between our urban and rural areas in which tourist accommodations are permitted more permissively. Uh, as well, future work will look at environmental impacts of short-term rentals, uh, which are considered commercial uses and may not have been fully considered on sensitive ecological areas in our rural parts of the municipality. Uh, we also plan to consider the use of temporary structures, which is a growing inquiry we're getting at planning and development to the use of structures like tents and yurts on properties uh, for short-term rentals. So we plan to look at that in more detail. So in our 
a couple of the other considerations are important compliance in the municipalities work on the rental registry in our jurisdictional scan and based on the large community response, we know that compliance is an important piece of this project. In the past, the lack of clarity about the use made enforcement very challenging. And these new clear rules and registration data from the province provide a much more uh, efficient enforcement path. Our plan is to monitor the rollout of these amendments and the compliance program to assess if any additional tools are needed in the future. The development of, of our own rental registry will require the registration of all uh, rentals, uh, long and short term, uh, in the municipality to ensure minimum standards are met. Uh, the difference is that the, the municipal registry is proposed as a one-time registration and the province, provincial registry is an annual renewal that needs to take place for a short-term rental. So now into the proposed amendments. The first, uh, I'll walk over that in uh, the next couple slides, but the first big one is the introducing consistent terminology uh, across all of our bylaws, which will define sh the short-term rental use so it can be re uh, regulated much more effectively. Uh, we define short-term rental as a dwelling unit or part thereof that is used mainly for the reception of the traveling public or vacationing public and is provided as temporary accommodation for compensation for a period of 28 days or less. We're also introducing a short-term bedroom rental definition. That means a short-term rental where individual bedrooms within a dwelling unit are rented to separate parties or groups with or without meals. So short-term rental is the broader definition and will be used to enable the use in commercial areas and restrict it to primary residences in our residential areas. Short-term bedroom rental is a definition that we're adding to replace references to bed and breakfast uses. And a short-term bedroom rental is meant to describe uh, the short-term rental of individual bedrooms as opposed to the whole unit, which is common to bed and breakfast and lodging houses. Uh, the second definition and its replacement of bed and breakfast is being done based on discussions that we've had with our development officers as we determined this broader approach. We came to understand there, there are inconsistencies in the regulation of bed and breakfasts and need to be addressed to effectively regulate short-term rentals across the region. So as I alluded to in the definitions, we have three approaches in our amendments to regulate short-term rentals according to the policy direction for this project. The first is that we will limit whole home short-term rentals uh, and short-term bedroom rentals in residential areas by limiting them to the host's primary residence. In zones where tourist accommodations, such as hotels and motels are already permitted, we're updating the list of permitted uses to include short-term rentals without that primary residence requirement. Short-term rentals are a type of tourist accommodation and so in areas that are intended already to accommodate that use, we will permit them similarly. And we'll be monitoring this provision and its potential for the conversions of purpose-built residential buildings in our mixed-use zones and come back with additional provisions if necessary regarding that. Um, short-term bedroom rentals will also be permitted in zones that allow commercial short-term rentals. And the additional provisions that already existed for bed and breakfast, such as a three-bedroom limit in most areas, uh, minimum parking and signage requirements uh, will continue to apply to short-term bedroom rentals. So on to some of the related provisions we're proposing through the amendments. As you'll remember uh, from our recent shared housing discussions, there have been some recent approaches to uh, parking that have focused on reducing or removing parking requirements and kind of letting the market and individual property owners determine the parking that's required. However, in this project, we appreciate that many tourist or short-term rental users will require parking. And given that, the, the proposed amendments will require whole homes, short-term rentals to be subject to any parking, existing parking requirements that apply to a dwelling unit already. Short-term bedroom rentals will generally continue the bed and breakfast requirement of one parking space per guest, with the exception of the regional center that uh, recently introduced a maximum of one bedroom per short or per bed and breakfast, uh, per guest room, uh, sorry. We've taken this approach to parking as a, this project is mainly about regulating the short-term rental use and not necessarily encouraging it. Borders and lodgers will be removed from the land use bylaws and, and the updated approach to short-term rentals will accommodate this use. In some instances, borders and lodgers can also fit into some forms of shared housing. Finally, uh, in consultation with our development officers, we are exempting short-term rentals in a whole home in a host primary residence from the requirement to obtain a development permit. And this ensures that operators who are renting their whole home, uh, whole primary residence on a temporary basis can do so without having to come in for a permit. So someone who's renting their home for a week out of the year or something like that wouldn't need a development permit. 
Um, and then finally, I think our last slide is uh, the recommendation. So we look forward to any questions you have and thanks for your time. Okay, thank you for that report. Appreciate that very much. We're gonna load uh, Councillor Smith up to five minutes and let him uh, uh, take the floor. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, uh, and thank you, uh, crew, for all your work on, on this. I can't remember when I first asked for this report. It feels like it was so long ago, but to get to hear uh, where, we're, where we're at today, I think is um, not only from the hard work from the staff involved, but also many of the residents who, who brought forward, including neighborhoods speak up, our neighbors speak up in, in the Hydrostone area who, who really advocated for us to look at registration. So, you know, thank you to them. Um, but also the stakeholders. I know I've had multiple meetings. I know I've been, we've been in meetings with even folks who were interested in just seeing what we were doing uh, around this. So a lot of work has gone to, to get where we are today. So, you know, thank everyone for that. And, and I'll also say too, uh, I don't know if this is a, a good thing or a bad thing, that two of the reports that we had today were motions that I put forward uh, that mentioned uh, that we had the most turnout. So either I know how to get people really worked up or uh, I, I know what I'm doing. One of the, I don't know which one it is yet, I'll, I'll learn, I'll learn. <laughs> maybe it's both, maybe it's both. Um, all that to say is again, it's, it's really not, not because of, of council, it's really the, the work that staff do and the neighbors who've been, who've been very vocal on this. So again, thank you. So, so the, 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 the couple points I wanna make and then questions I have is um, one related to the data. So when we first started this, the biggest problem we had was data because it was very difficult to get. One, uh, many of the operators didn't want to provide that data to us for their own reasons. Uh, but thankfully we were, from what we have today, we were able to access that data. So I'm just wondering um, from where we went from initially to where we are today, just how were you able to compile that data and get it to a place where you could put it in reports? Um, also, the province under their regulations and under their, their act, they, they say 28 days and we've, we've also matched match that as well within our regulations. Um, when we look at the other types of accommodations that fall under the Tourist Registration Act for the province, it has apartments, condos, vacation home, bed and breakfasts, hotels, motels, inns, resorts. Um, rooms, suites, dorm style rooms, tourist rooms, et cetera, et cetera. Does this mean now, uh, and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't find it doing my research, maybe you might have this, this answer, but does this mean that short-term rentals would also fall under not just the registration, but also the business taxation aspect through the province? Because uh, I know before that was a concern with the industry uh, here with the hotel, hotel industry that short-term rentals weren't being taxed the same as hotel rooms. But I think now with this change and maybe for clarification that I, I believe that they'll be, in terms of the tax, be treated the same way. Uh, um, and the, the, the last question I have, and I'll, I'll, I know there might be some comments, so I'll follow up with, um, is, is just related to, and I think Councilor Mason has some comments on that, is just the, the um, suites, secondary suites. I know that is initially we were hoping to allow that in the secondary suites, so I'm just wondering why the, 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 the final recommendation was not to include secondary suites. Um, and with that, I, I probably have to comment on some things moving forward, seeing so many folks um, uh, buzzed in, but uh, I really just again thank you and any answers to those questions would be great to start. For sure. Um, so through the through the mayor to the councillor. So in regards to the data, so since this project has started, we've been able to get a contract with AirDNA, which has helped us kind of provide an approximate location as to where short-term rentals are throughout HRM. The real tool that's going to help us know exactly where they're located is when we have the provincial registry and when we're starting to require permits for some of the commercial or uh, short-term bedroom rental type of uh, short-term rentals. So that, that will be the real um, piece of information that you know is missing right now. We'll, we'll get to know exactly where they are and the, and the true number. So right now we're still working with our DNA data, but I will say that that data continues to improve as, as years go on as well. Um, in regards to how short-term rentals are assessed, uh, the province did update the Assessment Act in 2019 to ensure that short-term rentals, individual short-term rentals in a whole home would still be taxed as residential. 
Um, we continue to have conversations with the province to ensure that short-term rentals that are acting more like a business can, you know, so we can maybe consider a different type of taxation for them, but, but those conversations are ongoing. Um, and then in regards to the inclusion of secondary and backyard suites, when we brought secondary and backyard suites to council back in 2020 as well. Um, one, of, one of the things we were hoping to do through that is to provide more den gentle density and provide more rental options. So we've been fairly consistent with our approach in, in short-term rentals and insure, in seeing these as separate units and not necessarily wanting to include them into the short-term rental market, uh, just to ensure that we can still use those secondary and backyard suites for long-term rentals, because that was, that was a big reason for why we introduced them back in 2020 as well. Okay, thank you, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I got strong support for this. I really appreciate the work the staff's done. And uh, I would say to, I'm gonna do a bit of a, uh, of a history piece here for because about half of council's nuisances started. Uh, but uh, I would say this is a COVID casualty because many, as you can see from who's here, the staff who uh, did this report were the staff who were responding to all the rapid housing stuff that started coming out of Ottawa as, as we hit the kind of crisis that happened uh, in lockstep with COVID. Um, uh, it's a it's a delight to see just as an aside before I get into the meat of it the uh, the uh, old peninsula especially but the the definitions generally in HRM of uh, lodger and border have a real Victorian feel mm -hmm. like the widow is going to make you breakfast before you go work in the factory where you're living in the house you can can't afford without your income kind of vibe it's not modern at all so I'm really glad to see that happen but uh, Councillor Smith talked about uh, neighbors speak up in the north end who started flagging for us and just to give you a bit of context we had people from the Hydrostone neighborhood especially coming saying, we think half the houses on our street are Airbnbs now, right? There aren't kids in the yards, there aren't people who are helping to, you know, uh, clean up after a storm and that kind of thing. And that's when we got introduced to this uh, phrase, ghost hotels appearing in residential zones. And so in my case, there was one apartment unit uh, or apartment building in the area near the Sobeys on uh, Queen and uh, Queen Street Sobeys where uh, the 12 uh, apartments were uh, emptied, the people were evicted, and the entire building was turned into Airbnb. Uh, and, and I know of other cases in my district where houses were torn down and replaced with, in the uh, R2 zone, uh, two units plus a suite designed for Airbnb and not for people to live there. So we were losing housing to enable this uh, in a significant way. And I, I recognize, oh, and the other one that was fun was, I, uh, I just wrote Greenwood. Uh, there was, uh, luckily this house sold because houses are worth so much now, but there's a house on Greenwood right by St. Mary's and she rented using Airbnb and it was advertised as, I know you can't party in Loyola, so you should come over and rent my house and have a party at my house. And uh, you, can, you, can, you can imagine how the neighbors like that. So uh, anyway, uh, I know this will be a pain for tourism and I know this doesn't come up without impact on that side, but I think the housing crisis is acute when you just have to go by uh, you know, uh, any of the stuff we've been talking about, uh, the tents and the parks and all that. Uh, uh, this is a way to ensure that the residential stays uh, 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 available for rent for people who live here. Uh, the 2020 report, uh, though, did talk about secondary suites, and I worry people were building secondary suites under the assumption they would be able to rent them. So I, I, I'd like you to unpack a little more, because I have a motion to potentially ask for that uh, to, uh, for in a supplementary report, but Calgary, Edmonton, London, and Saskatoon, it says in, that, in, the, in the chart that you had up in the report, allow secondary uh, units on property. I assume that's on property where the primary resident lives. And I, I, I'm wondering if you could unpack that a little bit more about why other cities, you know, th those decisions. Because we know there's only a couple of hundred secondary seats that have been built in all of HRM so far. But I see them, the other part of a secondary suite was to aid in affordability for people who are challenged to buy the house. And so I'm kind of trying to balance those two things. Uh, so, so anyway, I, I, I'm wondering if staff have any more insight into that. Any insight as to why they would have heard of them in other areas? Uh, through, through the mayor to the council, I didn't realize my mic was on. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, we'd, we'd have to take a closer look into those other jurisdictions to understand why why they would they may have uh, considered secondary backyard suites. But it was something that when we you know were do, doing some of our work, we were cautious about allowing that. Uh, opening that up just because, again, we want to provide more long-term rental opportunities and more 
housing stock for, so, for permanent residents. So, so the good news is all we heard was so that's oh, fine, okay, so great. it's good. And uh, I will make my motion then, and I know there's a more uh, fulsome motion coming from Councillor Cleary that, that uh, uh, we can debate and we may make this redundant, but I'm gonna put it on the floor anyway. Request a supplementary staff report so council may consider allowing short-term rental and secondary units on the same lot as residents' primary building. So I just sent that to the clerk and out to council by email. Um, so the intent of that would be not to stop first reading today or even second reading. It's, it would be similar to the rural report that's coming back. Let's, let's dig into it. Let's get the answers that you don't have today. Let's find out why other people allow that and let's see what the real impacts are and we can consider widening it later. But to me, the, the priority right now is there's hundreds if not thousands of units that we would see returned to the market over time if we pass this and I, I've got to support it. So uh, that's all I have on, my, on the main motion and on the amendment. I'd ask for council support on the amendment. Okay, so we're on the amendment. We'll get it printed up. People that want to speak on it, uh, on the amendment, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for putting that forward. Um, I know of folks who have specifically gone forward, um, you know, in this uh, very tourism destination of St. Margaret's Bay to create an opportunity um, to, to add funds uh, to their household income. So uh, my question is, though, if, if this is the case, then would we not need the provincial government to enable changes uh, to the way that we tax these properties? If these secondary units are actually being used as, for a commercial entity as a business um, in, in a residential area, um, then would this also be an ask to the province to be able to uh, create a new um, tax um, category uh, to, to recognize that these uh, buildings are being used for commercial purposes? Julian? the mayor to the councillor so uh, that that could be an ask to council or to to the province it wouldn't necessarily be a requirement if we were going to open up mm -hmm. um, the ability to allow secondary and backyard suites as a short-term rental mm -hmm. um, especially because right now in some of our you know more mixed use or commercial zones right. as the proposed amendments and as it currently stands now you could have a short-term rental in those areas and they would still be taxed as residential because it still is considered a residential property right. Right. Um, there's also too I'll just add um, there were recent amendments to the market Marketing Levy Act uh, by the province that will allow us to apply marketing the marketing levy to short-term rentals. So that's something we're likely going to come back to council at some point with uh, amendments to that as well. Right, but that would only be to short-term rentals that are registered. Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, yes, but under the province's new legislation, all short-term rentals are required to register. Are required yeah. to be registered. And so if, um, if, if someone did not register, let's say they were only renting it out for a month or something, and they didn't see the point in registering it, what, what is the outcome of that? Yeah, so through the mayor to the councillor, so even if you're only renting it out for a month a year or a month in 10 years, it is, if you're going to list it on any platform, you're gonna, you're gonna be required to have a registration number. And if you don't have that, then you won't be in compliance with the provincial, uh, uh, with Terra Act. Um, and then you'll be uh, subject to a fine um, and you'll have to remove your, uh, your uh, uh, listing from the platform. The province is also working with the platforms to require that registration number be included as okay. well too, so you can't actually list it without a registration number. So, so I, so I guess the question is, um, thinking about that, it looks great on paper, but there are new platforms that are popping up all over the place. Um, I don't know that they'd have any luck on Reddit uh, or Facebook Marketplace. So I, I, I think that uh, it's something that we should continuously be discussing uh, as to whether or not this would actually be possible um, and, and what that looks like. So thank, thank you for answering my questions. I appreciate that. Thank you. Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, I am in support of this amendment because I believe in the rural areas you'll probably see a lot more of these uh, secondary suites um, on, on the uh, primary property or the primary resident to have as a secondary um, income for the property. So I'm in support of that. In regards to the taxation issue, I think we would probably just treat it equally as, as a regular B&B. I believe there have been concessions in the past to, te uh, to tax them as a seasonal business instead of a full year tax rate. So just have to treat them as, as a regular B&B &B outlet, I assume. And I also just want to thank the province for bringing in their registration for Airbnb as well as the market levy flexibility to apply it across the board. So we have to give accolades to the province once in a while. So I'm a supportive amendment. 
Yeah, agree with that. I was at law amendments in support of that. Um, Councillor Purdy on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I was just wondering if I get clarification. Is, does this amendment mean all areas of HRM or the ones that we're considering today under the original motion? Julia? Um, so through the mayor to the councillor, um, I will let the councillor maybe clarify as to where the amendment will apply to, but the amendments being brought forward today, this applies to all of HRM. So my understanding is this amendment would apply to all HRM as well. And okay, I'm getting so, thumbs up, so. So I was under the understanding that this really deals m mostly with the urban center and then the outer skirts of HRM are gonna be looked at further down the road. Uh, through the mayor to the councillors, so the proposed amendments today will apply to all of HRM. A, a lot of what we're doing in this amendment package is kind of clarifying what existing um, land use rights are right now. So if you're in a zone that already allows for tourist accommodations, then we'll continue to allow for short-term rentals. Um, but we do want to go back and do a deeper dive into the rural areas just to identify some of the, the items that Brandon noted. So, you know, is a more broader zone appropriate? Uh, do we want to allow for temporary structures as short-term rentals as well? Um, yeah. Okay. No, I, I do support this uh, amendment. So thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? So we're on the amendment of Councillor Mason. You ready for the question? That's carried, thank you, Councillor Mason. Colleagues, we'll take a break now, we'll come back. Councillor Mancini will pick us up at 3.15.
Okay. Okay, guys. Have we got quorum? We're going to keep going. Uh, Councillor Cleary is here. I think he's. Uh, okay. Well, we can't. Mancini's up next, right? So, where was Tony? Oh, that's him there. Okay, folks. Before we resume, this is a very um, auspicious occasion that should be recognized. Simon Ross Siegel, Simon, our clerk here, has been successful in another job at HRM, and uh, this will be his last council meeting. So thank you very much for your dedication to council and best of luck with everything else that you do. So. He's gonna to go to work. He's gonna to go to work at Access and Privacy, so they won't be applauding next time you hear from him, uh, I can tell you. So, uh, I wish I had a gift or something uh, for you. Uh, take that stick that's resting rest there. Take that mace with you. You can uh, bring it home to your family. Well done. Thank you for your service. Councillor Mancini, we are on short-term rentals. We have amended the motion with Councillor Mason's motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so uh, thank you both for the work on this file. Uh, it's a big file and I really, really appreciate it. Just a little uh, clarification, then a couple of questions. When you were speaking to uh, Councillor Lovelace, you were, re were referring to the registry uh, that the province is doing. So to be, cl to be clear, that means uh, a business that wants to be a short-term rental, uh, if they're Airbnb or Verbo, whatever they may be, a uh, home away, uh, before they can advertise that property, they have to be registered and have a registered number. Is that, is that correct? Okay. So that leads into my next questions about enforcement. So, um, you know, I know in some cities they have enforcement that's more proactive uh, versus the way we do enforcement here. Like Vancouver actually has a team that goes out and uh, uh, investigates and looks for these properties. So what's that? And so my first question is, what's that look like here? Are we still complaint driven? Uh, can our current enforcement team that has a lot to do and handle the uh, handle the job to do that? So I'm trying to understand. What what does that enforcement look like for us? Uh, in your presentation, you talked about the market levy and, and that you made that request for the province. It, would the formula be the exact same formula as the hotel uh, when they're trying to decide that, that piece? Um, and then uh, if this is approved today, which I'm hoping it will be, uh, that means we're moving to second reading, which is a public hearing, correct? And so that uh, people, uh, residents, or even people that have uh, currently have uh, short-term rentals can, can speak up at that point in time. Is that correct? Okay. All right. Thank you. Those are my questions. Is my, okay, so through the mayor to the councillor, um, in regards to compliance, so by having the provincial rental registry, the province has agreed that they will share their uh, registered as short-term rentals with HRM, and so we can use that list to ensure that those registered short-term rentals are complying with our, our zoning provisions mm -hmm. and any other additional provisions we may have on short-term rentals. Um, and so that will be a way that we can be uh, more proactive with compliance. We're still working with our compliance team to understand exactly how this will all all work because you know this is all all there's lots of moving parts to to short-term rentals and so even the provincial registry requirement that doesn't come in, into effect until April so it won't be until after April that we actually will have that list okay. of okay. Uh, registered short-term rentals so we'll, we'll continue to work with our compliance group to understand what their needs are and um, and if uh, further report needs to come back to you know talk about a different compliance system then you know, we so can do that. So at this point in time, time, Jill, we're talking about uh, a resident calling 311 and making that complaint. I believe this is short-term rental and it's not registered and they will investigate from that perspective. Yeah, through the mayor to the councillor, uh, there will still be the complaint driven, but we will still have that option to take the uh, registered short-term rentals and do mapping to make sure that they're all in areas that they should... Uh, that, that would allow for the type of short-term rental that they yeah. have. And then we can always go back to the province and tell them that these are illegal and then they would lose their registration number that way as well. So that would be our, our, our response. We, would, we wouldn't necessarily do anything. We would just uh, tell mom, mom and dad and they would go do the, their, their work. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, because the province would be the ones responsible for the registration number. So Okay, yeah. Yeah. All right. good. And the market and levy? Oh yeah, in regards to the marketing levy, so the amendments that have happened to the Marketing Levy Act um, have allowed us to, you know, apply the marketing levy to short-term rentals. How we want to do that, we can do that through our administrative order, and so that would we would need to come back to council at a different time to to update that. So I that that's 
we've not had discussions about, or at least okay. I've not been part of those discussions about how that will look, so that's to, to be returned to Council. And if passed today, we're we'll looking at a public hearing January, February? Um, should first reading pass today, yeah. then um, yeah, it would be, I mean, we would not be able to have a public hearing before the end of the year, so it would no, be in January not. or February, yes. Okay, thank you both for your work. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. Thank you, Councillor Clary. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you to our staff who've done so much work on this. Um, I, but I think there's some more to do. So you know, there's uh, what we what we don't have in the report uh, is the number and percentage of short-term rentals that will be illegal or non-compliant. Uh, we always hear dots. So we know how many are out there. We just don't know. And when I look at that map, which has the gray areas where they're allowed and the red dots where they are. Most of the red dots are in white areas, so they're not areas that would be, and so we don't actually have a sense of how many of these would be non-compliant, and I would like to know that. Um, we don't have an estimate of how many units will convert to long-term rental. So we do know that 80% of them are whole home, 20% uh, roughly are bedrooms, but we don't know how many of those are seasonal, how many might be legal after we do this anyway. So it may only be 30, 40, 50%, 60% that convert at some point anyway, with potentially hardship to the current property owners. And uh, to be fair, I have no problem if a company out there owns 20 houses and they're operating as a ghost hotel, uh, let's shut them down. But that's, we're not, we don't know if that's who we're affecting. We, we know there's some of them out there, but we don't know how many. We don't know how many of these are just little uh, mom and pops who own a house and you know rent a few bedrooms out or rent it out once in a while, or uh, uh, you know have a secondary suite or have a, a duplex, and they rent out one of the units at a duplex. And so that part is concerning to me that we don't know what estimate uh, would be converted at some point. Um, also in here was no uh, indication of impact to the tourism industry. So uh, I know you had consulted with a number of stakeholders a year ago or almost a year ago when this process started, but I don't know how many you went back to and said, here's what we're recommending, do you have any thoughts on this? And when I talked to Discover Halifax, they had not been consulted on what the proposed wa proposal was. Um, and so when I was getting some information from them, we know there's over 2,000 units as of August. That would represent about 20% of room accommodations in HRM which would equate to about $250 million in economic activity for the tourism industry. And so let's say, for example, almost all of these converted to long-term rental, that's a $250 million hit to the tourism industry, and they've had no kind of consultation on, here's what we're proposing, do you have a plan for this impact? Um, you know, in the report, the recommendation doesn't indicate that we need any extra enforcement. It says no resources will be needed. From what I've seen, and there hasn't been any assurances that you know all the current platforms and any new platforms will actually police this for us, so that means we're going to have to be policing this ourselves. Uh, the experts in this, uh, um, uh, who uh, I was looking at this, they consult with over 100 municipalities around uh, North America right now on regulating these, indicate that voluntary compliance leads to about 10%. Uh, compliance. So if you if you make it voluntary, you don't get compliance. 90% of people will be non-compliant. And so my concern is we're going to set ourselves up for a whole lot of headaches and say, you know, oh well, you know, just call our compliance office and they'll send out an inspector in two months and then we'll deal with it and it'll take, you know, the season will be ended by the time, you know, we actually deal with it. So because they're overstretched already. I've got tons of uh, dangerous and unsightly premises uh, 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 requests that have come in from residents that are still in process for months now. Um, we don't know, uh, in terms of conversion, how many uh, of these short-term operators will uh, simply sell their non-compliant properties and buy compliant properties. So if you're in a SEND zone, a corridor zone in the urban core, you can do this. So we don't know what the actual net impact will be of adding to the rental stock. We also don't know how many will sell and then uh, it'll go to uh, a homeowner, taking it out of rental stock completely, which there's some benefit to that, no doubt, but also looking at the research, there's a 2018 paper that indicated uh, for every percent increase in uh, Airbnb listings, uh, in the cities, 96 cities they looked at, there was like a 0.018% increase in rent. So a 100% increase is like a 1.9% increase in rent. So it's not a huge impact on rents. Uh, so 
like when, when we look at all of this, we're not sure what the effect will be. We're not sure how much it's going to cost. We're not sure what the impact is going to be on the tourism industry. We're not sure what the impact is going to be on the homeowners and the property owners. I feel like we need way more discussion on this before we get to it. I'm running out of time, but I do have uh, 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 an amendment, I'll come back for it, uh, that I would like to refer this to Committee of the Whole and, and get more information on this before we make the decision, because even you've just said the province won't roll out fully their uh, plan until April. We're going to pass this now, initiate it. It'll probably be a public hearing in a month or so, and then it'll be done. We won't even know what the province is going to be doing uh, or, well, we have a sense of what they're doing, but won't, we won't have the information from the registry till who knows how many more months or a year from now. And so I don't think we want to make these changes until we have these questions answered. So, so Councillor, you're going to come back with that? I will come back. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. So um, I'm concerned about uh, the data, as I just heard Councillor um, uh, Clary say, you know, we we know how many are out there. We, we actually don't know how many uh, short-term rentals are out there. We don't have an adequate number because I don't think that our uh, data source is accurate. Um, we've got folks who are, are renting um, their house or their uh, uh, basement uh, apartments for a weekend um, on Facebook Marketplace. You know, so that that's not in the data source. <laughs> um, so you know, I'm and and the other thing that I that I think that's really important here in this conversation is how property managers um, are managing Airbnbs and managing um, some of these uh, rentals on behalf of the owners. So I do think it's important that we're talking about um, ensuring that people are in and actually living in this primary residence and that we know that. I am concerned though about how we are confirming that information. So I'll ask that question. In addition, I am also concerned about how we are managing quality control. So when people are coming and they're, they're, they're renting this uh, short-term rental, um, are, are we able to ensure they're having a positive experience because we're requiring uh, water testing, like we do for our hotels and for our Airbnbs that are registered in that way, and um, as an accommodation, um, you know, I think it's important for us to uh, look at the comparison between a positive stay um, in an Airbnb and the. Um, regulations that are placed on those property owners for Airbnbs in the same way that um, a and b is managed and those regulations uh, to ensure that there is quality control. And also the WYSIWYG model, which is what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. So from the marketing perspective, when um, a person is, I'm just looking at a space right now, I know that's not how his house actually looks, right? Because <laughs> I know the guy. But so, so I'm trying to figure out how do we make sure that quality control is there so that when a person is marketing um, their, their lovely short-term rental, um, that that's actually what people are getting. And so do we rely on that um, registry? Um, or do we look at a way that um, we have more of a quality control system um, similar to Uber, right? Where you uh, rent that, you can uh, comment on it if it is not um, what you had intended to rent and you're able to actually comment on that. But if that information, that data is going over to the province, how then do we at the municipality receive that information to ensure um, adequate quality control? Um, and I, and I wonder too about that registration which comes into place in April. How is it that we at the municipality when our compliance officers are responding to a complaint, if that individual registered three weeks ago, received their information, but it's not updated on the provincial website? You know, so, so just trying to figure out how do we then um, ensure that the information that we have is the ad uh, actual um, confirmed information that the province has. Are they going to be updating it daily? Are they going to be updating it monthly? Um, just a couple of questions. Thanks, Joe. Sure, so I can start with this one. Um, so through the mayor to the councillor. So in regards to how will we ensure primary residents, it's, um, you know, the a, a big tool that we'll be using is 
how what you're selecting or identifying as your property residence when you're doing your taxes, because CRA taxes. will ask you to <coughs> identify your primary residence. We'll need to make sure that that matches. Um, and then there'll be other, you know, if we need to do further compliance okay. beyond that too, our compliance officers will look into that. Um, in regards to ensuring quality control of the of the units, I mean, that is a very good question. Like, how are you going to ensure that people are actually advertising what their house is? Um, I don't necessarily have an answer for that. Um, one of the things that, you know, because we will have the tool where this will be required to register with our rental registry, so that includes the, the municipal long-term rental and short-term rental registry, so that will apply to all rentals. Okay. Um, so there will be the database there um, to kind of show the properties that are, are available there. Whether or not that can be used as a way to ensure that people are actually advertising the, the correct, uh, the correct uh, property, we'll need to look further into that, but that is a very good question. The regulations. And regulations. Do you want to add? Uh, so th a piece that I'd add about confirming the data that we receive or the data that we the, that we rely on and just in the research that we did for this report and for the last report is that uh, according to the academic studies of the short-term rental markets, that's the best available data. The, the academic studies rely on their DNA data as well. Um, there are the vast majority of short-term rental listings in all jurisdictions that we look at are listed on Airbnb. Um, that could change, but uh, it mm -hmm. captures the, the largest <coughs> portion of the market. Um, and so they, the research has to rely on that data. There, there is no other source to confirm that. And I guess just through the mayor to the councillor regarding the, um, you know, how we'll be getting the information from the province and ensure that they're actually registering. They do have an annual registry, so everybody will be required to register once a year. Um, but should somebody register mid-year, we can always go back to the province and ask them for that additional information. Um, and we don't have the, the process okay. completely ironed out as to how we'll uh, collect the information. But my understanding is it would likely be we get the full list once a year and then if we did have to go back to them, then we could go back for. Um, okay. And from a public safety perspective for water testing, for example, how would we monitor that? <laughs> There's nothing, so with these proposed amendments here, these are just clarifying our land yeah. use bylaw amendments, so we don't have anything additional to ensure water testing. That, that would be a prevent within the provincial jurisdiction as well, too, to ensure that water testing was, uh, would be required to meet those, uh, that short-term rentals would uh, uh, need to have adequate water and quality water. Um, another thing that I will note is that the short-term rental registration, it does apply, and the regulations that are associated, they apply to all types of tourist accommodations. So they apply to hotels, Airbnbs, okay. and what we would consider a short-term rental. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'm kind of leaning towards the debate or the comment that Councillor Clary said about maybe there should be a committee of the whole discussion. There's so many questions that could be answered here. Plus, we'd like to have perhaps provincial representation on a committee of the whole to talk about what's the difference or what's the similarity between the provincial registry, what they're going to be bringing in, and what we're going to require as a registry. I hate to see us duplicate a bureaucracy, so I'd like to see that how much of a shared database we'd have between uh, agencies, be it municipal or provincial. In regards to safety of matters, I'm more worried about fire protection and fire inspections. You know, I want to make sure these facilities are safe to, to occupy. Uh, in regards to water quality, I think that's the Department of Environment's responsibility in regards to they provide uh, the standard now for public facilities is that every two years do a chemical analysis of the water, but every, every quarter they do a, a call for presence in their water. So I think that's more of a provincial jurisdiction than the mass of the municipality. As when it comes to inspections, that's a good question we should have a dialogue with the province about because I know now that tourism accommodations are lacking inspections uh, at the provincial level. Is that something we at the municipality are going to be expected to pick up or not? So that's a question that we need to debate or discuss with the province as well. But also I'm looking forward to uh, more dialogue uh, in regards to the rural context because uh, I support the amendment made earlier about having auxiliary suites as available for Airbnb accommodation. But I'm also curious about the RV camper trailers that have been set up as additional sleeping capacity on, on, on lots and stuff. That adds another element to the larger rural lots. Um, I'm also curious to hear from the urban uh, context of uh, these um, multiple Airbnb owners. Right now we're going to be saying by this bylaw, 
you have to be owner occupied. So if you own more than one unit, you can't occupy two units at once unless you have one spouse at one house, the other spouse at the other house. Um, it's the only way to, to comply with that rule. So having multiple units, uh, we're kind of saying, sorry folks, you're going to be owner occupied. So those other units, you have to either rent them for more than a 28 day period or put them back on the residential um, rental market, which would help, help us alleviate some of our housing issues that we're currently having. So. It should be quite a dialogue of the new year. I know it's been a long time coming for this, but uh, as again, I'd like to thank the province for its bringing in legislation for the registry of uh, Airbnbs as well as the marketing levy being applicable across the board. And I think that um, we should have a, a more wholesome discussion, I think, coming the whole of the new year. But uh, I'd like to know in regards to possible timing from the clerk's office, uh, if we're going to have a discussion with this um, in, into, a, into a first reading potential, any potential dates because you know I got my July February newsletters coming up uh, in the middle of January so I don't know what the first available date will be uh, for that because so this be important for my particular residents in the rural areas to know about and participate in that process. Not sure if the clerk has any thoughts on that at this point. I, I think it would be pending direction on if a committee of the whole was going to be provided we would look and work with our colleagues to make sure a date would be provided sometime in the new year just noting that there is a significant number of budget and council meetings coming up throughout january and february so i can't give you a direct answer on that right now but we would endeavor if that is the direction to communicate with council on the scheduling as soon as possible thank you thank you councillor daigle gammon thank you mr mayor um thank you jill and brandon this really is a massive amount of work um <laughs> I can't say how much I appreciate it. Um, my my worry is that this going forward, it, it goes across all of HRM, but then we say future, we're gonna go into some detail about rural and how do we define rural? So is rural by service boundaries? Is rural by uh, district? Um, so defining rural is a little bit of a worry for me. And uh, like when I re read through the report and because I'm partly in that, or District 14 and 17, when it talks, I think it's around page 98, and it talks about short-term rental, but it's bolded, but it doesn't say that it has to be primary residence. It's just the definition of short-term uh, rental, but it doesn't say primary. So in the absence of that word, does that mean that it could be a secondary? I just want to make sure I understand that or not. Uh, through the councillor to the mayor. So if the short-term rental is listed as a permitted use in the zone, then it would be permitted without the primary residence requirement. So further in the report and some of the other ones, it does say primary. So that's the distinction because it had commercial. It's through the mayor to the councillor. So the primary residence requirement is located in a general provision with the, within each land use bylaw. And then when commercial short-term rental is permitted, it's permitted in each zone. So where you've seen primary residence would be in the general provision of a land use bylaw to apply to all uh, residential areas. So in, in the, once this is applied, should it go forward? Um, and we're gonna do further work on the rural, just defining rural for me again, please. And then I guess the other piece is, um, will there be room for any exemptions during that learning process if we see something, right, in some of the, the rural that would make us rethink whether or not that blanket uh, could go all across HRM? Through the mayor to the council. So in the report, we say that the rural parts are outside the urban service area boundary uh, in the recommendation. Yeah, and then on the, I think on the primary, I'm trying to, on the primary residence requirement, the mapping that we did, uh, like we mentioned before, showed the red dots and where it's permitted and which which zones will be commercial areas in the future. And we did a analysis of that yesterday, and it, it's uh, about 1,400 out of 1,800 will fall within a commercial zone once this is passed. So that's about 76 percent, and that 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 includes you know approximate locations that we rely on. So that number could increase uh, because. Uh, some of them, you know, don't fall perfectly based on our area DNA data. Right. So, but uh, approximately 76% will be in a commercial area once this is approved. And so the primary residence requirement applies to that other 25% or, or less. Thank you. No Thank you. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I thank you both for this report. 
Um, there's a lot of work that went into it. As per my colleagues that have spoken before me, um, we talked about existing bylaw officers and being able to have to handle the amount of complaints. Like I know in the beginning there probably would be a lot and then they would probably taper off. Um, but, and uh, just wondering if they're gonna be able to enforce if the short-term rentals aren't advertised and it's just like a word of mouth thing. So how would they know? Um, so through the mayor to the councillor, so our compliance officers actually think by including clear language as to where what short-term rentals are and where they're permitted that will actually help them in in um, in, in their compliance cases because it's be, be clear as to where they're permitted and where they're not permitted. Um, in re however, though, I think this is something we, that we're going to we're going to need to continue to monitor because compliance is such an important piece of you know any sort of short-term rental regulation. So it's something we're going to have to really look at closely and follow closely to see if we do need to have a more robust compliance team. Um, in regards to um, short-term rentals that are being posted without that registration uh, number, it is a provincial requirement, so it will be up to the province to ensure that that's being enforced. We may find out about them and then contact the province to let them know that you know we're aware of these that are being located, but they're, they would be provincial, subject to provincial fines, so it would be up to provincial enforcement to, to look at those. Okay, thank you. I just had a couple of more questions. Um, from what I remember, uh, mortgage financers, i.e. bank, will only include half of your rental income on your mortgage. And uh, because they say rental income may not be consistent. Uh, are you familiar with that as well? Through the mayor to the councillor, I'm not specifically familiar with that uh, provision, but I spoke with uh, experts who say that uh, they, they do look for long-term lease agreements, so a minimum of six months for rental income to qualify you know, as, a, as an income when applying for a mortgage. So um, I've been told that the short-term rental would not qualify as rental income. Right, because we had mentioned before that um, uh, funds from the short-term rentals may help the income of the owner and qualify them for some, you know, for say a mortgage alone, but really in this circumstances, it's not gonna help them as far as. Um, yes. Uh, I had one more question. I think I'll come back as I, I'm writing over my writing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, staff, for all the work on this. Um, the piece that I continue to be concerned about uh, is the enforcement piece, um, because the usual, I, I don't think our usual approach of, um, well, we'll wait for a complaint to act on something is going to be effective in this situation, because, you know, it's different than the guy who built a deck a foot closer to the property line than he should have, or the woman who's put up a fence that's a foot higher. Um, if the I think in those sorts of situations, complaint-based is great because if the neighbors have concern, then they can complain. If they don't, then life goes on. Um, but complaint-based here, the harm um, is more to the general community rather than you know a specific neighbor in some instances, right? In terms of the housing supply, so I, I, I think we have to be proactive on this rather than just reactive. And it's the piece I continue to wor worry about. Um, Jillian, you'd, you'd reference the, the having to bring it attention to the province. That's totally what's gonna happen, <laughs> right? We will be the folks telling the province, um, you know, about, uh, hey, this this place is not is not registered. I don't see them as having the enforcement capability. That's gonna be us. Um, the one question I had, uh, I, by, I, I, I'm gonna ask for a supplemental uh, report here, um, but well, the one question I had before I do that was, um, for someone who's, who's owner occupied and so they're allowed to have the Airbnb but not, but only allowed, you know, the, the set number of days, how are we gonna, how is that going to be policed? 
Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, so we're not requiring a set amount of days uh, with the, with these with these proposed provisions. It's just more so if you're in a residential area, it has to be in your primary residence. Oh, geez, I thought uh, no. I could have sworn that we uh, we had uh, a set number of days if it was in your primary residence. No, there's other jurisdictions that have, oh, have adopted that, that model. that all up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. It's... So you're allowed in your primary residence. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My bad. Um, I still think we are going to need a, an enforcement piece on this, whether it's uh, primary residence or not. Um, so I'd like to move that Halifax Regional Council request a supplementary staff report on, proactive inf on a proactive enforcement approach to short-term rentals and staffing requirements to carry out that approach. Second by <coughs> Councillor Mason. And just quickly, on I've already kind of said my piece on it. Um, to me, uh, you know, the, the staffing requirement piece, uh, I don't think it's in this budget, but um, as we, as the province launches theirs and we get a little bit of experience, we're going to have to think about, well, do we, uh, do we need the, more on this? And I'd like a touch base to come back to council on it, you know, as, as this moves along. Thank you. Okay, that's the motion on the floor. Is there any discussion on that? Councillor Hensby. As I stated earlier, in regards to provincial versus municipal jurisdictions on what's going to be responsible for what registry and what requires for registration, be it a fire, a fire inspection, a water quality inspection, uh, you know, I'm just kind of curious of this enforcement piece, what are you expecting them to do? Are they just looking at the administrative process? Are they registered? Legally and uh, on on the registry, are you looking at the accommodation aspect for for minimum standards? You're looking at the water the water quality. Like what part of enforcement are you looking? They're expecting this uh, this motion to bring forward because um, if you ask me, our fire department inspection should be the primary issue in regards to enforcement. If they're going to have an Airbnb unit, they have to comply with these with these particular issues. So. I'm just trying to get clarification of your motion. What's the intent and what type of function do you expect it to be carried out by them? Councillor Othit. Thank you, Mayor, and I will support this. Um, one of the things that I'd like to see in the report, though, is a funding source for this or for funding options, because it reminds me of something we passed a few years ago called the smoking bylaw and how the federal and provincial money were going to help us buy the bins and the enforcement and I don't know if we've ever written a ticket yet, but or if we should have. Um, so I'd like to see, and I think staff reports usually suggest what things will cost, but I'd like to see if there's a way through licensing or fee or some way if we're going to enforce this of, of where that uh, revenue might come from because just to go and uh, and a higher several more compliance uh, people would uh, be something that's probably not in the budget right now, but that uh, might be required. Anyway, so if that could be included in the report, I'm happy to support that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I completely agree with uh, Councillor Outhead. I think if we're going to, if, if we're going to, request um, to have more staff, which is really what we're looking at here. Um, you know, clearly the, the enforcement um, is going to cost. And so if there is a registration fee option, if there is a funding uh, source that can be associated with managing uh, this, I'm, I'm all for it. So I would like to amend uh, your motion on the floor, and potentially it's a friendly amendment, um, to suggest, provide a supplementary staff report on a proactive enforce, uh, enforcement approach, short-term rentals um, and staffing requirements with a funding option or funding options, I guess, um, to carry out that approach. So thank you, Councillor Outhead. Are you okay with that? Councillor Ost, uh, Deputy Mayor considers it friendly. The deputy has a thumbs up. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. So that's um, amended. You, you know, I, I think that this is um, <laughs> going to take us down a, a, quite a road because if there is an assumption in the public, I think they might have an Airbnb and they've got a big party going on. And then we've got folks knocking on the door the next day or the next week or whatever. It's like, yeah, we had a lovely family wedding, right? So I, 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 I'm, I'm really concerned about what this is gonna look like. And I think a staff report is, is smart. So thank you, Deputy Mayor Austin. Thank you, we'll go to the Deputy Mayor. 
That's amended now. Thank you, colleagues. And um, uh, you know, just I just wanted to circle back to Councillor Hensby's question. Uh, I've left it, as I like to do, I've left it fairly open-ended. I mean, for me, what I was mainly thinking about is the, uh, the illegal short-term rental that just carries on and they're not in their primary residence and they're operating the residential zone. I can think of a couple in downtown Dartmouth where people threw out their tenants and switched their, their buildings, which are not, which are in ER zones. Um, in into short-term rentals and you know that was housing that disappeared um, that was mainly what I was thinking but I mean I'd be totally happy with staff if they if they want to bring back uh, stuff on the on fire all those kind of other elements to it as well um, it the motion is enforcement so staff can as they work through this and through the challenges they can bring back whatever they've deemed appropriate on it okay Julian Councillor, I just want to speak to um, the the issue regarding like meeting a fire code and building code. Um, so by requiring short-term rentals to register with the rental registry when that does come to council, that that part of that will be ensuring that all of you know the uh, types of rentals that are registering with the re rental registry are going to be complying with our minimum standards and our building codes and our fire codes. So that that registry will help with that bit. And I also just to a comment that you had made earlier to Councillor Hensby, I just want to clarify that our rental registry is only a one-time registry, whereas the short-term rental registry with the province is annual and so that would be ongoing whereas ours, ours would just be a one time you register whether you're long term rental or short term rental um, and then we, we have a record of it. Councillor Lovelace. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, so that's not a revenue source. <laughs> so uh, we may want to rethink that. Um, the other thing uh, just uh, kind of reminded me when, when you mentioned um, safety issues, public safety issues around uh, M200. So would we then be looking at updating M200? Um, you're laughing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Mayor to the councillor, there, there will be a report that's going to talk about the development of the rental registry and uh, will likely include updates to the M200 okay. as well too. So there, that, that will be for maybe another council meeting. All right, I'll sit, I'll sit tight, thank you. <laughs> okay, colleagues ready for the question on the amendment that was, um, uh, the request for a staff report that was amended in a very friendly way. That carries, thank you. So on the main motion, uh, oh sorry, is this the main motion we're back on now with these uh, speakers? Okay, uh, Councillor Smith. The computer must be frozen. Uh, okay, yeah, all right. Um, again, thank you colleagues. There's not much I have to, to uh, uh, bring forward. Thank you colleagues for the amendments to th this, this motion. I think they add some value. Um, the only thing that I am thinking about is the aspect of the, um, the Assessment Act or the Assessment, I'm not, I guess maybe the Assessment Act and um, even the market levy. I know we asked in the past the, the province, and I, I believe it was a, a letter and a motion through council to update that. Um, do you think at this time it would be worthwhile for us to kind of reaffirm that now having the Registration Act um, in law, now having our, depending on what happens today, having our uh, regulations um, in the process of being finalized, um, is it worthwhile for us to write a letter to the province again asking that we want to see this move forward to make sure that short-term rentals are uh, being included and assessed as commercial or whatever is deemed necessary. I'm just wondering if that's something we should look at doing again or, or your work, ongoing work will continue to put that forth to the province. Uh, through the mayor to the councillor. So just to clarify, the Marketing Levy Act has been amended. So that letter was successful in getting those amendments made. There's still, if we want to see further amendments to the Assessment Act to have a commercial assessment or a different type of assessment right. apply to short-term rentals, um, then should council wish to write, write another letter that, that you know, uh, that's up to council's discretion. Staff would, you know, would, would support that should you wish to do that. Oh, so we haven't done that aspect. Um, I thought we did, but maybe, it, you know, so long ago trying to go back in the memory bank. 
um, through the mayor to the councillor. Yes, I'll have to look back through the past reports. I know there was definitely a letter regarding the Market Levy um, Act, um, and I believe the, the Assessment Act was maybe included in there as well too, but uh, um, if this is something that council still wishes to see, um, the pro province look at that then uh, so okay. maybe when we come back depending on what happens today with the public hearing I don't want to make another uh, <laughs> something to report but just uh, can can we note to see if we have made that request related to the assessment in in commercial because I'd like us you know that would be it for the province a revenue stream for them to 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 ha make revenue from the short-term rental so I'll just maybe wait and for when you come back and see if what the Work's been on that. So okay. that's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, before I bring the motion in, uh, just a quick question. It was brought up a second ago. We were talking about all the inspections and the building code. Typically, when uh, someone is changing the uh, use of a house, they would need an occupancy permit for that. In this particular case, if I wanted to have an STR, would I then have to get an, a new occupancy permit? Uh, through the mayor to the councillor. So, based on the proposed amendments, if you are going to take a what, what's con con currently a residential dwelling and convert it into a short-term rental, and it's going to be there's going to be no primary resident that in there. It will be a commercial short-term rental. You will need to get a development permit or an occupancy permit for that. D a development permit for that. To, a development to, permit. It's a, it's we sometimes call it a DP only. It's just showing that you're changing the use. Right. The building code. Uh, the occupancy permits issued through our building code. So your building code bits wouldn't be changing. So whether or not an occupancy code permit would be required. I can't speak to that, but okay. we would require a development permit, so you would need to apply for that. But if I was uh, a primary resident and I was renting out some rooms in the house, then I wouldn't have to get an uh, occupancy permit? So if it's your primary residence and you're renting out your whole home while you're away, so if you go away for a month and you want to rent it out during that time, you don't require a permit. If you are going to rent out individual rooms, that's acting more as a bed and breakfast, and we will want a permit will be required for that. Okay. Um, so there'd also be some tracking that happens through that, assuming everyone does it legally. We not we know not everyone gets their occupancy permits the way they're supposed to. We will uh, we'll, we'll hope that the residents are applying for their permits as they as they're required. All right. So I okay. I am going to move that we refer this to committee of the whole. I know lots of people have spoken about this, but I think based on the reports that we're going to be getting back, we might have a lot more questions. More questions that we can have just going with two rounds. Uh, so I would move that Halifax Regional. Oh, and it, uh, by the way, I've pulled out the stuff on the secondary suite. Pulled that out. Uh, the stuff on the enforcement. Pulled that out. Uh, so I move that Halifax Regional Council refer item fifteen one eleven case two two four two three regulation of short term rentals to committee of the whole pending receipt of a supplementary report that provides information information regarding one, the number and percentage of short-term rental listings that will be illegal or non-compliant under the proposed changes, uh, an estimate of the number of units that will convert to long-term rental from short-term rental based on verifiable comparator cities that have taken similar approach to the one proposed in the staff report, or based on uh, survey data with extant short-term rental operators here in HRM. Three, impact to the proposed changes if a short-term rental was allowed on the same a lot as a primary resident, for example, a short-term rental in a second unit of a duplex. Uh, and four, uh, results of a consultation with the tourism industry, I'm thinking, for example, Discover Halifax, to see what areas of HRM, uh, physical areas of HRM would be most beneficial for zoning to allow for short-term rentals with least impact on housing supply, that is to align the areas of highest demand for short-term rentals accommodations with permissive zoning for those short-term rentals, especially in rural areas. Second by Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so in this, what I'm looking for is stuff we've already talked about, and I think many of us would like to get a better handle on what the impact is going to be. So we have a sense of how we would do it, but we're not sure of what would be the result if we did this. And I think that's really important for us because let's say there are 2,000 units now, uh, which is less than there was pre-pandemic, but they're increasing, uh, so you know we don't know what the growth would be. We do know that the academic research on uh, cities that have brought in regulations, and typically the regulations would more, be more on the, the partying, the nuisance, the parking, the other things, not so much restricting it to the point where it's almost illegal anywhere. Um, so we're taking, uh, if you look at, there's one uh, particular study that classified 17 different cities in five categories, we would be the hybrids, so we would be like the second most restrictive uh, in their categorization. 
And so, you know, we're, we're going pretty far out there. And again, I think it's important, but it's also important for people to remember, we don't know what the impact of this is going to be. So we know, I think it's around 7,000 units we need annually over the next number of years to sort of get out of our housing crisis. This may only bring in a few hundred or a thousand, or we don't know how many units that are there into a long-term rental market. So it may be a one-time, very small shot uh, in terms of helping our housing crisis, and it really may not help very much because the, the academic literature on the impact on housing prices and rental, uh, uh, rental uh, prices is minimal. Uh, it doesn't impact very much because our housing crisis is bigger than just a few hundred units or a thousand units or even 1,500 units. And so I think we, a lot of these questions need to be asked so that we know what the impact is going to be. Um, and I'm fine with waiting a number of months to get this right because we, we know the province isn't going to be bringing in their uh, and fully implementing their registration until April. So we won't even have the data on registration for who knows how long after that. Hopefully it will uh, pick up quickly. But we may not have any idea what the actual impact is going to be for a year, maybe two years, as we see things convert to long-term, if they convert to long-term rental. So anyway, that's uh, what I'm asking for folks is more information, more debate, so that we can get a sense of what the real impact is going to be. Thank you. Councillor Smith. So just quick clarification. In the motion that Halifax Regional Council refer item, uh, this item to uh, Committee of the Whole, does refer mean that this would be deferred and then we wouldn't make a decision today? Okay, um, so so for me with that, I, I couldn't support it. And the only reason I say that is because I think the information that you're asking for when I look at the, the report related to um, the the data uh, for from, from operators uh, related to listings, et cetera, et cetera, I think that is information we could get through monitoring. So I would rather see us um, gather that data through monitoring uh, rather than trying to get it now. And I don't know, like, I, I just know how hard it was for you to get that data in the first place. Um, so I, I don't even know if you'll really be successful in getting detailed data that is in this report. I'm not saying it's not out there, but I just know how difficult it was for you to even get the data that we have in our current report. Uh, so I would more rather see this be in a report that is more for an update. Maybe it's six months from regulation coming to effect. Maybe it's one year. Uh, I don't know. That's where, where I, I sit on, on, on that aspect. And I don't even think we need a committee of the whole uh, at the moment. Now, later on with, with data, more data in uh, more information from the supplementary reports, maybe. But as of now, I think um, to put this on hold for this information would would uh, not not be worthwhile. So that's kind of where I'm where I'm at today, and I don't support the the motion as it is. But if it was for to collect data, if regulation comes to effect, I'd support this no problem at all. But as of now, I, I can't I can't support it. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a question for staff. Um, I'm trying to remember the number that was thrown out and if I understood it correctly. Um, did you reference that yesterday you'd done uh, some quick and kind of <laughs> dirty look at the uh, numbers and I think it was you said that like 1,400 would be legal, um, but 1,800, or sorry, uh, 1,400 of 1,800 would be legal and 400 would be, wouldn't be? Was that, am I remembering that correctly? Uh, through the mayor to the council, you, the numbers are pretty close, but not that that 400 would be illegal, that that 400 wouldn't fall in a commercial zone, so they would have to meet a primary residence requirement, uh, being that they're in a residential zone. So they would still have an opportunity to come into compliance with the primary residence requirement. If they're their primary, yeah. Yeah, exactly. From what I, I mean, we did have that fellow from, um, I think it was McGill, that uh, had, uh, the university that had been down, that looked at our market when we were talking about academics um, and some of the work that's been done. And I mean, the, the estimate there was, um, you know, I think it was a whole percentage vacancy point. Now, we wouldn't recoup all that because some of these would be legal. Um, but I mean, where we are now, I, you know, and apologies, Councillor Clear, I can't support this at this time for the same reasons of Councillor Smith, and that's part of why I wanted to pull the enforcement piece out of that motion because uh, I don't want to delay this. I think we we need to go forward with a public hearing to the public because uh, the situation around there out there on housing um, is more urgent than this. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be quick because uh, Councillor Austin pretty much said what I was going to say. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that we need a committee of the whole. I don't. Th I think the most important thing is that we go forward uh, with a public hearing. Um, I do think also when we <laughs> plan the public hearing, we may need a bigger space. Um, I think there's going to be a, a lot of folks who are interested um, in having their voices heard. Um, I think that what is being asked for in this motion uh, doesn't exist and can't be collected. Um, currently, so the number and percentage of short-term rental listings, it, I, I don't even know that that is possible, honestly, to, to, to have an accurate number. I think we could have an estimate, um, definitely, which, which you have provided. Um, and, I, and I don't know that we uh, would be, and I'm, I, again, I do think that we've already addressed the enforcement issue, but I don't know that, um, that we would uh, be able to do a fulsome uh, consultation with the tourism industry until we're actually at public hearing. So I think that's what's really important. So I'm not going to support this, um, and I do look forward to the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Othet. Thank you, Mayor. And my concern is, I mean, we're not approving anything today other than going to a public hearing, scheduling a public hearing. But we're going into a public hearing, and I think we can almost predict what that public hearing will look like. And I think Councillor Lovelace might be right that we might need some extra time or space. But it's predominantly going to be people who are going to be economically impacted by this. And I think the first thing they're going to do is ask for some of the information that Councillor Cleary is looking for and that we won't have, and we'll have to say we don't have it at the public hearing, and or we'll have the information, we'll want to make changes, and our solicitor will say we can't make changes on the fly here at a public hearing unless we re-advertise and, and put in the changes that we're proposing, et cetera, et cetera. We can't make changes on the fly, we'll have to start the whole process again. So, I'm kind of leaning towards a green, and I don't care if it's a committee of the whole or a, or a regular council session, that doesn't bother me so much, but I, I, I do think that he makes a good point about is there a little bit more information we need before we go to the public hearing so we don't at the public hearing hear all the things we don't know or need to change and then John, you'll be telling us it's too late to do it unless we start over the process again of a public hearing. So I don't think we should be too quick to dismiss what John's proposing here. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, we know this will cause economic hardship for some folks. But, uh, and I'm okay with that, because if we don't close this right now, people will continue as the economy continues to recover in COVID and so we'll have more and more people looking at this as a revenue option. And for me, while it isn't a massive number of units, in the areas where it is most impactful, uh, it's a lot of units. I have 0.4% vacancy in District 7, so I can't not support this. We have to, you know what, 100 units back in the market? There's 100 units back in the market. So I'm gonna support it and ask you to vote against the uh, motion to refer. Thank you. Okay, uh, with council's indulgence, uh, perhaps we could go to the mayor since uh, he's Thank you very much. I'm going to support this uh, amendment. A at least a couple of years ago, perhaps pre-COVID, Discover Halifax did a master plan on tourism. And they were the first people that used the term with me of over-tourism. And so Ross Jefferson and his team and the folks that know Discover Halifax know that he is not, their goal is not just to bring more people to Halifax, it's to build a community where tourism benefits both those who visit and those who are here. And he was one of the early people who talked about the impacts of Airbnb being negative in the community. So at the same time, uh, he obviously wants to make sure that this is good for the hospitality business. But I just have such great faith in, in the work that he's done. And I know that there's been a conversation, but I think a little bit more effort on this is not necessarily a bad thing. I don't think it slows the process down. As was mentioned, uh, we, we need the province to do a bunch of things for us uh, in any event. We, we do need to move on short-term rentals. We, we, we do need the housing. And whether it's hundreds or many hundreds or even more, we, we do have people that are having multiple residences being used as Airbnbs, and that's impacting 
uh, housing in our community. If I thought we could implement this on, go to a public hearing and implement it by the end of January, that's one thing. But we have time to, I think, to work on this. And I do really believe that the impact on uh, the tourism industry, I think we'll find uh, some, some congruence on this. Um, I don't believe, and I know one of the things that we don't want is we don't want this to be more confrontational than need be. I think you'll get a lot of people in the tourism industry that will support sort of a crackdown on um, short-term rentals, recognizing that it's, it is impacting our housing supply. But I think it's worth taking the time. I, I think the motion that Councillor Cleary uh, has, I don't care if it's a committee of the whole but, or not. Um, you know, I think we've already had a committee of the whole on it, uh, almost, to be honest with you. But uh, I do think that it's, uh, I, I, I just think it would be a good thing to do at this point in time. Uh, we have to do something on short-term rentals. We cannot leave people without a house when there are people that are renting out multiple units but I think there's a way to do it in such a way that we don't make the divide worse um, in the community. So I'm going to support the motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll go to Council Councillor Dago Gaiman. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And pronounced it right. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, my worry is, you know, we're, we're sending staff to go fishing without a fishing rod. Um, can they actually, especially the first bullet, can they actually do this? Like, is, is it possible? Um, what, what time frame would do, do you think that it would take to do it? And whether it's committee of the whole or whether it could be added on to this supplementary report, especially like the third and fourth item, if that could be added on to supplementary report as opposed to committee of the whole, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, just efficiency of time and, and what can be accomplished. So, that's my question. Thank you, through the Mayor of the Council. One of the difficulties in the nature of the market so far is that uh, being unregulated, that the information related to hosts is anonymous and we don't have access to, to the hosts and to, to, to act to adequately pull them and survey them. So that is a difficulty, um, but I'll let maybe Jill add to that as well. Yeah, uh, through the mayor to the councillor, yeah, further to what Brandon was saying, it will be difficult to do that kind of more direct, um, uh, uh, you know, research with, uh, or, you know, um, engagement with, uh, with, with hosts. Going back and talking more with uh, the tourism sector, I mean, mm -hmm. we already have contacts of folks that we can work with, so that's something that we, we could be able to do. Um, and regarding to, regards to a time frame, um, it, it's hard to answer that right now. I will acknowledge that we do have an RHI round three that is going to be taking up a lot of our time um, as, the, as, the, um, as the winter comes or as the new year comes. And there's also some other big projects we're working on. So um, it would be several months, uh, you know, six months to a year before we could return to council with something. But uh, it, you know, again, t depending on what council's direction is for us, you know, we will, we will do our best to provide the adequate information. Thank you. Um, so maybe, Councillor Clary, when you speak again, um, if you close on this amendment, just whether or not Committee of the Whole or uh, a more augmented supplementary report might be considered. Thank you. Councillor Purdy. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to speak in favor of Councillor Cleary's uh, amendment as well, and just for all the points that were raised in favor for it. Just. We need regulation, obviously, but we don't want to over-regulate, and I think that's a very delicate balance. And um, and the impacts, as Councillor Cleary has um, indicated, are quite big. Um, so just to have all of our ducks in a row before that public hearing happens, I think, is wise, as Councillor Ethit um, has said. So I will be supporting this amendment. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Just quick clarification. Uh, I've heard a couple of times that, that the province will need to make approvals in order for this to move forward. I, I didn't think that was needed, but that was said a few times, so I just wonder if you can clarify that for me. Uh, through the mayor to the councillor. So the province's amendments to the Tourist Accommodation Registration Act, th those have all been passed and are now in a, f the, they're not in a f necessarily in effect, but they will come into effect in April, but there's nothing that further that needs to go to uh, the legislature. Right, so yeah. so everything that we've asked for so far, other than the the, the commercial aspect, which you're going to do some research, we have, and that will be in effect in April 2023. 
You, yes, exactly. And through the mayor to the councillor, I was able to look at the motion that was passed in September 2020, and the letter was only in regards to the Marketing Levy Act. It didn't include specific, a specific letter regarding the Assessment Act. I will still do some additional research to see if there is and maybe a, a, another report that uh, discussed mm -hmm. that, but not related to the 2020 report. Okay, so 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 there's nothing there's nothing that is needed for us to, to if we wanted to tomorrow start the regulations we have all the tools we need to do that. So through the mayor to the councillor, these are the, what we're taking to what we're presenting to you today are just amendments to our land use bylaws right. to you know provide the definition of what a short term rental is and to confirm kind of where currently where they would be permitted today. So where can you do tourist accommodations? You can have a short term rental. Where you can't, then you should only have it in your right. primary residence. Okay. So there's yeah. Just yeah. Nothing. Nothing further. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, I just that clarification that we're not waiting for the province on no. any anything in order to move forward. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. There Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I, you know, I, it doesn't matter to me if it comes back to a committee whole or comes back to council. I just figured people would want to have a discussion around it, and we are limited to two rounds at council. Um, so if it's, you know, uh, get a supplementary report and come back to council, I'm fine with that too. If if that convinces more people to uh, to, to support this, my point is. Uh, we are making pretty substantial changes that we don't know the full impact of. In fact, we don't even know what the numbers really are. We have some back of the envelope calculations of how many might be, how many could be. I just can't support a leap of faith. We talked about this earlier. I can't support a leap of faith uh, without trying our best to get more data and, and or just good estimates of, of what we're actually uh, going to achieve, what the outcome will be. So, you know, when we look at this, I, I just think a few years ago, you know, I remember getting calls from residents complaining about, uh, I think there's an Airbnb up the street. And our compliance officers would go, and in fact, planning and development said, well, it's a residential use. And so, you know, we have for several years not been dealing with these, and some of them should be dealt with, some of them may not have to be dealt with. I guess when we look at that map and we say, okay, these gray areas where they could happen, and then the dots where they are happening, there's more red dots. So it's kind of funny, I was thinking, you know, when you were saying, you know, 1,400 are, are in commercial areas. I didn't see them, especially in the urban core. And so I'm, I really don't think we have a good handle on how many units we're talking about here, how many units might convert. And I think that's the important point because we may be having this massive change and get a couple hundred extra units actually convert to long term. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe it ends up being three or four or five or a thousand. Well, that's great. But we just don't know. We have no sense. It wasn't in the staff report, and I would like to see better than just back of the napkin calculations. I'd like to see a report with a methodology saying, here's how we think we're going to attack this, and here's how many units we think might. Even if you're off by 20%, a, a good, solid try is better than, eh, we don't know. And so I just, in good conscience, can't go forward with making changes that we don't know the impact of. And so that's why I'm hoping you'll support this. And again, if, if it co just comes back to council, I'm fine with that too. But I really don't think we should make a change until we know the impact. So I, w I just want to ask a question. Um, because I, as much as I want this information, I don't want it to take a year. Um, I'm wondering if Councillor Cleary might put a timeline on it whereby you come back with whatever information you have. Certainly the consultation with the tourism industry to me would be helpful. If you can't get the other information, I wouldn't want to spend a year waiting for it. I would think that if we could have it back in two months or three months or something, it would be a lot easier for me to support than to suggest that we're going to wait a year. Because there are a lot of work's gone into this, so that's a lot of work. Thank you very much to all of the team uh, who've done that. Um, just a uh, point of clarification, Councillor Clary. I love your liberal uh, use of Robert's rules. Uh, so basically, if I was to have continued, I would have said around April, May, when the province is bringing in and, and actually implementing that, I would think if we could get that information by then, if we don't get it by then, just come back with whatever you do have and, and you know, we'll, we'll work at that point. So by April, May is a little vague, but I think we should put something in the motion and I think April 1st is a good date from my point of view. Councillor Clary? April 1st is Councillor Cleary. So this report would come back with whatever you have by April 1st. Councillor uh, Hensby. 
Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. I just happened to take an opportunity to go to the Airbnb website and just typed in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and it comes up over 1,000 homes in Halifax alone. I'm not even talking about Dartmouth or the rest of the municip municipality, so there is a significant stock out there. So. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thanks so much. So if, if we're putting a timeline on for April, what we're expecting is that people are actually going to have these units posted on a site that can be easily seen. Um, so it won't be a private group, it'll be a public group. Um, but at the same time, if you're renting uh, your unit or your house in July and August, you might not be putting it on right now. You uh, also uh, w wouldn't necessarily be listing it in a way that would be public, right? So I, I, I just don't know, I, I don't expect staff to be going on Facebook Marketplace to be searching uh, keywords. You know, I just, I don't know that this is a good use of our resources. Um, I think the information that we have is what we have right now and it's, and it's good. Staff have done an exceptional job. And I think what all we're doing is just kicking a can down the road to kick a can down the road and hope that maybe we got a you know, little bit more information. We have the information we need. Um, and so I'd like to see us move forward with this. Thank you. All right. Folks, this has been a very good discussion all, all, all afternoon or whatever it has been on this. So, and I want staff to know how much we appreciate this. And I want you to know, as you know from the meeting we had yesterday, how important RHI is to me as well. So we don't want that to, to suffer because uh, you guys have to do really fast footwork to get that done and we appreciate that. Ready for the question on the amendment or the uh, referral, I guess. What is it actually? A referral. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's not, you say it says Committee of the Whole, is that what you want to stick with? Let's say come back to council so it would be a deferral more than a, what would it be, referral? Ian, why don't you tell us what we're looking for? So just to confirm, uh, we would need to, I want to confirm that and the date and the motion if, and making sure that those are formally friendly amendments before we vote on that. Okay. Are we all clear on what this is? This is a deferral until April 1st at the latest with the request for information that Councillor Cleary has put forward. And what? There was other stuff in the report, so it'll all come back. Yeah, but that's not part of this. No, this is a different motion. This is on the deferral, and then we vote on everything else. I guess we don't if we pass the deferral. Right. So just confirming, I've made some, I just made some quick changes to the motion on your screens. Okay, everybody have a look at that. This is important. And I do think it's been a really good discussion. If this passes, then we don't pass it today. It comes back on April the 1st with that information and the other information that's been. Yes. It, it will return with the motions that are currently on the floor on the floor when it comes back. Right. Okay, ready for the question on the motion to defer. So that motion, motion passes. So that's it for that for today. All right, colleagues, we'll move on our agenda to um, 15112 Herring Cove Servicing. Who's taking this one? Councillor Cleary? 
I'm happy to put this on the floor for Councilor Cuddle that Halifax Regional Council direct Chief Administrative Officer to one, not proceed with construction of phase 2B and phase four of Herring Cove project at this time to notify the province that the municipality will not be proceeding with the project but request that the funding remain uh, allocated to the project and three, apply under future funding program should they become available to offset the increased cost to complete both phase 2B and phase four at the same time. Second for that. Councillor Blackburn, anything on it, Sean? Uh, Councillor Clerk? Uh, no, uh, the report's there, and it's not my district, but uh, you know, uh, you, you need the money. Ready you for need the, the money? I know there's somebody watching closely uh, at home. Ready for the uh, former deputy mayor, Councillor Lovelace? <laughs> Thank you. So, you know, this was a really interesting report. Um, it certainly has been uh, a difficult situation for the community. Um, you know, it's been a long time in the making. This has been 20 years for them. Um, and, you know, I think that there's, there's some confusion around uh, phase 2B and phase 4. Um, and how um, the public is actually, uh, the, the, the people, the properties who are impacted by this, um, how their voice has actually been heard throughout this entire process. It's been difficult through COVID to actually get everyone together to have uh, public meetings. Um, you know, and so given the, the long standing promise from this community and the placement of the wastewater treatment facility in Herring Cove, you know, I think that the the recommendation to keep these funds allocated to this project is is very important, um, and I think that uh, well, I know that Councillor Cuddle has been uh, working with the community and working with community members to to move this forward. Um, and thank thank you, Councillor uh, Clary, for putting it on the floor. So I just really wanted to acknowledge how difficult this has been for the community. But I do have a couple of questions. So. For staff, if there are, are any answers, is there a risk in maintaining uh, the funding? Do, do are we able to maintain the funding if we don't proceed with a vote on the LIC? Because there's there's like this fear that if if we if we if we wait, that the the money's gone. So I'm, so I'm curious about that. And um, I'm also curious to know why the LIC for phase four um, wasn't approved as part of the original product, project. Like it was just an add-on, right? Yeah. So, so it seems, and, and it is quite a diverse area compared to the other more close-knit um, neighborhoods. So I'm trying to understand how did phase four actually get lumped in because it wasn't part of the original. And the third question, could this work proceed with only consideration of phase 2B if the funding's actually there? And what would the implication be and what would be required to actually make that happen? So in other words, is phase 4 a requirement in this? Is this, this is really complex and I'm trying to figure out how the heck that got added in. Thank you. Uh, planning and development, sorry. Use of Habush with planning and development and through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. With respect to your question about the time wise, this funding program has been extended already under the ICIP application or agreement that we have currently with the province. And the words or the communication that has been passed down to us is that, uh, is that program is coming to an end and uh, funds need to be allocated and so this was one of the reasons why we were trying to rush this as quickly as possible before council. And uh, so that's where that's at right now. Um, and then with respect to your phase four question and why was it including the LSE, it, it's been 20 years in the making, definitely precedes my time. My understanding is that uh, the entire Heron Cove project or the servicing project was split into, phase, into four different phases. Um, why was it left out initially from an LIC placement was because um, phase four was deemed to be very difficult to construct and so the decision was we, we were going to do this phase approach originally right. and that's how it just kept moving forward and uh, as the report states we completed everything with the exception of phase 2B and phase four and those remain to be a commitment from previous councils that were made that 
we were going to come back and revisit and as most recently as it stated in the report that uh, this has been done a few years ago that the commitment has been made to make this project to service these these remaining phases phase 2b and phase 4 as a priority for council and uh, with respect to the last question if I understood that correctly are we able to proceed with phase 2b alone yeah under the existing agreement, um, that's up to council's discretion. Uh -huh. The LIC okay. is presented before you, and what the ramifications would be for the existing residents uh, currently if we were to proceed per the existing agreement at this time. So I, I'm just ch checking to see if I still have time, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have two, <laughs> 10 seconds. So I, I guess uh, I'll come back then if, uh, if there's any other questions. No, okay. nobody else? Councillor Lovelace. All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, five more minutes, so, or three, I guess. So there have been communities and neighborhoods waiting since the 1990s throughout many, many areas of HRM. Um, in Hammonds Plains, uh, phase three of Maplewood was promised in 1997, still waiting for it, right? So I think it's really interesting to see how um, this area was an add-on um, and yet not part of the original project, but now getting lumped in with the LIC, which is raising the cost of the overall project when you consider the density of that area, right? So am I, am I wrong in that? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councilor, I'm not surely entirely sure what you mean by it's been added to the project. Well, it wasn't part of the original Phase four was not part of the original um, uh, it's, agreement. It's always, but for the agreement, no, it has not, no. Yeah. So what we have done, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, so what we have done is that we, we, in anticipation of future funding programs, we thought that it was the best use of economies of scale to have the consultant complete a detailed design for phase 2B and phase 4 at the same time. Okay. This helped us reduce design costs by approximately twenty-five to $50,000, and that's why the design phase only was lumped in right now with uh, with this report. Um, the, the whole purpose of this report is to put it, is to present a picture to council showing them what phase 2B is going to cost alone, also to, uh, to provide an update on where phase four stands right now and uh, what the anticipated costs are going to be based on the uh, cost estimates that we've, 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 we have at, uh, at this current time from the, from the consultants. So is there risk then? Like four. that, so is there risk? If we if we don't if we wait or if we just go with 2B, I mean I, I think what you're saying is you're going to lose the money. So we have an, an, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councilor, we have an existing signed agreement with the province of Nova Scotia under for Phase 2B alone. So we can we if council decides today if they want to move forward with Phase 2B, then you have the numbers presented in front of you what the, what the approximate LIC is going to be for the Phase 2B residents on themselves. And as the report states, that's a significantly higher than what was previously approved in 2005. Much higher. Yes. Much higher. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so You're much. Uh, I think it's clear to say, though, there is a risk. We're asking the province to keep that money there. It's up to the province whether they do that. Correct? Yes. That's, that's up to their discretion if they want to keep the money or not. Right. Councilor Hensby. Well, Mr. Mayor, being on one of those members of the previous councils that made this commitment to the Herring Cove community, I believe we should keep that commitment, especially a part of the Harbour Solutions uh, cleanup. They have one of the sewage treatment plants out in their community, and one of the things, the conditions were, was to extend water and sewer services to the community. I think we need to keep that commitment, and I'd like to see uh, Phase 2 be completed as, as, much, as quickly as possible. Whenever federal and provincial dollars required, let's get her done. So I'll be voting against the motion. Keep, keep in mind that the issue is the LIC to the individual homeowner is the issue, right? It's not our cost, it's their cost. Okay, ready for the question, colleagues? No, Councillor Lovelace has spoken twice. So ready for the question, colleagues?
The motion passes. Our next item, colleagues, is 15.1.2, which is 15.1.2, uh, sorry, is done. Coming out of uh, audit and uh, finance, 15.2.1 is the uh, amendments to the administrative order respecting marketing levy special event reserve grants. Council, what is your wish? Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, move that uh, Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the amendments to Administrative Order 2014-020-GOV respecting marketing levy special event reserve grants as set out in Attachment B of the staff report dated November 4th, 2022, and two, adopt the amendments to Administrative Order 2014-021-GOV respecting regional special events grants as set out in Attachment D of the staff report dated November 4th, 2022. Councillor Mancini, Councillor Dago Gavin, anything on it? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, part of this is really about the inclusion of an interrupter clause. And what happened during the pandemic was that we really looked at it at case by case basis about whether or not an event needed to be, uh, if it was held virtually and there were some changes made or if it was, uh, it could not happen and was happening another year. So we wanted to be able to have um, a little bit more clarity even around the communication uh, that could happen. So the changes in this are really about communicating that if there is an interruption, um, then it would be dealt with on a case by case basis. So I hope you support the motion. All right, co colleagues, ready? Ready for the question? That's carried. Uh, coming from the Budget Committee, 15.3.1, Budget Direction. Who is the Vice Council Councillor Diggle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, move that Halifax Regional Council 1. Rescind the direction from the 2022-23 fiscal budget to include 7 million in the 2023-24 budget to find a sidewalk program from capital from operating and to reallocate 20 million included in the strategic initiative operating reserve Q667 in 2019 as a potential capital contribution for the construction of a community stadium to the following reserves. Transfer 5 million to the options reserve Q421 for the solid waste facility capital project CW190003. Transfer 15 million to the capital reserve fund reserve Q521 to fund over commitments within the capital fund reserve. And three, approve revised debt policy of 1,500 per dwellings and amend capital from operating to be 64,922 million by reducing 8 million from street recapitalization for the 2023 24 budget. Second by Councillor Cleary. Ready for the question, comments? That motion carries. Thank you, folks. Coming from Community Planning and Economic Development, the Bedford West Park Facilities Plan was passed um, by consent. Correct? Uh, 1542, the Halifax Public Gardens proposal passed on consent. Coming from Executive Standing Committee, District Boundary Review Project Phase 2, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I put the following uh, motion on the floor. Um, the Halifax Regional Council approved the proposed polling district boundaries as set out in attachment one and three of the staff report dated November 24th, 2022 for submission to the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. So moved. Uh, thank you, Councillor Outhead. Uh, and so, uh, first of all, uh, you know, um, the words from the municipal clerk during this whole process to me on several occasions was, Councillor, trust the process. Trust the process, when, because when the first uh, boundary review draft came out, I was very concerned. Uh, I think my colleague to my right was concerned, and Dark Melthians were very concerned with the first. And uh, Bed, how do you call it? Refer to Bedford people. Bed, 
Bedfordites, and the Bedfordites were, were, were very concerned. So we we had public further public consultation. Uh, we had the survey. I think over 1,100 people responded to the survey. The committee and the staff went back. Uh, redrew a number of the boundaries, uh, and I speak for District 6, and uh, you know, the, what's now in front of us is something that uh, I'm quite comfortable with, and I believe the residents of District 6 are quite comfortable with also, and maybe some of the surrounding districts. The reason I pulled off the, uh, the consent agenda, I wanted to ask about the next steps. So that, that's clear to residents. So if approved today, it goes to the URAB. Can you explain to us, uh, you know, what the, uh, you know, what that process looks like? I've been telling residents there's an opportunity to speak at the URAB. It's different from how we do it at the municipality. How will they know when they can speak? They have to sign up. Uh, and the other question is, and I don't know if you can answer this or not, either one of you, uh, is there a danger of the URAB going in here and changing things, if there's not, even if there's not a lot of fee? I understand changing if there's a lot of pushback from residents and council, but if there's not, is there a danger of them uh, uh, making changes? Because if there is, then I mean, we really need to make sure our residents speak in, in favor of, uh, or, or against, depending on what their, their opinion is. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Clerk and Liam. Mayor Savage, through you to the councillor. Uh, so I can speak to next steps. Uh, I can speak lightly to the process of the URB, but I want to acknowledge that's their process, and, and I, I don't want to speak specific to any specifics on that. Um, so we have been trying to trust the process ourselves through this. So this is a piece of legislation that is owned by the province of Nova Scotia through the MGA, and that provides the requirements of this. The UARB, as much like us, is facilitating the process that they are given. Right. So I wanted to make that point and be clear to that, that this is a process that comes from legislation that they are also fulfilling. As a part of that process, they have been clear throughout it that this needs to be based on feedback from the public and feedback from people in the community, which is what we have tried to do through the panel and through the hard work of the members of the panel that have provided this great work and this great recommendation, I believe, that you have in front of you today. Um, we will be following the process and can commit to providing updates as appropriate through the process to council where it's sitting, including hearing times when they're happening, and as appropriate providing opportunities for members of the public to, to see that through our website and through our district boundary website so they're aware of when that is coming as well to the best of our abilities. The UARB has been clear through their handbook on this project and how to do these boundary reviews um, that they take into account the feedback of the public. So there is an opportunity for the public to speak to the boundary review when it goes to the UARB. We expect that to be sometime in 2023, likely in the spring. Okay. Um, that public feedback will be taken into consideration. So if there is feedback that's provided on the boundaries, good or otherwise, uh, they can come at that time and they have said that they will take that into consideration when making their decisions. Uh, I can't speak to what they will decide, I can, uh, yeah. but I can say that we are, we believe that we proposed through the panel um, to council today a polling district map that is grounded in public feedback and grounded in the five factors that the province has, has required us to, to provide. And we are going to be trusting that process as we go forward to the UARB because we have been trying as close as possible to follow what we've been we've been directed to do. Well, again, thank you for the work. Uh, my time is just about up. Uh, you know, uh, yes, please. As soon as you're aware of the process, the, day, the dates, the deadlines of that, so we can share it with our residents and they can choose to, to speak. And for us too, uh, as councillors, if we have some concerns, uh, we have the opportunity to speak uh, at the URAB. Uh, thank you both and the panel, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've gone through a few of these exercises, both provincially and municipally now, and uh, I think this process has probably been the most uh, transparent of all of them. And I congratulate uh, you two, as well as your staff, for bringing this report forward. It's never an easy task, and you try and deal with the best of science with the best of information you have available to you. And uh, it's not a perfect process, but it's the best you can do with the information you got. And I think it's great what you came up with. It's a vast improvement over the first report in regards to uh, a rural representation. 
Uh, so I don't want to sound like I'm gerrymandering or anything else, but I think that the Eastern Shore and the Muscadabra Valley should keep their separate ways and keep perspectives uh, on around this council chamber. Uh, I think it's great to have that rural voice around here. Uh, the only thing I'm disappointed in the report was um, it'd be the first time in 30 years if I rerun an election next year, the first time in 30 years that East Press and North Press won't have my name on the ballot. It would be a, a certain change uh, for the African Nova Scotia community to see them reunited. Uh, one time they were in my particular district when we used to have 23 district councillors. Uh, Chair Brooklyn Lake Loon used to be with North Preston and East Preston, but this time around it's shifting the other way that East Preston, North Preston, and Little Sand River part of Westfall are going into the Coal Harbor Westfall Cherry Brook area. Uh, it's great to have the reunification of the Preston Township, I guess you guess you're great to call the greater area uh, under, one, under one district, which would be good. And also, it also respects the municipal planning strategies for the Preston Chamber Lake Loon. It's all under one district, as well as the, the Little Sand River uh, Westfall area is also the Clarver Westfall planning district. So it makes perfect sense that way to have those movements go because it perfectly aligns the municipal planning strategies for those communities as well. That's great. The only thing that's missing, in my opinion, was the Montague Gold Mines. I believe uh, it's in particular right now it's in District One. I believe it should go with District 4 because there's more continuity and connectivity between the Monica Gold Mines, the Lake Loon, and Humber Park and Westfall because they're not just traffic issues but like major watershed and local development issues. As it stands now with these boundaries, you have to drive out of District 1 to go into another district to get into Mon Monica Gold Mines. And there's no, there's no direct connectivity between, the, between that area and the rest of the district. So I will not make any suggestion of changes here. I'll be making those recommendations to, before the URB board. I've also spoke to the Preston MLA about this, and she also believes the same thing. I had the privilege of serving as the MLA for the Preston constituency as well in the past, and the Monica Gold Mines was a part of the Preston Township communities that served us together. So I think we need to keep that continuity together, but uh, I'll be making those recommendations and suggestions at the URB board. I will I'll forward this report on forward as it is today, and I just want to say congratulations on a, on a hard, hard job, but you don't think it came through with flying colors, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for your work, um, Ian and Simon and your team. Uh, a lot of hard work in this, a lot of meetings. Do you have any idea if the resident feedback at the UR, <laughs> sorry, at the Review and Utility Board um, is it only in person, or might you know? I, I can't speak to how their hearings are, are being run. I, okay. I don't have that knowledge base, but we, when we communicate forward as much as we can, we'll make sure we put the, um, all the information that we're provided on that. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Thank uh, you, Mr. John. Mayor. Sorry? John was going to answer, I think, about the oh. mayor. Oh, sorry, Councillor Lovelace, we'll just let uh, Mr. Traylor say a word. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Council. So just to add to what uh, Ian has mentioned with respect to the URAB process. So, um, you know, uh, clearly all of the input of the individual councillors and of, and of um, in residents in the, in the community has been captured by the committee and the work has led to where we are, which is very helpful. So the submission is being prepared now. Um, dependent on tonight's decision. It will include a link to the video uh, from tonight as well as executive councils. The information and the feedback that's been gathered will all be part of that package that goes forward to support you know, the recommendation that council is making. Appreciate that the URB will also have an opportunity which will be published in terms of those individuals who wish to make changes or suggest, you know, pieces to it, but our submission will be what council has decided now, all supported by that great work that the committee has done. So that's that's the next step that goes forward from this, if that assists. Thank you, John. Councillor Lovelace, you have 45 seconds left. Uh, no, I'm good. I, I, that was my question. Um, you've, you've just responded to the correspondence. I think um, as long as all the correspondence that was received is included within the package, the Utility Review Board um, has a clear understanding, not just from the report, but all of the correspondence that's been received. That's really important. Obviously, there are people who agree and disagree, uh, but we need to have a balanced approach, and um, I, I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Diego Gammon. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you both for uh, an amazing piece of work and for the residents that uh, worked on the panel as well. We really appreciate their time and their effort. Um, I know that District 1 came out in full force for their district boundary review, and uh, Lakeview is very, very happy with the change. Uh, middle Muscadabit and the rural side of District 1 is very happy, um, and we're really hoping that the UAA RB board does uh, agree. There's a little risk to District 1, I think, because the numbers are uh, lower than what is the recommended. Uh, so we hope that we look at what is the community of interest in the fit. And uh, Councillor Hensby, I drive in and out of HRM to uh, part of my district, to be honest. So uh, <laughs> connectivity in District 1 has always been an interesting thing. But uh, you know, when you get elected, you get to represent the district that you're elected for. So um, it's all good. Thank you very much. Maybe we can make an allowance for reduced security checks as you go from boundary to boundary. Um, <laughs> Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, since uh, our solicitor said that this tape will be submitted with the package to the UARB, I also want to thank uh, Ian and Liam and the committee for their work and, and for their response, as was said, to, to the feedback to the residents' um, correspondence. And we also had a, a very strong response in Coal Harbor and just how important it is for residents to have that cohesive community. Um, yeah, yeah, to, to keep that cohesive community um, together and, and not feel like it's being split down the middle. So I just, yeah, want to thank you for listening to the residents yet again and uh, for your hard work in this. I'm sure it wasn't easy. Okay. Uh, Councillor Arthur. I'll just very quickly do the same thing. Initially, I had some grave concerns, as did some, uh, some residents about the splitting of West Bedford and Bedford and the amenities that were there and the... Uh, the schools and the community of interest, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, not only did Liam and, uh, and Ian get on that, but planning staff really dug in and looked at some options. And uh, I you know, just kind of stepped out of the box a bit to look at some things, which I strongly support. So thank you. Thank you to all. Uh, I'd like to uh, just add uh, my thanks as well. I've never participated in a district boundary review till this year. And it wasn't this one. It was the federal one. Uh, I wrote a long letter. I thought it was pretty good. Um, I never heard back, I didn't get acknowledgement of the letter, I have no indication that it was ever looked at or considered, and I know that's a tough job, and uh, so I, I appreciate the work, but I'm particularly proud of this group, you, um, as others have said, Councillor Mancini, um, he was more than a little concerned. He was, uh, he was, uh, he was vexed uh, by, uh, by, and I, I, I live in that area, so I, I felt that, uh, that pain. But what we saw was a willingness to listen from, from everybody. Uh, we all had an opportunity to feed into it as well as our residents. And uh, so this has been an amazing process and I think it would well be worth replicating at provincial and federal uh, levels orders of government when they uh, do boundary review. So thank you. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to apologize to Liam <laughs> for calling. <laughs> calling him Simon, and also Mr. Mayor, um, vexed, I believe is a Caribbean term. <laughs> so fine use of that word, thank you. Well, thank you to apologizing for getting uh, Liam's name wrong. Um, I'm sure that both he and John are very appreciative of your, uh, your uh, support. All right, colleagues, are we ready for the question? That passes. Thank you, folks. Go and have a beer on Councillor Mancini. 15.6.1, uh, colleagues, I believe, has passed on consent. That was the taxi broker fee system. 15.7. I was wondering why PJ was hanging around here so late in the evening. Uh, grants committee, I don't think that's passed. Councillor Deagle Gammon. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, move that the Halifax Regional Council adopt Administrative Order 2022-005-ADM respecting the Community Grants Program as set out in Attachment 1 of the Staff Report dated November 10th, 2022. Second it. Second by Councillor Hensby. Councillor Dale Gammon, anything on it? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So um, you've all read this 
absolutely well put together report that has been done by PJ and her team. So she's here to answer any questions. Um, really, this is uh, you know step one, but it's a, a simplification of the grants program. It's looking at the categories. It's trying to make sure that um, there is a good guidebook that's available for per persons that are going to be applying for the grants program. There's some clarification uh, that is in there. We're looking at, uh, there was one question that did come to the committee and it was around the authority of the CFO to establish priority outcomes by funding category. So it wasn't really to change any of the funding categories, but we have a lot of grant applications coming in through different um, channels. And so it's really about putting them all together and knowing where that funding is. Um, I'm sure that PJ is gonna be able to answer any questions that you may have, um, but this is a really nice, uh, a really nice change and I hope that you support it. And then the next thing that might come uh, forward from grants will be a reevaluation on the terms of reference for the grants committee as the next project that we're probably gonna look at. Thank you. Ready for the question, colleagues? Uh, Councillor Hensley. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Um, being on council for an amalgamation, I was the chairman of the grants committee that helped formulate this whole grants pr uh, program for the for the municipal, regional municipality. At Amalgamation, there was a difference of th four different programs. Halifax City didn't have one until very late. City, the City of Dartmouth also had one until very late. Halifax County had a program and Bedford didn't have uh, much of a program at all at Amalgamation time. But once after Amalgamation, we brought all things together and tried to mold and shape a, a community grants program together. And I'm glad to see that it's evolved over time and has grown in, in, in stature. The only problem I see with this report is we don't have enough money in the budget to hopefully provide more grants uh, for the various categories. Seeing the housing being brought into this now uh, is gonna be uh, a significant uh, uh, demand on the, on the budget program. So I think that in the future when we come to the budget debate, the half million dollars now that's in the budget for a community grants program in my opinion, is not enough. Our other, our other grant program, the tax exemption program, the tax levy, the tax relief program we have, a lot of burdens and pressures on, on the increasing assessments that a lot of our not-for-profit organizations have, and I think we also have to acknowledge that as well. If you ask me, these are the best investments we have as a municipality is for our not-for-profit organization, our community-based or, uh, organizations that uh, do so much good work in their communities based on some of the grants they receive from the municipality. And a lot of times we try to partner them with provincial or federal grants as well as municipal district funds. I think this is the greatest program we have as a municipal, as a regional municipality, and I solely, solely, uh, fully endorse the, the changes in the, in the amendments here today and looking forward to future changes to make it even better. Thank you. Thank you. That's good to have the history as well. I appreciate it. Ready for, uh, uh, not quite, Count Councillor Diego Gammon? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just begging your indulgence, the, the grants team is a team of two people, right? So uh, just our compliments and thank you so much for such an amazing job. And it's such a pleasure to work with you, PJ. Thank you, you and Ed. And Peter, and Peter. I have. I, I said Peter. Did you hear no, Peter? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. Peter too. I've never heard a bad word about uh, PJ in my time on council. Um, I can't say that about everybody. All right. Ready for the question, colleagues? Thank you for that, Council Dig. I mean, that was worthwhile. That's carried. Thank you. Colleagues, the next four items coming from Heritage Advisory have all passed on consent. We referenced them earlier. I'll go to members of council, Deputy Mayor Austin, the Navigator Program Expansion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer, CEO, to provide a staff report on the potential expansion of the Street Navigator Program as requested by the Downtown Dartmouth, Downtown Halifax, North End, Spring Garden Road, and Quinpool Road Business Improvement Districts with a potential additional cost to HRM of $100,000. The report should be provided to Council in time for consideration in the 2023-2024 budget. Second. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. Um, so uh, this is a heck of a year to come with an ask, uh, given where we are. Um, the, but it's also been a heck of a crisis out there on our streets. And so what has, of course, happened is the number of 
people and uh, street involved out there um, has increased as the workload on our navigator program has really increased as well. And right now the current situation is North End Halifax and Dartmouth um, share a navigator and the proposal from the bids is they would like us to consider uh, adding an additional navigator so that we would bring the complement up to three um, so that Dartmouth would have its own who could also work up in Dartmouth North over Main Street. Uh, they're not so strict about these geographic boundaries um, and North End Halifax would have one. There's certainly enough need out there. Um, I don't know whether or not in the end um, we support this given all the pressures we have but I think we should get a report on it um, since it is an ask coming from our community partners and it should be considered as part of the budget process whether it gets voted on in the parking lot at the end of the day I don't know um, but I think at this point uh, it's worth a report. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Outhead. Um, thank you Mayor and I, I support this in spirit. But for a long time, we've, there's been discussions internally whether navigators should continue to report to the, the bids or they should be brought in house. So that's one discussion that's, that's had been had sort of behind the scenes. The second is that we're running into more and more challenges in the suburban areas. So I think, unfortunately, Paul can't be here. He has a, an issue he's dealing with, but I think he would tell you that he could use this kind of help in Sackville. I could occasionally in Bedford, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm wondering if this motion is actually just a little too narrow in the sense that do we, should there be more a staff report on how and how best to go about this role, this navigator role, and expanding it to other areas, not just uh, just not the, the North End. And I'll see what my colleagues have to say about this, but I'll support this, but I, I, I really think it should be expanded. Yeah, I think uh, Mr. Traves is saying that that would be a longer report and maybe something that has to be defined and has a notice of motion separately, possibly. Um, Councillor Lovelace. <laughs> Uh, I agree, Councillor Othet. I, you know, when I saw this, um, my understanding was it was coming from the community, right? The bids are saying, oh, we need help. And um, so it makes perfect sense that we would absolutely um, increase uh, uh, funding to, to support because the need is desperate. Um, but this is, it, it, it feels like we're only uh, supporting these areas because they have this framework and Sackville doesn't and Bedford doesn't um, and I think that uh, you know to, to John's point uh, I think what we need is uh, another staff report and potentially looking at, at bringing these navigators in house so that um, we're uh, managing the situation better um, because uh, Sackville um, is in Spryfield, um, we're, we're in desperate situations there as well, and we're not getting any support that we need um, because it's attached to the bid. Uh, so that's all I'll say on that, but thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, thank you. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, my, my question is the same. Should they be reporting the bids or in-house? Uh, you know, it is a tough time to be asked, adding something, uh, you know, considering where we are in the budget. You know, my big question is, and maybe staff can consider this when they're looking at it, is, you know, should there be funding from the province to pay for these positions? And there's no question these navigators are extremely important. Uh, we know, and the, and the two navigators that, that, that are out there doing the work, I've worked with both of them, outstanding, and the relationship they have with the folks that are living rough, only they have that relationship. Nobody else can have that relationship. Uh, I really look at, you know, funding. This should be uh, provincially supported and to have them report to us. But, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave that with staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, and thank you, Deputy Mayor and Councillors who have spoken on this. Um, I do think this requires a larger report and a larger ask. I, I, I don't think we can, in good conscience, give money to something that we have little control over and sometimes, although the navigators do great work, sometimes work across purposes to the municipality and also uh, the impact that it would have if they did work for the municipality. I'm not sure that they would have the same relationship with street-involved people 
if they were HRM employees. And so I, I think we need a list of pros and cons and the costs and who can pay for what because the navigators do as good a job as they can. Unfortunately, the real impact comes from the services and, and resources provided by the province, by non-profit service providers, by us now. And so, you know, navigators can only navigate what's out there. And what we need is more of what's out there. And the province needs to step up and provide more of what's out there and provide more resources to the service providers who are providing that so they can scale up to provide more because we know the need is growing, it's not shrinking. And so the navigators can only do so much and I'm not sure adding more navigators really helps a whole lot, but maybe it does, I don't know. And I don't think the staff report is gonna get into that if we're just saying, hey, we got this letter, bids want 100 grand, let's give 100 grand. We may end up saying, you know what? We need to do a different program, we need to do something else. We need to partner with the province, we need you know, someone else to take over the Navigator program because I don't think the bids are really in a place because I can remember stories from Spring Garden uh, where they were giving the Navigator money to buy tents for homeless people and we were trying to get people to move their tents from one location to another location. And so, you know, I, I'm not sure the bids are in the best position to really do this kind of work. That's not what a business improvement district is set up to do. And I've heard many businesses, I, there was a very unfortunate situation on the CBC radio, they had a call-in show with a couple of folks from New Brunswick uh, because they were talking about how they needed to deal with this and they were talking about how bad it was to have homeless people on their streets in their business districts. Fortunately, our business districts don't take that kind of attitude and they wanna help people. My fear is that the help isn't really there because the resources from the province just aren't there. Uh, and so all that is a very long-winded way of saying, I will support this, but I'm not sure it's really dealing with the issues we have in front of us by adding another navigator who we don't employ and maybe we shouldn't. But what we should be talking about is, is a bigger program and maybe it's with the province, maybe it's us, I don't know, but the need is there and we need to do something. But they have to have a system to navigate in order to be a good navigator. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor. Uh, Morris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we have a navigator through Keshen Goodman Library that uh, has recently been hired uh, to um, help people who are struggling in Fairview Clayton Park area. So I'm just putting this out there um, as perhaps that should be part of this report. I don't know, but uh, that navigator is helping people find the resources that are available um, from um, places like the Salvation Army, um, various food programs that are available in the community, food pantries, uh, other warming centers, all kinds of different resources that aren't being coordinated is something that the library is trying to do through this new community navigator. Um, so I don't know if that can be added in in any way, uh, but I just put that out there for everyone's information and perhaps it can be part of this report. Thank you. I see Denise has joined us. I wonder, Denise, if you have any thoughts. Mr. Mayor, sorry, Denise Schofield, Deputy Chief Administrator Officer, uh, Operations, no, Citizen Services. Um, and I, understand, I recognize that we don't normally have staff comment during uh, notice of motion for, or for request for staff report. I just wanted to remind council that you have actually requested that broader report that our um, planning and development, or sorry, Parks and Rec staff are working on. That's the, the pieces that Max and Maggie are working on albeit it's a bit slower than we had hoped because of the, the crisis and the situation that we are dealing with literally on the ground. So I just wanted to remind council bef before you start thinking about adding more to this report, because I understand this is simply about budget and I'm not sure that the bigger report will be back in time before budget, but I just wanted to remind you that we have that bigger report being worked on right now. Thank you, Denise. Um, all right, who hasn't spoken? Uh, Councillor Councilor Dago Gammon, I think. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So uh, the way that this motion is written right now for the 100,000, Deputy Mayor, was that specifically for Dartmouth or just to augment the Navigator program? So um, if it's, I agree with the conversation that's just been held that we need to maybe have a relook at the Navigator program and I was rem remembering a little bit about that uh, report that's coming through Parks and Rec. So I'm wondering if this motion is just maybe a wee bit too early and if we have the report from Parks and Rec then we might be looking at a, a larger look 
at the navigator program altogether. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor, do you want to, do you want to close? Uh, Councillor Austin, I'll go to Councillor Outhead. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I'm just wondering, because again, I absolutely support the spirit of this, but I think, you know, we've got the library doing this, we've got the bids doing it, probably with money that we give them, um, or top up. I think I, I'd like to see this deferred until we have a little bit more of this, this more uh, holistic report come back because I think we need more navigators. I have no problem saying that. I think we have other areas that need to be uh, covered by their uh, jurisdiction, and I have no uh, and I have no doubt that uh, we should be talking to the province about you know helping us fund it. But I, I, if I, we vote this down tonight, it looks like we don't care about the, the bids and the navigators we have, and well, because I don't want to do that. But I think to defer this to have a, a proper reevaluation of the navigator program and parameters and coverage areas, I think would be appropriate. So I'm going to move that we defer this uh, until we receive the, uh, the report from Parks and Recreation. Councillor Routh, it's moved we defer this until we get the report back on the navigators from Parks and Rec, seconded by Councillor Lovelace. So that's on the floor. We can defer this, right? Yeah, so it's a staff report. Um, so on the deferral, Councillor Cleary. Cleary. I, well, in a way, we're kind of deferring this because we're referring it to the budget committee. So we're saying, you know, put together a report based on the request that was made for this $100,000. Let's talk about it during budget. I think we should still do that. We're not committing to anything. It's, I'm going to channel my inner Russell Walker for a second. It's just a staff report. Uh, so it is looking at should we do this? And I think it would be disrespectful to the bids to say, we're going to defer it because then it won't end up in budget. And I think we have to have a track where this does get to a budget discussion. If we don't have all the information by February, March, then fine. We could make the decision to say, you know what, we don't have enough. We're not going to include it. But I don't think I want to stop it at this point because I really do think staff should include this in the budget discussion so we can get the information. And if we don't have enough or we're not comfortable with it, then vote no or defer it then. But I really think we should get it on a track so that it ends up in our budget discussion because I, I think the bids deserve an answer. Whether we say an answer yes or no or we don't have enough info, I don't think we should say that yet. I think we should say that later. Maybe Parks and Rec will have more info for us. Uh, maybe it won't be the full report that uh, Max and Maggie are working on, but maybe it'll be enough, especially just that piece on navigators, that we can fold into this. So I, I, I don't want to stop or slow this down. I want it to continue uh, because it's, it's going to come back to us in, a, in another month or two or three anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Counts, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And so I would ask to vote down this deferral for the reasons that Councillor Cleary just talked about. This is a direct ask from our community partners. And we can wait. Um, for that report to come back, but as uh, Denise indicated, there's not a fixed timeline on that. Is she indicated when she was up that it might be here for budget? Might not. Might take longer than that. You're talking some pretty significant policy issues. And all of those are important, right? You know, we do need a program that actually reaches out to Bedford, to Sackville, um, that goes out to uh, Main Street, that goes out into the other parts of the municipality. We absolutely do. And, you know, there's the challenge of how do we do that? I mean, even now, the existing navigator program, um, I know Sean doesn't just stay in downtown Dartmouth or North End Halifax. I mean, he, he goes where he's needed um, to a large extent he's up in Dartmouth North there's no bid in Dartmouth North um, so there, there is lots of pressure on this and you know where do we go in the end I mean there's there's different models I mean we could end up with a two system where we're providing services ourselves out in suburban areas while funding bids in the core there are pluses and negatives to having it uh, delivered by the bids one of the big ones is flexibility that would not exist inside the bureaucracy but where we are now is we have a crisis on our streets it is ugly. Our, our community partners, who are the only ones out there providing this um, for right now, um, they have given a specific ask to us to say, we're stretched, we're seeing way more people than we had before. Um, can you provide another navigator for this program? That's what they've asked. And we can wait for perfect, 
but you know, I think we really have to at least consider what we can do right now with this while we wait for that bigger whole policy piece to come back. So I would ask us not to defer this. It is basically, as Councillor Cleary has already said, it's basically already a deferral because this is a this is a re this is a request to get a report so we can look at this in budget. If you decide that no, you'd rather have that bigger policy piece come back first, vote it down then. But for now, let's at least respond to what the bids are asking us to do, being the only people right now that we have working on this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you. Um, so I misspoke. I said that Sackville doesn't have a business improvement district. It does. It does have a bid, as does Spryfield. So I don't understand why. We're... Sorry? They haven't wanted to, but there is a street navigator in Sackville. So, um, yep. So I'm a little, so I'm, so I'm a little confused. It's through the Sackville Warming Center. It's through the Sackville Warming Center. So I'm a little confused why we wouldn't be including the other bids in this, considering we do have a crisis on our streets and it is devastating. Um, and so I, I guess I'm, I'm just thinking like we, it's just, we still have a need in these other areas that are outside. Um, the urban core. So why are we just choosing the regional center um, to support the regional center bids? Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I had to step up for a minute, so I don't see the motion that's on the floor for deferral, uh, but what it sounds like is we're deferring it for uh, more until the report comes back. The wider the report. report on the navigator program. Okay, so so I, I just have to to echo the comments by uh, Deputy Mayor that I don't want us to get into a a point of because I don't have it, uh, we should wait and get better information. I can tell you that our current I think we have three in HRM. How many street navigators do we have currently? Two with bids. Yeah. And then Rebecca. So we have three. So we have three street navigators. They are more than overworked. I don't know if you've seen Eric lately, but his beard's like down to his ankles. Uh, it, he doesn't. He doesn't have. He doesn't have time to shave. Uh, so I, I just really think that us deferring this um, to get the information on the report actually doesn't solve the current crisis that we're in. And sure, it might be the regional center, but it, it's, we just have to be honest with ourselves that the regional center is where we have most of the population at right now. I'm not saying it's not any results. And I know uh, Deputy Mayor is not saying that other areas don't need it. It's just the reality, the fact that most of the people who need the support that we're talking about are within the regional center. So I really think that, that with this, like, we, to, to wait for the report to come is not going to deal with the current crisis that we have where people who are on the streets and need the supports. And right now, the only way that we can be accountable to that is through our street navigators. So waiting for that, I just, I, I don't think it's the best thing to, to do here. And we have a report coming. Um, and if more resources are needed, then we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to put that in. But I think this is a way to really take off some of that stress that our street navigators that are currently working are, are having right now and, and I just if you have an opportunity just go with them for a day and you'll see it's 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 tough work um, so I just hope that we don't defer this just just to wait for a report when the folks on the street can't wait for a report thank you thank you uh, on the deferral uh, Councillor Mason I think I was just making notes because I thought Councillor Arthur would go first so why do we have street navigators that are partnered with bids we have that because when Bernie Smith ran the Spring Garden Road uh, Business Association, uh, he had the smart idea of uh, navigating people to the resources they need to get them off the streets because of all the issues that they were having with panhandling on Spring Garden Road. And, and the key thing here is that Bernie convinced uh, downtown uh, and Spring Garden biz bids to put their money where their mouth was. So they put in significant funding and then HRM matched it. This is all before my time. Uh, when, but what was in my time is when Steve Craig was here, uh, he put the question to staff and to council about why don't we extend this program to the Sackville bid? And, and so this was put forward to all the bids in, Nova, in all in Halifax to participate. And uh, the smaller bids don't have the financial capacity to participate. 
that's what it is, right? You go you go out there, and the difference between the downtown bid is like a one and a half million dollar program uh, coming from the commercial downtown, and you go out to Main, Village on Main, you go to Sackville, and they're operating on a couple hundred, like a hundred thousand uh, dollars. The example I like to use is Carla uh, does all that stuff at Quinpool Road. It doesn't have an office. Does it out of the coffee shops on the street and on a cell phone? So, so does that mean? Does that mean? that this is the right way to do these things. Probably not, really the province should be funding like social workers up and down the streets, right? Like that's what should be happening, that's a community services thing, they have a $1.4 billion budget, they should be funding this. But with that being said, these folks are, are on the, you know, they're funding it, they've been supporting it, the, uh, the uh, both of those, uh, oh, and I, I, I missed a part, and Rebecca, right, I forget her last name, starts with a W, is our housing and homelessness coordinator who works in Parks and Rec, and, and she was the solution to the bids outside of the core not having any money. So we hired her, and her job is to go around and do all the other stuff, but she also honestly spends about 50% of her time in the regional center because that's where the biggest demand is, right? So I think there's two separate parallel discussions here. We have these people, these folks, these businesses who have been investing money and have been working really hard and doing stuff that frankly they shouldn't have to do provincially or municipally. It's a shame they are doing have to do it. But they're saying it's worse than ever, we need more money. I think we should consider that. I won't support the deferral. The, the second thing though is, do we need more Rebecca's? And that's a different motion, right? And I think we probably do need more Rebecca's. Rebecca's, except the fact that we're paying for any of this at all is mm -hmm. crazy, crazy making, right? Because like the province should have the money for this, right? I think the province, we should be uh, asking for a staff report, for example, to ask the province to fund eight or 10 housing support workers. Yep, yep. Don't, don't, don't give them all these not for profits all over the place or keep doing that, that's fine, but give them to us so that we can have that 24 hour response so that our executive director of uh, parks and our DCAO aren't driving people around to different camping sites on a weekend, which is what happened because yeah. nobody who's being paid to do the work would do it. So Max and our senior staff were doing it on the weekend because they're good people and they didn't want to ask any of their junior yeah. staff to come in and do it for them. So, yeah. so what am I trying to say? Let's not uh, throw away the baby with the bathwater. Let's ask for a staff report on $100,000. I won't support a deferral. But also, clearly, we're seized with these issues. So let's come back with a couple more motions about all the other stuff. Let's talk to Denise and to Maggie first, though, and not do a bunch of redundant motions and ask for a bunch of extra. <laughs> Denise is like, yes, do not do that. Extra reports that they have to do. Uh, I would suggest that the wording of future motions about those other things we're talking about should be uh, to be added to the existing report rather than more standalone reports. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Before I go back to Councillor Arthur to close on the deferral, uh, 20 seconds. I spent the first eight or nine years as mayor saying to people over here and here and here and there, we, we can do more for people. It's a provincial responsibility, but there is a role for the municipality. I spent the last year or so saying, hey, wait, where's everybody else? Uh, you know? Um, so yeah, I agree that this, this should be provincial and we should, as we take this further, that has to be a conversation. Um, uh, because I think we should do more to help people who are in need. Um, others have to step up too. Councillor Outhit uh, on the deferral. Your, your motion to defer? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll remove the deferral if that's helpful, but I, it, the more I listen to this, the more I realize what a mess. We, you know, the bids do it here, the bids do it there. This bid doesn't because they're small. This one would like to, but they're not big enough. This does area doesn't have a big, but we have Rebecca. We're not, but she's really filling in downtown, though she's supposed to be everywhere. God knows what the library person's doing and why they're funding it. What a mess. All well intended, and no question that these folks are busy in doing important work. So let's put more money into a system that we're not really sure we can explain, but we know the people are busy and need it, and there's no question they're busy and need it. That was never the question, but uh, all I wanted was a holistic plan. It sounds like the holistic plan might be coming. I wish it was coming sooner, but, and, and yes, Mayor, you're absolutely right, and others that the, the province should be helping us fund these. So we've got a mess. We'll put a little more money into the mess for the greater good, but I hope that we'll, uh, that we'll come back and get this organized. I mean, you know, this, this isn't, shouldn't be that difficult but we don't even know how many people we have and who they report to and what their, their jurisdiction is right now. 
Anyway, I'll pull the, the I'll pull the uh, deferral. I'll support the 100K for now. But I, you know, putting 100K into something that we don't really understand because we don't have time to make it better is a little tough. But there's no question that these folks are needed, and I've never meant to suggest that. Right. So this is a staff report to come back to budget. So uh, I will look at the 100K. I'll Who was the, the second on that? Uh, you okay to pull it? Are you okay with uh, withdrawing the deferral? Okay, we're back on the main motion then. Are we, does anybody else need to speak on it? Uh, Councillor Lovelace, you're on the list, you okay? I don't know why I'm on the list. Okay. But I can talk. <laughs> you don't have to prove that. I believe you. The board is empty. This could be okay. our final vote of the year, so ready for the question. We ratified, we already ratified in camera. Why didn't we do that this morning? You know. That's carried. Okay, we need to ratify the uh, advanced tenders from this morning, I guess. Does somebody, I thought we'd done it, we haven't. Does somebody have that in front of them and want to do it, Councillor Hensley? Uh, the motion is that the Halifax Regional Council approve the schedule 2023-24 advanced tender request as per attachment one of the staff report, dated December 6, 2022. Second by Councillor Cleary. Ready for the question. Be waiting. That's carried. Thank you. Uh, Ian, does that bring us to the end of our items? Okay. Colleagues, notices of motion. There's no notices of motion. Councillor Mason, a notice of motion? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I have two. Uh, first is uh, take notice that at a future meeting at Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move a motion to rescind item 1531 from the October 25th, 2022 Regional Council meeting, which requested the staff report as follows that Regional uh, Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to prepare a staff report evaluating the proposed NASCAD student art installations in Point Pleasant Park with consideration of compliance with public art policy 2020-002 OP, permission of Parks Canada and insurance requirements. So that's the first one there for you, Ian. Second is take notice at a future meeting of Regional Council, I intend to move that Halifax Regional Council directs the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report that one, outlines current timeframes and recommendations for establishing KPIs and target timeframes for various application and permitting processes within the planning and development business unit. Two, requires staff to prepare a twice yearly report on these KPIs. Three, prepares a list of potential charter changes that would speed up various permitting and approval processes for council's consideration. And four, returns of the report within 120 days and includes options for service delivery improvements along with any additional resourcing and legislative supports. Thank you. Any other notices of motion? Before we look at a motion to adjourn from uh, Councillor Purdy, I would, uh, I just want to say that today we had a perfect example of how lucky we are with the staff that we have. The reports that we had today on short-term rentals, on the Boundary Commission, on Heritage, uh, just show how much great work has been done by the staff of HRM this year. So I want Council to show their appreciation for the amazing work that our staff do all the time. So thank you to the staff. And as, as part of that, I would, uh, since John McPherson is sitting there, the amazingly quick work in putting up the modular units, which some people thought were delayed, but went up in record time. So thank you to you, to Bird Construction, who went above and beyond, and our par partners and everybody else who did that. Folks, it's, uh, we're heading into the uh, Christmas uh, holiday season. I wish you all the very best. I thank you for your hard work this year, and I hope you all have a little bit of chance to be peaceful and restful. And however you uh, commemorate the occasion, and also remind you that 
We'll have the menorah lighting here as we do every year uh, as well. So whatever your traditions of this time of year, do it with people that you love. And for those who don't have somebody that they love, we'll be thinking of you particularly. Thank you all very much. Motion to